Brandon. All right. <laughs> Sorry. Are you ready? Uh, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, my name is David Catania. I'm chairman of the Committee on Education. Uh, today is Friday, February 22nd, 2013, and we're in room two, four, 412 of the John Wilson Building. Uh, we're here today to hold a public oversight hearing uh, and to receive testimony from stakeholders regarding the performance of DCPS in fiscal year 2012 and thus far in 2013. On Friday, March 1st, 2013, beginning at 10 a.m., we'll hear testimony from government witnesses from uh, DCPS. Uh, this format, format will allow the agency to hear public comments in advance of their own hearing in order to incorporate um, reactions into their testimony that's responsive to the public testimony. Uh, the mission of the district's public schools is to ensure that every child receives a world-class education and prepares them for success in life. And more than 100 schools are managed by Chancellor Henderson, who is responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of our traditional public school system that currently enrolls 45,557 students, or roughly 57% of our public school population. While DCPS uh, has made great progress in student achievement in recent years, there is, as we all know, still quite a, a bit of distance to go. The 2012 DC CAS result in indicated that DCPS's overall proficiency rate it was 45%, uh, 46% 46 in math and 44% in reading. Uh, there is a goal of achieving 70% proficiency in reading and math by 2017, uh, which, as the numbers suggest, uh, will require a great deal of hard work, collaboration, and innovation to improve proficiency by 55% in the next four years. I'm looking forward to hearing from the public on how they would grade the agency in its performance, particularly as it relates to ensuring students are in school ready to learn, uh, how well the agency is engaging the community, how well the agency is supporting individual schools, as well as meeting the needs of students and providing high quality and appealing educational programming. Uh, as I stated at the committee's organizational meeting, I'm, I'm dedicated to ensuring that we hold the district uh, government officials accountable for education outcomes, as well as parents and students accountable for their actions and their decisions. I'm also uh, charging our agencies, most importantly DCPS, with improving communications and being transparent, not just with policymakers, but with parents and interested citizens. Uh, before we hear from our first witnesses today, I'd like to lay out the procedures for the committee's uh, oversight hearing. Uh, we will permit council members three-minute opening statements, um, and there will be three-minute rounds per panel. Each member of the public will receive three minutes for, uh, to provide their testimony, and organizations will be given five minutes to share between them. We have somewhat of a, a long witness list, so in deference to individuals who are farther down on the list, I do tend to be fairly strict about the time. It isn't uh, intended to, to cut individuals off. It's just so that everyone's voice can be heard in what can otherwise be you know, a very long day. Uh, before I begin uh, calling my first witnesses, I want to plug a program, uh, programming note. This is the first official um, commercial of the uh, Committee on Education. Um, and this is um, to plug the, uh, what is, I believe, the sixth in what is known as a series of legends from the Duke Ellington School. Uh, and, that on, and so that on Monday, March 25th at 7.30 p.m. at the, the uh, Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, uh, there will be the sixth in the series uh, featuring uh, Patti LaBelle. And so it's very important that we support um, Duke Ellington. It's very important. There are about 400 VIP tickets left and about 400 general admission tickets left. Um, just so we're clear, the, the performance tickets, and this is a free advertisement, the performance tickets for the Patti LaBelle concert are between $50 and $170. And the VIP tickets are quite steep, but the money is going for an exceptional cause, which is to support what is a gem in our educational constellation. Uh, and those tickets are $500. So to, uh, to order your tickets, you can go online to www.kennedy-center.org. Um, and for the VIP tickets and sponsorship opportunities, um, you can call 202-333-2555, extension 2101, or info at org. Um, again, the event is Monday, March 25th at 7.30 at the Kennedy Center, and it is the uh, series of legends featuring Miss Patti LaBelle. Uh, this event will raise about a third 
of Duke Ellington's uh, private foundation money that is used to supplement uh, what is a very expensive, rigorous, and exciting arts program. Uh, Ellington uh, is a, a real, um, you know, a real gem, as I've said, in our in our public school system. It's one that we should celebrate. And just, you know, for individuals who want to know why it needs so much money, it is very expensive to run an arts program. Arts are not cheap. And typically arts programs have been in the past, and other jurisdictions are really the province of wealthier families who can support these kinds of uh, endeavors. Uh, tuning 100 pianos is expensive. Having the kinds of facilities that is required for this, the supplies required, et cetera, very expensive. So that is my programming note for Duke Ellington. And please, again, it is uh, March 25th, 7.30 at the Kennedy Center featuring Ms. LaBelle. And you can go to www.kennedy-center.org or call 202-333-2555 extension 2101. Okay? All right. Our first uh, four public witnesses will be Ms. Bott. Is Ms. Bott here? Uh, Ms. Cavendish. Ms. Sandalow. And Mr. Conlon. And just to remind each of our public witnesses, it's three minutes um, uh, apiece. Ms. Bott, um, if you would please state your full name and begin your testimony. Thank uh, you. Council Member Catania and members of the Committee on Education, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Somia Bott, Education Analyst for the D.C. Fiscal Policy Institute. The DCPS Capital Commitment Plan includes several ambitious goals to accomplish by 2017, including one to increase proficiency rates by 40 percentage points at the 40 lowest performing schools. We agree that there is a real need to support these schools, and we believe DCPS needs to be transparent about the steps that will be taken to achieve this goal. I'm here today to highlight a few programs already being offered that could be expanded to extend the reach of limited resources while increasing opportunities for our most vulnerable residents. One of the ways to stretch limited resources is to continue to use best practices in the Office of Out-of-School Time Programming, OSTP. Through a combination of organized school-based services and intentional coordination with community partners, the OSTP has made an impact by promoting high-quality programs and increasing access to out-of-school time services. An example is to, they open up school buildings to community-based organizations during after-school hours with janitorial and security services centrally coordinated by the DCPS, OSTP. This year, however, OSTP was cut by $3 million, and many schools had to share an after-school coordinator. In addition, DCPS administered a Proving What's Possible grant competition last summer, which awarded 59 schools with grants for innovative programming to improve academic achievement. Yet the impact and sustainability of Proving What's Possible are still unknown. Rather than funding critical programs in this manner, DCFPI recommends that funding be strategically invested into the OSTP to ensure the continuity and scaling up of effective programming. The school-based coordinator model should also be reinstated to improve the alignment between school leaders and community-based organization partners. Close coordination allows service providers to mirror and complement the school day curriculum and to offer targeted support to students as needed. Second, parent engagement strategies should also be a key component of improving academic outcomes. Research shows us that students do better in school when their families are engaged. Positive outcomes include increases in math and reading proficiency and reduced truancy rates, a priority of the D.C. Council. Improved social-emotional skills and fewer behavioral issues are also cited for students who participate. Currently, D.C. has a number of programs in partnership with the Flamboyant Foundation that are aimed at robust parent engagement, but they're only in a handful of schools and have minimal reach. Two examples highlighted in my written testimony are the Parent Teacher Home Visit Program and the Academic Parent Teacher Teams. Positive results are already being seen through the Flamboyant Foundation's interim data evaluation. The program is currently funded with private resources, but will need to be supported by DCPS resources if it's to be scaled up system-wide. DCFPI encourages the Council to pay attention to the results of these quality parent engagement programs and to identify plans and funding to scale up these strategies across DC schools. Thank you for the opportunity to offer input, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Ms. Vaughn. Ms. Cavendish? Chairman Catania and members of the committee, I'm Betsy Cavendish, a Ward 4 resident and parent of two DCPS children, and I testify today in my capacity as the 2012-2013 chair of the Wilson High School Local School Advisory Team, or LSAT. For those of us who are lawyers in the room, the phrase LSAT may make you twitch 
a little bit, but uh, context <laughs> is quite a bit more pleasant. We advise the principal on school improvement plans and the budget. And I'm also pleased to be submitting this testimony on behalf of the PTSA at Wilson. Our LSAT team set to work in August to advance the school, uh, the planning from the School Improvement Summit last spring and to review the action steps that the various committees were developing. Plans ranging from the rigor of education, improving SAT scores and grades, reducing truancy and tardiness, and the behaviors leading to suspensions, to name a few. But what struck us right off the bat as we sought to advise the principal on school improvement were, th were that uh, Wilson's course of improvement was threatened by chronic under-budgeting. So that is, the city's schools are dynamic, and I'm going to be presenting a few solutions on the school allocation process for um, budgeting. Um, the city schools are dynamic and success breeds success. Confidence for several years has been rising at Wilson as reflected in burgeoning enrollment. Enrollment went from 1514 in 2009 to 1534 the next year, jumped by over 100 students in 2011, and this year jumped to 1726 students. Renovated schools typically see an enrollment boost, and Wilson is one of them, but we're also fortunate to have a diverse population, an ambitious principal, a dedicated administrative ed a teacher and counselor staff, a huge range of extracurriculars, metro access, an involved parent uh, core, and numerous other assets. And so with this success has come over crowding. DCPS has wi wisely um, allocated a minimum per student, but it hasn't been borne out in fact. Um, the result of this has been that Wilson's been underfunded for several years, and the projections have been off. So what are the solutions that we propose to this? Um, and by the way, I have um, a chart on those uh, under projections that I've passed out to the committee. The situation is projected to be much closer this year, and we're in a constructive dialogue with the chancellor, but we're projecting that our enrollment will go to 1826. Um, so what are our solutions? First, we urge that the process for uh, projecting students be transparent. The formula should be posted on the DCPS website to show the entire community how projections for funding should be made, and the projections should be available for all parents, council members, and principals to see. Second, we urge that the council work with the chancellor to develop a well-articulated formula for projections and ensuring that each school is funded at or above the minimum baseline. And we have a suggested template for how to do projections also included. Um, some adjustments should be possible beyond um, how many kids are graduating and dropping out and how many kids are likely to come in. And then uh, leveling up the, the minimum allocation and thank you very much for allowing me to testify. <laughs> thank you. Um, there, there will be questions. And so for okay. those who, who run out of time, perhaps during the question period, you can <coughs> insert the additional points you'd like to make. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Ms. Sandalow. Good morning, Chairman Catania. As you know, my name is Judith Sandalow. I'm Executive Director of the Children's Law Center and a resident of the district. I'm testifying on behalf on, of the Children's Law Center today, which is the largest legal services organization in D.C. and the only such organization devoted to a full spectrum of children's legal issues. Every year we represent over 2,000 low-income children and families, the majority of whom of the children um, attend D.C. public schools. First, I'd like to acknowledge the progress that has been made. For example, early stages has substantially increased the rate at which young children with disabilities are being identified. DCPS and some local schools have developed innovative and successful programming, and there has also been significant advancement in our school-based mental health services. Chairman Catania, for many years you have led this effort, and thanks to your South Capital legislation, by the 2016-17 school year we will have early ch childhood and school-based mental health programs in all of our schools. In my extensive written testimony, I go into detail about these and other areas of progress, as well as opportunities for improvement in special education, transparency, family engagement, and behavioral supports. These are interconnected areas that must be addressed if we want better outcomes. Failure to engage families makes it harder to identify and address a child's learning issues early when interventions can be most effective. Failure to be transparent alienates parents and makes it harder for them to be effective partners. Failure to institute behavior supports leads children to need higher cost special education services. I'll spend my remaining time addressing the lack of special education capacity. As you know, children with unmet special education needs tend to do poorly in school, become truant, drop out, or exhibit significant behavioral issues. However, their needs vary widely. Some children only need an hour or two of group speech therapy each week and can spend the rest of their time in a mainstream classroom. Some children need an hour of one-on-one -on -one tutoring each day. Other children can only learn in a small, quiet classroom, and yet others cannot function in the noise and bustle of a regular school 
um, even within a self-contained classroom. While we share the hopes expressed often by Mayor Gray that all DC children be able to attend local schools, in our experience the local DC public schools are far from equipped to meet the needs of all children. This lack of sufficient capacity is poised to become even more acute as DC continues to return children from non-public placements and at the same time close two full-time special education programs. As far as we know, there is no needs assessment or comprehensive plan to fill the gaps. I want to end by emphasizing this point. We do not have the special education services we need. For example, an elementary school recently told one of our clients that although her daughter needed specialized uh, instruction in math, the school could not provide it because their special education teacher didn't have time. Instead, the school suggested that the parent provide the instruction to her um, at home by herself. A high school told one of our clients that her son, who has autism and struggles enormously with speech, would have his hours of speech therapy cut in half because the speech therapist didn't have enough time to work with him. A middle school special education coordinator told a psychologist working with one of our clients that the school could not implement the IEPs of all of its students because they didn't have enough staff. An elementary school told one of our clients that their special education teacher could not provide more than seven hours per week of inclusion instruction for her son because that was all the time the special education teacher had available. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Sandal, I'll definitely have a question for you on this. <laughs> okay. Um, Mr. Connolly. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Matthew Connolly, and I am the vice chairman of ANC2F in Logan Circle and the co-chair of the ANC's Education Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. As elected representatives, it is our duty to ensure that our constituents have access to a quality public education. Although charter schools play an important part in meeting this goal, the promise of school choice requires that our traditional public schools compete and provide a valuable alternative. Thus far, however, DCPS is struggling to convince parents to choose traditional public schools, and DC residents are not getting the value they deserve from their public education dollars. Citywide, we spend tens of thousands of dollars per year per student on public education, and yet test scores remain low, buildings continue to languish, and parents continually feel marginalized. In Logan Circle, despite improvement in everything from crime to housing to economic development, we have not seen similar gains in our DC traditional public schools. As one of my constituents recently told me, I want a good public school that's accessible by public transportation. That's why I'm moving to Arlington. All families deserve the right to attend a good traditional public school in their neighborhood. Although charter schools will continue to be the best option for many students, no parent should have to feel that charter schools are the only public school option. And everyone can agree, no parent should feel she has to move to Arlington to find a good public school. In Logan Circle, dedicated parents, community members, principals, and teachers have come together to improve our neighborhood schools in recent years, especially at Garrison Elementary. Recognizing the importance of parent and community involvement in improving our neighborhood schools, ANC2F has formed an education committee in 2010. So far, results have been positive. But to continue our gains and meet our goals, we need the Chancellor's Office to make the same level of commitment. Our area feeder systems are in shambles and lack accountability or meaningful oversight from DCPS. Buildings and facilities are desperately in need of repair. Some have been on renovation lists for years. Many parents and community members, myself included, feel that Chan the Chancellor's Office is uninterested in working with us to create the kind of schools our children deserve. As you continue your important oversight work of DCPS and their public education system, and hear from DCPS officials over the next several weeks, I hope you consider whether DCPS is truly providing the education value that it should, and examine what specific steps DCPS is taking to partner with parents and community members to make great traditional public schools. Thank you for your time and attention. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner Connolly. So uh, let's begin with you know, a general theme that I'm hearing, and, and it's one that concerns uh, the committee as well, and that is the issue of parental participation uh, as well as transparency. And so, you know, th these comments are going to apply, I think, to m much of what I've heard. We are, st we are still trying to sort out the DCPS budget. And, and let me say that this is not intended as a criticism of the Chancellor. It's not intended as a specific criticism of anyone in particular. It's just that uh, we've, we've had to crack a nut like this before in my prior committee where, um, you know, as I say repeatedly, that complex systems get more complex with time and, and these workarounds kind of, you know, come into to being. And so 
you really can't follow money through a system. And if you can't follow money through the system, you can't tie it to, you know, whatever your objective is. And so we have uh, the committee staff has you know one of our most senior person who's uh, experienced person who's dedicated solely to sorting out the budget. And that may sound very dry and antiseptic, but unless you know where the money is and how it flows, and making sure that you, you don't know what you're buying, you're just mm -hmm. pouring money into a pot. And so I do uh, hear what you're saying with respect to Wilson. That is a that is a true statement. Um, you know, Wilson has the lowest per student, um, per pupil amount of any of our public high schools. And in part because, you know, across the board, we've not quite figured out how to adequately judge uh, uh, pupil projections. And so I have many of our public schools who will over project knowingly and kind of willfully over project the number of kids that they will have, and they pocket the difference. Right. All right? And those are often schools where, you know, there might be an influx after October 31st of, of charter school kids, and so the money kind of washes out. But what we haven't done is been able to figure out completely how we make schools that have enrollments that are higher than projections projected whole, okay? And so that's, that's an issue, and we have to find the right place to house that, and as, that, that assignment. And I'm not sure it's within DCPS. It may be within OSSI, that OSSI actually has a role in V validating the projected enrollment so that we can build in a certain excess across the board and then, you know, if we have to claw some back, we can. Um, on the issue of, of, tr of transparency, what the committee is working on this year is doing our best with the budget that is being presented and looking to include a format in the Budget Support Act that will require that next year's budget, you know, be l similar to the, the way it's portrayed in New York City or in Denver where anyone can go online and understand where all the money is. And that will permit a much more informed budget process because we can then make choices, right? It doesn't make sense to put the money here versus here. And, and that's the purpose of, of, uh, of, of a public process, to make mm -hmm. allocations among limited resources. You know, uh, I want to say generally, and I should have said this at the top of my remarks, that since becoming chairman, we but we, I mean, me and my staff, we are in schools two, three, four times a week, uh, at times multiple schools per day. And what I have seen, you know, is nothing short of remarkable. And when I say our public schools, I mean our charter schools and our traditional public schools. And I think we have one family and two systems. And I'm not, I'm not trying to have any discord between the two. I mean, we have people who see no good in charters, and we have people who see no good in public. And I have seen for myself the good in both, and I think our focus is better directed at the underperforming within the both systems and not inter-system fighting within the family. Within our public schools, uh, I, I have seen you know, a remarkable transformation. I have the benefit of having been here in, on the council, this is my 16th year, of what our schools were like many years ago when you would go in them. They, there was not discipline. Uh, these were not colorful places. There were often very good people that had simply been ground down by the system, and they weren't as engaged as we would want. That is not the DCPS that we have today. We have been able to attract incredible talent as teachers and incredible talent as principals. And as I go into these schools, every time I go, I'm impressed by the caliber of people who are working in our schools. So we have this old refrain where we kind of like kick the can and talk about how th some things are working and some things aren't. I don't mean to suggest that they are perfect, but I'm confident that, you know, with a few tweaks, we can start seeing once again an another movement in reform. But part of what, what we're trying to do with the committee is get, get the members in the schools so we can see for ourselves the progress and be honest about it. I don't believe in lying to the public and being Pollyannish, but being truthful with the public about the good things that are going on and the things that need to be improved because we need to be champions for our system. You know, and to paraphrase, you know, what uh, Senator Clinton said about New York, there's, there's nothing wrong with D.C. that what is right with D.C. cannot fix. Mm -hmm. I believe that, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, one of the things that, and, and, and Ms. Sandalow, I want to tell you, you know, we, we, the committee has tackled a few issues thus far. One is truancy. This next is, is uh, testing integrity because so much rests on the testing. We have to make sure that no one is cheating. Uh, the third issue that we are going to confront, and it's one that we're gathering the data on now, is this issue of, of social promotion. 
and how what a nefarious impact it has. And I want to test a theory on this panel. And so, uh, under district regulation, essentially under district law, it is illegal for the system to hold any child back who is not in the third, fifth, or eighth grade. And so we are, by force of law, a first grader who may not be ready for the second grade, or a fifth grader who may not be ready, or, I'm sorry, a sixth grader who may not be ready for the seventh grade. We are required to pass that child along. So if that child isn't ready and they wind up in the next grade, um, you know, I think that builds in a complete lack of accountability around special education. And this is the theory that if I have to pass you along anyway, there's no moment where I, I'm the teacher, I have to take ownership really of your success to make the call, the decision whether or not you are ready to go on. I just say, well, it's not my, I can't do anything about it, I've got to send you along. I think if we had to make sure that children were on grade level before we sent them to the next grade, that, that we could be, and through, you know, especially assessment in, you know, the, the primary school years, we might be able to capture uh, and start having individual accountability on special ed issues and on learning disability issues and also for kids who just aren't ready. And so we've been gathering some data. We have found some fairly interesting statistics. Last week you were here, Ms. Sandalo, and we talked about how as of the 11th of February of this year, you know, a little past halfway through the school year, 26.8% of our ninth graders uh, had 11 or more <coughs> unexcused absences. Right. So we had a quarter of our freshman class that is on target to miss a month of school a year, mm -hmm. right? So my theory is that, that in, in ninth grade, that's the first time in which kids are actually being held accountable for passing before they can go on. Right? You have English requirements and algebra requirements before you can go on to the 10th grade. It's the first time in which, you know, there are semester grades and so on. The, 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 um, the failure rate of that class is remarkable. You, anyone want to hazard a guess how many of our ninth graders, at the first chance they hit minimum standards to be able to go to the 10th grade, what percentage fail? Anyone? 25. 50. 30%. 30%. You know, so out of the 3,028, 911 can't do the math or the English to go on. And so that's why I was wondering, you know, why are our ninth grade classes twice as big as mm -hmm. our sophomore classes? And why are our sophomore right. classes bigger than our... Because you have 15.8% of our 10th graders who can't move on and 12.5% of our 11th graders who fail. You know, and so this attrition corresponds with truancy because they can't do the work Absolutely. they don't feel smart and they don't want to be there because but and what is really shocking is how many so if you have 30 percent of your ninth graders who can't pass how many of our eighth graders do you think fail this is just, this is like a this is like a jeopardy anybody we won't, we won't have the music 0.8 percent we hold back 14 of the 1,706. So the whole system has just this, mm -hmm. you know, because there are no checks. It's all kind of subjective, right? The objective comes in ninth grade. So we're just moving these kids through. And adults can say the law says I can't hold them back. There's no moment where I have to take ownership of the child. And this isn't about failing kids for fun. This is about making sure, having adults be responsible for making sure that the child is prepared to go on to the next grade and working with the family to make sure that happens. If that means mandatory summer school, then whatever it means, it means that. We have constructed a system that kind of lies to children until they get to the ninth mm -hmm. grade and then we introduce them to standards that a third of them can't meet. And then the failure cycle begins and truancy goes off the charts. What am I missing here? Well, if I could add one, one point we've talked about at the LSAT team. Um, Wilson's catchment area encompasses the geography of 40% of the city, and most of the kids who are truant live very far away. And the truancy seems to correlate, at least at our first glance, 
um, with kids not having um, even money for metro passes. It, they get reduced fare metro passes, but it's still $30. And so indigent kids, the $30 can be a big burden. And um, they may not have the money for that. So I think we ought to get free transit to school well, somehow. working on that, absolutely. And we've, we've spoken with the chancellor. But, but you know, Wilson is, a, is one example. Wilson has kind of a middle-of-the-road truancy problem, not a large truancy yeah. problem. But it is incomparable to, for instance, a, a Baloo where 46% of the children miss more than a month, or Cardozo where it's right. in the low 30s, you know, or it's a, you know, Dunbar where you have in the low 40s, or Spingarn in the low 40s. You know, these aren't kids. I mean, you know, we can absolutely admit that there are other issues being away. There are bullying absolutely. issues. There are transportation issues. But I just think it's interesting that that there's that there's some correlation, it seems to me intuitively, between, you know, the child gets to the place and the child starts to fail and the child stops coming. Yeah. It may not account for a majority, but it seems striking. The similarities seem striking. I don't think you're missing anything. I think that one of the things the DCPS has done very well is that their early stages program is doing a better job of identifying, substantially better job of identifying three to five-year-olds with significant learning issues that are going to impact their capacity to learn in a regular classroom. But they don't have, they are, there are not sufficient resources to actually provide those services, which That's is. That's what I'm saying, Ms. Angel. Yeah. Bear with me for a second. I don't want to, I don't want to make the concession about sufficient resources just yet. That may be true, okay. but until Ms. Hutchinson from my committee unpacks where the money is and how it's spent and the choices we're making, I don't know if there's sufficient money. The, the way it's be, being spent now, I think, is a fair point. That's right. I should, I should say it more carefully, which is they are not spending enough resources to have in the – to have – each school does not have the, 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 the right experts and the right training for the right teachers to teach the number of kids who have learning issues. Um, Let me ask it differently. What do you think are, are our costs from having kids kind of summarily – pushed through the system. Mm -hmm. And then you have, uh, you know, it was a school yesterday, an excellent um, D.C. public school, traditional school, and the principal was talking about a recent fifth grader who came on a first grade reading level. And so, you know, the total costs associated with, if you're a teacher, I mean, and you've got kids from different levels, what level are you able to teach at? If you have instruction plans, you're a fifth grader, right. a fifth grade teacher, and you have instruction plans for a fifth grade, and you have someone at a first grade level or a second grade level or a third grade level, where is his or her attention going to be spent? What, does, what, what, you know, what additional resources do we then ultimately constantly spend catching the child up? And how do we not challenge the kid who is on fifth grade level and who we might, who could be on eighth with a little effort, right? And the research is clear that children who drop out cost society, forget the, the moral and the personal cost, over $300,000 in homelessness, incarceration, and, and other social costs. So I think you are exactly right that solving this problem um, early is going to save the city money and obviously allow us to graduate what is a wealth of young people with capacity to, to transform this country. Well, y you know, again, I, this, is, uh, this is very early in the tenure of this newly constituted const constituted committee on education. But, you know, looking at this perhaps through a very simplistic prism, I, I don't see what the rationale is behind a regulation that prohibits the system from holding kids back who are incapable of progressing. That is, I mean, is, sometimes it's just the application of common sense that I don't believe we help the child by passing them along. And so, you know, what I think we should do is be able to identify the child early in that school year, identify if there are issues, and then mm -hmm. the city is wealthy enough that we can actually have required summer school as they do in Florida as a condition for moving on. You can institute a series of things, but that requires adults to be accountable and responsible for the child. Parents, uh, teachers, and principals. That's a lot of work. It's easier just to make it against the law to hold them back <laughs> on some level. Thank you all very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, our next uh, public witnesses are Mr. McPherson, Mr. Dominici, Mr. King, Ms. O'Keefe.
and, and I should have uh, stated this before. If you have uh, copies of your testimony, if you would please uh, provide them to uh, the committee staff, they can circulate them among the members. Okay. Uh, why don't we begin, Mr. McPherson? Uh, can you hear me all right, Ch Mr. Chairman? Please. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my name is uh, Peter McPherson. I'm a Ward 6 resident. Um, I have a daughter who's a sophomore at the School Without Walls. Uh, for the past year, my focus has been school libraries. Before that, school modernization issues. <coughs> um, I know that this will sound hyperbolic, but uh, I fundamentally don't think it is. I think that uh, the District of Columbia Public Schools are poised on a one inch wide wire over an active volcano. I think that they are facing a, uh, a, an existential threat and frankly I don't think that anyone should be remotely surprised that uh, we're in this spot. Um, we, I think you could go back to uh, when uh, mayoral control was conceived and implemented. Uh, it was not that that plan, that notion was not vetted during the 2006 campaign. Uh, the public had virtually no buy-in, no input on the creation of mayoral control. And uh, I think, you know, the council bought into it. And then the council failed again when it, um, when Mayor Fenty brought before this council a uh, chancellor or a candidate to be chancellor who's a self-styled revolutionary with no, who had never been a school principal, never run a school system. And, you know, and I think so much of what the failures that we have seen in DCPS in recent years, you know, are, are fundamental management failures, uh, you know, and that's, I think, largely a function of the inexperience and uh, the dogmatism of the people who were selected to, uh, to, run, uh, to run the schools. Um, and I think in, the, in what's happened in the past five years is that the council has not done a good job in terms of, uh, of oversight. And I think the establishment of this committee and putting a, uh, you know, an aggressive, competent chairman such as yourself in charge, I think is a, uh, is a good first step. But I don't think that we should kid ourselves about what has happened in the past five years. That um, one example I would provide is the modernization program. I mean, we have had this outflow of kids out of schools, and a lot of that outflow of students out of schools have been in schools that haven't been modernized. And, you know, I would point to the fact that we're on the cusp. We spent almost $900 million modernizing high schools that have 10, 000, a total of 10,000 kids. I mean, that and what has been spent on the elementary schools and the middle schools is a fraction of that. But that is where, you know, the overwhelming majority of the kids are. Yeah. And so, you know, for one thing, we are on track to have, I fear, so unless some dramatic changes take place, you know, some very expensive white elephants that we are going to be scratching our heads uh, about what to do about. Now, when I was talking about the management failures, uh, you know, what we have done is have a... Um, Mr. McPherson, if you could just wrap that point up. I'll have questions. You'll be okay. Able to... Well, what I would say is is that the schools lack some very important elements, uh, you know, that we, we've been fighting for the libraries. I think we're making pro progress on libraries. But it's come to – I've since learned that we've got the same issues with the, um, with the music programs. I mean, DCPS pats itself on the back for having music teachers. But – the people I talk to at DCPS about the music programs say that we need a million dollars worth of, of new instruments. Thank you, Mr. McPherson. I'll, I'll have questions. Thank we'll you. be able to continue. Um, Mr. King. Yeah, by the way, is Mr. Domenici here? Okay. Then why don't we have uh, Ms. Carter come up and take this uh, next seat. And uh, Mr. King, why don't you begin? Okay. Um, for the record, Mr. Chairman, just let me say good morning to Mr. Chairman. Um, for the record, my name is uh, Robert Bob King, ANC Commissioner for 5C03, uh, in Fort, uh, better known as Fort Lincoln. I'm the longest serving uh, ANC Commissioner, serving nearly uh, 30 years. First of all, for the record, I'd like to thank the Chancellor for allowing the Fort Lincoln School to remain in the inventory 
so that the community stakeholders and Michelle Hagen, the developer, can put together a program uh, that will not only be replicated around the city, but around the country with respect to a community center. There are several underlining uh, root causes for the failures of the public school system. They are not failing just because there have been too much time spent on teacher and pupils' performance, but there are other issues. That it's not just because that the schools did not keep the interests of young people and parents with their offering of learning styles. It's not just because the it's not just because the city council turned a blind eye to the elephant in the room when they decided to make the education committee a, 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 as a whole instead of a committee. I think you're the right person for this committee. Pray for you every night. If we have any kind of chance, we'll be under your leadership, Mr. Chairman. Pervasive poverty is a major, contrib major contributor to the failure of our pool, school system. It's a situation that is sick and tired, tired and sick, and sick of being tired. With $800 million budget, 46,000 students, poverty and severe affordable housing shortage have ha had a great impact on the schools. Mr. Chairman and committee members, here are some of the alarming statistics that are pl plaguing our, our school system. There's a 30% poverty rate. One out of three children live in poverty. 19% of D.C. adults are literate. There's a 50% dropout rate. Only six out of 10 kids will graduate. D.C. writes number 45th in the country. There are 10,000 kids roaming the street every day that dropped out of school without a job, competing with 60,000 ex-offenders who are turning to this city looking for the same jobs. Of five blacks between the age of 10 and under 17, three of them will not graduate from high school. One will be officially truant. One will be arrested, according to the Livingston Institute report. Each year, there are 1,000 youth committed under the supervision of the criminal justice system. Reading of the third grade, 33 percent for blacks, 89 percent for whites. Math, 28 percent for blacks, 87 percent for, for whites. These are alarming statistics. Over 600 of our babies and children are in jammed into a, uh, to a shelter, which we took, take one of the close, schools that are closing and put them in there. As we commemorate the 50th anniversary of Dr. King's March on Washington, August of 20, 1993, um, and I quote from Dr. King, the Negro lives in a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. The Negro is still languishing in the corners of American society and finding himself in exile in his own land. I use Dr. King's word, Mr. Chairman, to highlight the plight of many citizens of the District of Columbia. Today, many uh, American, many Afro-American, uh, Negro, uh, Afro Americans and Hispanic citizens are living on the lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity in D.C. The prosperity, Mr. Chairman, is a $417 million surplus in the city budget and this year and a projected $240 surplus in 2014. Many, many Afro-Americans and Hispanic citizens are languishing in the corners of the District of Columbia. For example, 38% 30, 30 of the residents of Ward 8 live in poverty, which is higher than the national uh, average, according to a census report Mr. by the Washington Post, Mr. during the February 20, 2013. Mr. King, with all due respect, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but we, we, if, if, we, if you could just wrap that point up. I'll have questions, and you'll be able okay, to. Okay. With all due respect to the mayor, this is not one city, Mr. Chairman. This is a t tale of two cities, one poor, one black, one affluent. And, un and separate unequal. I believe, Mr. Chairman, under your leadership, we have a way to catch up to this robust movement of the charter schools. I remind you, sir, there's only two ways to catch up. The charter schools have to fall down and they're not going to do that. So you're going to have to accelerate with the community to make the, to make the public schools more competitive. And I'm saying to this in closing, and I'm quoting Galatians 6-9, the process will not be easy, Mr. Chairman. The charge will not happen overnight. And let us not grow weary and well doing, for in due season we will reap, we will reap if we faint not. May God bless the city, Mr. Chairman. May God bless America, and thank you. Thank you, Mr. King. Um, are you Mr. Domenici? Yes, sir. Okay, I'm going to go to Ms. O'Keefe, and then I'll come back to you. Ms. O'Keefe. Good morning, Chairman Catania, morning. and thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Bonnie O'Keefe. I'm a resident of Ward 5 and a public policy analyst with DC Action for Children. DC Action provides data-based analysis and policy leadership on critical issues facing DC children and youth. My testimony today focuses on two areas of concern for young children, which we hope DCPS leaders will address in upcoming hearings, population and planning for early care and education, and third grade proficiency. DC Kids Count analysis of US Census population estimates reveals that while DC's population of children under 18 has decreased, the population of children under age five has begun to increase. 
While population growth of children under five is greatest in the center of the city, we also found that half of DC's young child population, approximately 18,000, live in wards four, seven, and eight. We suggest this committee ask DCPS leaders how they've analyzed population data and what their plans are to focus early care and education resources towards the neighborhoods with the greatest need for high quality programs. During our analysis, we found that some pre-K programs are over-enrolled with wait lists hundreds long, while others remain under-enrolled. Uneven utilization suggests quality disparities or unmet neighborhood demands. An important measure of the success of DC's early care and education programs is third grade proficiency. Research shows that third grade reading and math is a crucial performance measure for elementary and early education and a predictor of later academic success, including graduation rates. In 2011, less than 40% of third grade students in DCPS scored proficient or higher on the CAS, and 2012 saw no significant improvement. Third grade scores have been at this level for years. DC Action's recent analysis showed no evidence of significant progress on third grade scores since 2007, no evidence of significant change in the achievement gap for students of color and students from low income families. With this in mind, we hope the committee will ask DCPS leaders how they plan to reach their goal, you mentioned earlier, of 70% proficiency by 2017, specifically for third grade students, and what will the year-to-year -year benchmarks look like so we know we are on the way towards meeting that goal, and how will DCPS ensure that improvements are not only concentrated in the schools that are already performing relatively well. Uh, we welcome the opportunity to work in partnership with you and DCPS leaders uh, to ensure that all children enrolled in DCPS reach their full potential. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. O'Keefe. Um, Mr. Domenici. Uh, thank you for having me. My name is David Domenici. I'm the director of the Center for Educational Excellence in Alternative Settings. Mr. Domenici, do we have a copy of your testimony? Yeah. Thank you. Please proceed. Sure. Thank, you. Um, Thank you. I'm the director of, the, of a, s a small group called the Center for Educational Excellence in Alternative Settings. We help states improve their schools inside of their long-term youth correctional centers. I was formerly the principal of the Maya Angelou Academy, which is the school that operated inside of first Oak Hill and then New Beginnings once it was transformed. I was asked to testify today just briefly to talk about um, indicia of high quality education inside of secure facilities. As you likely know, the District of Columbia Public Schools is responsible for providing the education to uh, young adults who are tr youth who are tried as adults and being held in the DC jail. Um, so I just want to give you four, what I see as four primary components of what is necessary for a high quality schooling inside of a secure setting. And um, at, at some subsequent time, we'd be happy to talk about whether it seems that is or is not taking place inside of the jail. Um, first, um, students need timely uh, assessments and, and accurate placements. Youth who come into facilities need to be assessed uh, on their academic strengths, weakness, social emotional needs, strengths and weaknesses. Um, they need very quick, clearly to, to find out what their academic status is, meaning we need to figure out where their credits lie. Are they likely on a high school diploma track or a GED track? What's their actual academic status so we can start working on that? Third, you need to do a uh, timely and meaningful assessment of the student's post release plans. Are they planning to go back to high school? Does that make sense for them? Are they planning to go get their GED and start working? And then third, based on all that, you need fourth, based on all that, you then need to put them into highly individualized programming that will help them meet those needs. That's the first issue. The second piece is you need high quality instruction, engaging in rigorous curriculum. In too many youth cor correctional facilities, including primarily at the jail, what happens is kids are handed workbooks and worksheets and told that they can then work for a couple hours at a time. Um, not meaningful, not engaging, and not rigorous. Uh, we need to develop short modular units that are, that are relevant to the kids that are based on themes, justice, change, dreams, systems, etc. so that kids have something meaningful to, meaningful to learn and something to get engaged with. 
for students on a diploma track, what they do in these facilities clearly needs to be aligned with and transfer back to DCPS or the charter schools or any other school they go to. For students who are older and undercredited and are likely to be taking their GED, again, the GED prep work needs to be meaningful, can't simply be a, meaning, a GED textbook. That's not going to help a kid who reads at the sixth grade level who's 17 without credits. Third, students need opportunities for individualization, access to technology, and, and candidly, kids need their special education needs must be met under state and federal law. Um, you know, the average, at, at any given time, 50% of the young people who are locked up in youth or adult correctional facilities have special needs. Mm -hmm. The average young person locked up in the D.C. jail uh, reads at the fourth or fifth grade level. You're not going to make the sort of achievement gains you need unless you get highly tailored individualized instruction. Sitting in front of a computer is not the answer, but there are very, very significant um, and high quality adaptive technology programs that kids need to have, young people need to have access to so that we can remediate and work intensively with them on basic math and basic reading skills. The notion that uh, technology is not accessible or is not secure is simply false. Just so you know, I've been all around the country. Youth correctional and adult facilities now have access to high-quality technology in their schools if they need it. Mr. And lastly, I'm sorry, if you could yeah. just finish this yeah. last point. And lastly, the fourth point is, um, from the moment students arrive to the time they leave, uh, the school needs to be helping them transition for their placement. Ironically, Th for thank kids you, Mr. Ministry. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but I, I, nope. I am trying to keep the public witnesses as close as we can to the three minutes in light of a long witness list. I no want to thank each of you for your testimony and just quickly say uh, to Mr. McPherson, I think you were. Your point about uh, the irrationalization of our modernization is obvious to me as I travel the city. You know, the amount, you know, and, and, and we have to be, well, I say this all the time, we have to be able to talk without taboo. We have to be honest. First way, the only way we're going to solve our problems is if we honestly have a discussion about them. And for whatever reason, we embarked on a trajectory of, of overhauling all of our high schools and making them a number one priority while not focusing as much on our middle and primary, our middle and elementary schools. I made a list. Uh, the, the newly completed Cardozo will be even after this, um, you know, reconstitution or school closures will will only be at about 55 percent of capacity. Okay, uh, Anacostia, after you know considerable public investment, will be about 55 percent of capacity. Baloo, which we are going to break ground on soon, has a little over 800 students, and we're building a high school for 1,400. And, you know, and, and no one is suggesting that we not build a new Baloo, but it, it might make sense to build a Baloo for, say, a thousand kids and take that leftover money and build a brand new Garfield or a new Stanton just down the street, just to spread this, uh, uh, the, these dollars. Woodson has now in its second year and it's at 73 percent capacity. Mm -hmm. Eastern, while it, it only has its freshman and sophomore class, the freshman class is so much larger, again, because you have the failure that you can't simply take that class and multiply it times four. It doesn't work like that. It's freshman through senior goes like that. So it's unclear as to whether on Eastern, again, a beautiful new school with great leadership will be fully um, uh, at capacity. Dunbar, you know, is building a larger Dunbar than we have today. It opens in August, and there is an enormous capacity. It will be at about half capacity. We have Roosevelt, which is, has lost about 40 percent of its students in the last four years at under capacity, and Coolidge under capacity. Our schools that are on or over are Wilson, School Without Walls, McKinley, um, and Banneker, and, and, uh, and um, uh, El uh, Duke Ellington. So, you know, we're either going to have to find a way to attract parents to these schools and students to these schools, uh, Mr. McPherson, or we're going to have uh, an issue. Because unless you have a, a reservoir of students, you don't have the funding to have the enrichment of the programming that the kids want. And I think that many parents, just one second, I think many parents, you know, use, you know, use an example, many parents may be reluctant you know, if they've had a high-performing elementary and a high-performing middle school experience, whether it's traditional, public, or charters, and we have ample of both, when they're looking at their high school options, they're making a determination. Do I want to send, you know, my, my child who's had a pretty uh, rigorous pre-K elementary and middle school experience to a high school where I know that one-third of the freshmen will fail, where you have 
second year and third year, and in some instances, fourth year freshmen who are 17 and 18 years old. Is that an environment where my child is going to excel? And I, I think, again, we have to be honest about that. Parents make that choice, and many of them choose not to. Okay? And so what do we do with the kids that we have failed? By, you know, by fooling them into believing that they are ready for the next level. And by the time they hit the ninth grade, we hit them literally with reality. So that is the challenge of DCPS that I see. Um, and it, it isn't to punish the kids, not to punish them, but it's to find a way to recognize their deficiencies in a setting that is better for them, that can catch them back up and reintegrate them perhaps in the same school or in a different facility. Otherwise, you know, as we constantly take schools out of the feeder programs and we're left with this environment, mm -hmm. these high schools won't mm -hmm. be full. Yeah. They won't be. Yeah. And we can't be proud of that. Yeah. But it's not just us. Can I just tell you that this, prob this problem is in literally every major city in the country has had this problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was just speaking with yesterday a gentleman from Chicago who was the general counsel under Secretary Duncan, first couple of years, Department of Ed and his involvement in Chicago schools. It's the same problem. All right, now we just can't acknowledge it, celebrate it, and walk away. Our choices are how do we confront it. But I do appreciate what you're saying, Mr. McPherson. If you had a point, I'll let you make it, and I'm going to go on to my other witnesses. Well, what I would say, Mr. Chairman, is, is that <clears throat> I was involved in, uh, frankly, a multi-year knife fight to get uh, a proper modernization for Stuart Hobson Middle School. I mean, in 2009, the proposed budget for the modernization of Stuart Hobson, the time an 84-year-old building, was $3.6 million. Sure. And this is a kid, this is a school that was operating at, at the, had the highest utilization rate of, of any middle school and one of the highest utilization rates of any school in the, in the city. And so, you know, we've made a lot of progress. It's uh, 34 uh, $34.6 million now, but that's not enough to, to complete the project. And, you know, and the mayor is reticent about uh, giving additional resources to, to finish the job properly. But it's like you look at, uh, you look at, uh, at Dunbar. I drive by Dunbar frequently because I'm interested in seeing the progress. It's a beautiful building. But, I mean, this is a $120 million building that's going to have 600 kids in it in, in the fall. And Stuart Hobson is between 430 and 450. And, you know, believe me, the struggle that it has taken our community to get to 34.6, yeah. uh, I mean, you know, the, 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 the whole program is so out of skew. And, uh, you know, and I just, I, I don't really feel that there's been a whole lot of movement on sort of, you know, really trying to, uh, to realign this or a recognition that we've got to bring additional new resources to bear on the modernization program so that we can do the primary and middle schools Thank properly. You. Thank you, Mr. McPherson. Again, it goes to a, a, a larger issue of, you know, we have two systems under our public education system, and the need, candidly, is to engage in planning of both. You know, we can't have these two systems just doing their own thing without understanding that they impact each other and at the very least communicating exactly. with each other because when one opens it, it does impact another and it should be in an informed way. I'm not trying to privilege or burden either system. But, um, you know, we, we, we have a number of uh, half-empty high schools. And, you know, the idea that if we simply build something new and shiny that people will come hasn't really borne out yet. Yeah hasn't really borne out yet. And I think it's because of what's going on in the schools and how we've, again, I've, I've stated my, my point. Uh, I, I appreciate, um, uh, Mr. Domenici, your focus on children who are in our custody. It's one a concern of mine as well. And uh, uh, Mr. King, the, you know, the challenge uh, you know, that you mentioned as it relates to you know, race and socioeconomics, I mean, I think socioeconomics are playing a huge uh, impact on you know on 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 the success we see this uh, play itself out. Although I'm optimistic that we can combat the achievement gap, the investment in pre-K is really incredible. I, I tell everyone the best way the best days I have are when I start them at pre-K three and pre-K four. You know I think you know the 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 time and effort on communications and language arts that we're investing in these three and four year olds I think is going to help narrow a communications gap that, that does hamper a child's ability to learn but it'll take us a few years mm -hmm. until we see mm -hmm. that work its way through the system 
Yeah. Um, and I do think, you know, we have a number of tools that are, are exciting. This flamboyant, this private foundation where uh, they you know, support and underwrite the expense of the teacher going into and meeting with the parents um, of the children in advance of school and explaining the teacher explains their expectations for the child and listens to the parents about their expectation for the child and where we've implemented that in a handful of schools across the city you've seen vastly improved attendance vastly improved parental participation so I had a conversation with uh, the gentleman who heads our collective bargaining unit uh, earlier this month about you know as we renegotiate our, our collective bargaining agreement making sure that that is on the table that it, there's a requirement with sufficient compensation for that connection to happen because that works yeah. you know an, another thing that might work mr. King and this is again the point of public hearing is to lengthen the school day because as I see you know similarly situated or I see a charter and a traditional public in yeah. the same yeah. neighborhood yeah. the charters that have the longer school days yeah. you know actually seem to have a better outcome and so every traditional public school teacher and principal I've spoken with and there have been many now in the last two months they they clamor for a longer day and so if anyone thinks that our teachers don't want to work longer they just need to ask yeah. because if there are 20 teachers I guarantee you 18 in that school will raise their hand in a minute one would be ambivalent and one wouldn't want it and the one who wouldn't want it is sometimes the, the, the teacher that you know isn't the highest performer our teachers want to do it and I think our children would benefit from it. So I, I think we're learning a few things. Yeah, I think. And I think we can learn from each other. There are things charters can learn from traditional publics and vice versa. And what we lack is a clearinghouse of where that information and those best practices should reside. And I'm going to suggest that's a nice place, a place for it to reside might be uh, see our state superintendent's office. Yes. Mr. Sam, can I just have sure. one final comment? I, yeah, I'm so happy to join at the table with this gentleman. You know, every night when I go to bed and wake up, it's, I can't just believe that 10,000 kids are roaming the street waiting to get in his program. How can the penal institution have a, the GED is the number one program when they get to jail? Everybody want to line up to get a GED. You right. come out of jail, you got a record in one hand and a GED in another hand, and you can't get a job. That's right. That's very frightening. 10,000 yep. as we speak today, and that's why sometimes you could see that uh, they can look at one ward and say ward eight is the predator. War three could be the victim because crime is up at our ANC meeting last night. Rob is up all over the place. And I don't know what we, ten, Mr. Bill, I don't know what, 10,000. Yeah. That's frightening. Well, we add 12 to 1,400 dropouts a year. Yeah. That's the system. The system, you know, is perpetually yeah. creating more yeah. individuals who are, I mean, unable to support themselves yeah. through lawful means. Yeah. And but I, 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 I really, and I say this with all respect to you because. Uh, we sometimes have been on different sides, but it, but you always have a good spirit. You fight a brick, you know, as you're done with the health piece. Mm -hmm. And then when I saw that you were asking all of your committee folks to visit these schools, mm -hmm. and I know you were struggling with uh, the CFO. He probably left because he knew you was going to get him. <laughs> but anyway, no comment. <laughs> but anyway, I mean, you know, it's going to take. The committee, the community, the chancellor, and you said that right, the chancellor needs your help. I think we got the, some, some good school teachers, and we got to look at this pervasive, severe housing shortage. We got to look at the, 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 the poverty. And I talked about Dr. King because I did have a chance to march with him when he came here in 68, 63, and he was talking about jobs, housing, and education. So 2013, we're back talking about the same thing. Well, thank you, Mr. Well, thank King. You. I, I appreciate it. Right. Uh, the chancellor and I consider us to be leadership partners. Uh, you know, we have to row this uh, in the same direction, but I'm also trying to incorporate our charter schools into this I know because we can't, uh, you know, they, they can't be islands onto themselves. These are all public schools. It's not to take away their autonomy, but there has to be planning and there has to be uniformity in terms of assessments, expectations, outcomes without stepping on their autonomy. Yes. Thank you all very much. All right. Our next uh, Thank witness you so much. will be Elaine Carter. This Del Mr. Uh, is it Del Pilago? Um, Kathy Riley, Elaine Megan, Leroy Hall, uh, Renee Wallace, Shannon Smith, 
Um, I have not seen Mr. Saunders. Is Nathan here? Ann Abbott? Okay. Why don't we start on, on, uh, on my right and, and introduce yourself and we'll go right down. Please. Good morning. My name is Daniel Del Pelago. I'm an organizer with Empower DC. We work with groups of low, moderate income residents, uh, district residents to enhance, improve, and promote their self-advocacy skills. I head up our education campaign and work with parents and students and community members from around the city. Um, this past year has been nothing short of stressful for the folks I work with. The one constant is instability. Many school communities have lost librarians. We continue to have one of the highest teacher turnover rates in the nation. Um, there was the failed Proving What's Possible uh, grant program. And I say failed because over half of the schools slated for closure were recipients of these grants, but were not given the opportunity to really prove what's possible. Many of the schools closed in 2008 still sit empty, and at the end of uh, the 2012 year, we heard that, um, that there are more schools will be closed. Um, both these announcements uh, and meetings regarding school closures were ill-timed, sandwiched in between end-of-the-year holidays. Many were left out from engaging in the process. And even though the 2008 round of school closures, which Chancellor Henderson was directly involved in, did not make any significant improvements for our young people's education, the Chancellor wants to continue using the same tactics. I spoke uh, to a parent from Marshall Elementary slated for closure, and she shared with me uh, that she's lost all faith in DCPS when her school was, closing, was chosen for closure and will not be returning to the system uh, once this year is up. This loss of faith and trust that DCPS has caused under the leadership of Kaya Henderson is unfortunately shared by many in our city, and that does not bode well for the future of our valued public school system. Now, both teachers and principals are evaluated every year. If they are not performing, they face termination. It's time that we evaluate the performance and outcomes of DCPS Chancellor Kaya Henderson and replace her as all other DCPS employees are subject to. The future of our neighbor of neighborhood public schools of right is at the moment very bleak with her at the helm. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Del Pielago, is that correct? Yep. Okay. Sorry about that. No, it's good. I have a difficult name to pronounce. I'm sensitive to it. I apologize. <laughs> yes, please. Good morning, Chairman Catania. My name is Eileen McGann. Thank you for the opportunity to testify at today's performance oversight hearing. I am the policy specialist at the ARC of the District of Columbia, a district resident, and a former District of Columbia public schools teacher. The ARC of DC is keenly focused on education outcomes in the district because we believe that all youth with disabilities should be prepared for careers and have the opportunity for jobs alongside non-disabled workers based upon their preferences, interests, and strengths. My testimony today will focus on the need for a quality education for all students, inclusive education, and secondary transition planning. Every child in the District of Columbia deserves a quality education, but often this happens less consistently for children with disabilities. One important factor in quality education for children with disabilities is a quality individualized education program. DCPS has mentioned a team implementing an IEP quality review, which began working this school year. We urge the council to ask for an update on how this team is used and its effectiveness in improving the IEP process. We feel that inappropriate IEPs and placements have a correlation to the high truancy rate among students with IEPs. In several schools in the district, more than 50% of students with IEPs have been identified as truant, a staggeringly high percentage. Oftentimes, this is a curriculum issue, as well as an issue of low expectations on the part of the school and potentially the parent as well. When students with disabilities are not moving towards a promising future, their motivation to attend lessons and their attendance dramatically decreases. The ARC of DC believes that a quality education is also an inclusive one. Inclusive education means youth with disabilities should be afforded the same opportunities as their peers without disabilities all the way through high school. However, DC currently ranks second to last in the country for the percentage of children with disabilities, as well as last in the country for the percentage of children with intellectual disabilities being educated in general education settings. We have questions and concerns about the recent school closure announcements, especially the merging of Mamie D. Lee and Sharp Health into a new campus at River Terrace. We would like to see a purposeful conversation with parents over the next few months, including discussions about whether a self-contained school remains the best educational placement for these students. We look forward to being part of the conversation on this issue. 
Inclusive education also includes the opportunity to earn a regular diploma and have a plan after graduation. Students who graduate with a certificate rather than a diploma are put at a certificate significant disadvantage as they pursue post-graduation opportunities. In addition to affording all students the opportunity to earn a high school diploma, DCPS must work closely with RSA to help students plan for post-graduation, whether that be employment or additional education. The U.S. Department of Education has stated that the district continues to remain in noncompliance in the area of secondary transition. It is clear to us that students in the district are not receiving effective transition planning that takes into account their strengths, challenges, and goals for the future. Another important aspect of secondary transition planning is the ability of students who have reached age of majority and remain enrolled in special education to delegate their legal rights under IDEA to another individual. Currently, some schools in the district are refusing to accept educational powers of attorney and thus refusing to inform parents about IEP meetings or allow them to continue to make IEP decisions for their adult children without a guardianship order. We urge the council to ask DCPS to acknowledge and accept educational powers of attorney, which have been validly executed under DC law. Overall, the ARC of DC believes DCPS has moved forward on some key issues related to achievement of students with disabilities in the district, and we hope to see progress in the areas that still stand in the way of children and youth with disabilities reaching their full potential. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Wallace. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Um, and I'm the executive director of People Animals Love, and we have after school programs in wards seven and eight, and we're in a public school and a charter school. Um, and I'm also the proud parent of two, a DC public school graduate from Cordozo High School, and I have two at Roosevelt right now, so I have a lot of interest in a lot of things that you're saying today on a whole lot of levels. <laughs> um, so I want to comment on four things about DCPS performance. Um, the first three things I want to talk about are extended learning. Um, and you talked about extending the school day. So one way of extending the school day is adding time for the teaching day. Another tool is programs like PAL. And extended learning has a lot of constituencies. You know, we serve the children, we serve the parents, and at Stan Elementary we are a partner with the principal and the daytime team. Um, uh, and I want to give some credit to DCPS for making it very easy for extended learning programs to come into the schools. They have a very, very clear process that it's easy to follow. You know what you need to do if you want to use the school buildings. Um, and I want and I want to speak a little bit about the need to bring parity, right? So it's great the kids at Stanton and the kids that were at DCS Public Charter School. It's wonderful for them that they have a high quality program like PAL. There are other high quality programs in the city, but it's not right that some kids at some cool schools are getting high quality extended learning, other, other children aren't, because it's such an important tool um, to help bring our schools up to solve, help solve this problem of getting them to the ninth grade where you are 100% right. They hit the bar and it is a shock. You know, all of my kids have had trouble getting through high school. Um, they came to me through the child welfare system and you're correct, we lie to them. Um, so I think it's really important that we improve what we're doing in the, in the elementary school grades so they go to high school prepared. <clears throat> I want to talk, uh, att attached to my testimony today, I've, I've wrote letters, uh, I've attached letters from the parents and the kids. For parents, and this addresses the income issue as well, we have a lot of working low-income parents that we serve. And these parents rely on us because we help with homework, we do a lot of amazing programming, and their children are safe, and they know where their children are, and they're in a safe environment. And if these parents lose after-school programming, they have no way to provide them with child care. There's no good option for low-income people in terms of high-quality child care. So this is a big issue, and we have waiting lists at both of our schools of parents who want to get in. Um, for the principals, I think at the schools we're a partner. They view us as a turnaround partner. And I think as you consider the issue of extended learning, you know, it's a lot of responsibility that we put on our principals, as you know. So for, for uh, Ms. Johnson at um, Stanton and Ms. Crouch at DCS, they can rely on us to manage the after-school environment. We do the hiring, we do the management, we do the quality control, we check the data, we work with them in partnership, and it lifts a burden off of them and offers, makes their school a more attractive place. And I'm out of time, so I'm going to be quiet. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony, Ms. Wallace. Are you Ms. Smith? Or Abbott. Ms. Abbott. I apologize. Ms. Abbott. No worries. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, well, good afternoon, Chairman Catania, staff. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today regarding the performance of DCPS. My name is Ann Abbott, and I am a policy analyst at the DC Alliance of Youth Advocates, a citywide coalition of approximately 130 youth-serving organizations, of which PAL is a member, dedicated to ensuring the district's young people transition to a healthy, secure, and productive adulthood. Um, I am going to jump around a little bit into my testimony today because time is short, but I would like to acknowledge some of the gains and advancements DCPS has made in the past year and then offer up some recommendations about some specific areas where I think there's still a lot of need for improvement. So for starters, um, Renee already uh, talked about this a little bit. The Summer Bridge program this year was a huge success, um, and that's something DCPS should absolutely celebrate. Um, they also developed and implemented an early warning system this year, it's partly through the leadership of the council. Um, additionally, DCPS is now fully compliant and interfacing with the statewide longitudinal education data system, or SLED, um, which is out of Aussie, but it'll allow DCPS to um, look at some improved data around its student population, as well as better understand its relationship with charters, post-secondary institutions, the labor market, which is a big, big, big step. And then lastly, um, in the past year, we've seen a lot of progress made around creating a better system of career and technical education, which I'm sure you know is a very well-proven dropout strategy in terms of evidence-based programs. Um, however, the progress we've made around these areas is all great, um, and you know we're definitely looking to raise graduation rates, improve post-secondary success and persistence, and at the end, look at better employment outcomes. But one thing I think DCPS really hasn't focused on a ton, either in the past year or really looking forward, is the re-engagement of the dropout population that we have seen in the past couple years. You referenced a data point earlier that we're, using about, we're losing about 1,200 a year. Um, so the dropout population is growing every year, and we're not doing a great job of re-engaging those students. Certainly, the entire dropout population isn't coming out of DCPS. We know our partners in the charter community are uh, equal partners in that. However, the re-engagement issue has to be something that is dealt with. And currently, there's just not a lot of options in DCPS for re-engagement. There's the stay programs, which if you're over age 21 are effectively night school, which doesn't work for everybody. The full-time programs stop at 21. Um, there's Luke Seymour, which is way over capacity, and there's a waiting list a mile long. Um, there is Washington Met, which is an alternative school, not for re-engaging dropouts, but is an alternative setting. In general, DCPS doesn't have a lot of alternative settings. And when we're talking about issues of capacity at our high schools, you know, we don't have a lot of the school within a school models that other cities are utilizing. We don't have a lot of alternative learning environments, which could help combat not only dropout prevention on the front end, but re-engagement on the back end. So that's just something I think DCPS could really look at. Um, accelerated credit recovery in these online learning, alternative credit schedules like we see more is doing and expanding the options we do have both to combat the capacity issue but also to re-engage the people we've already failed if you have any questions I'm happy to answer those uh, thank you uh, Ms. Abbott I want to thank each of uh, the witnesses um, Mr. Uh, Del Plago I appreciate that uh, these school closures really hit people in their sense of place and their emotional reactions uh, to to when your neighborhood closes and I appreciate you know having attended these uh, 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 public meetings that the Chancellor had in the fall and just in my travels around the city. I mean, these wounds still exist. And part of the issue is parents don't know, you know what their options are, so they see their neighborhood school closing. And we've yet to really create a, a clearinghouse, a dashboard of some sort that helps inform parents of what their options are. So that, that's an issue of, of concern absolutely for me. And we're kicking around ideas. And you know, the reasons I raise these publicly is that you know often people watch the hearings either in the chamber or at home, and they'll send me emails about ideas that that occur to them, or they can perfect or improve upon things that the members talk about and the public talk about. Uh, I'm trying to find a way that we can utilize. Uh, you know, when we had school reform, uh, one of the prior panelists mentioned that school reform kind of happened quickly and we maybe didn't have a chance to fully think through how all of these items would fit together. So you've got uh, what, is, what is the Office of State Superintendent's real role, we've got a State Board of Education, we've got a Charter School Board, we have a Deputy Mayor for uh, you know, uh, Education, we have a Chancellor, we've got an Executive Director of the Public Charter School Board. These parties really haven't spoken and it isn't typical, frankly, among public school systems in the, this country for these various parties to actually knit themselves together. It's not, we're not alone here. It just isn't unique to the district. Um, so I'm looking at, for instance, the role of the ombudsman, uh, which we defunded. Uh, it was originally in the mayor's office, and now I believe it's with the State Board of Education. And what role could an ombudsman play 
An ombudsman could be responsible, for instance, for uh, controlling a dashboard or establishing, establishing a dashboard so that parents could have information about the schools in their neighborhood, whether they are charter or traditional public, and information such as you know, their CAS scores, their retention rates, their class sizes, school sizes. Uh, it could have information about the number of vacancies there, the, the staff rating, parent rating, student rating, so parents can make an informed choice. Right now, I, I suspect, and it's been my experience, many parents don't understand the charter school movement or vice versa. So they don't know when the lottery happens. They don't know, they don't understand, they don't understand it. They bought into some degree the notion that it is selective against them. You know, and, and, and so there's no place for the parent to go to, under, to get the information and to understand the process and if they feel that they've been aggrieved, someone to work with them. I think having the ombudsman, and I'm wor working on these ideas, and I don't want to be precipitous, I don't want to be quick, we'll think through these. Giving the ombudsman responsibility, uh, you know, over more than just DCPS. And so we hear, for instance, a lot of anecdotal evidence that goes into the urban myth about what's wrong, that with one side or the other that fuels this Hatfield McCoy battle between the charters and traditionals. I hear repeatedly that, you know, that a charter school will put a child out. Uh, and we don't know why. But depending on which side of the fence you're on, you believe what you want to believe. If you're an anti-charter school uh, person, you believe that the child was put out because they didn't want the person or there was a disciplinary problem or whatever. If you're, you know, if you're a pro-charter school person, you say the child had a disciplinary problem and we have standards. But until we actually have a non-interested intermediary who could go in and sort through it, again, without imposing on autonomy, but collect the data and be sensible through exit interviews and understand the situation, we're just speculating, right? So I'm looking for a broader role for ombudsman. And, and that ombudsman, you know, candidly, I'm looking as well, and you know, of course, whenever we talk about school reform, there is a disinclination to have the council involved among many people in the city, because they think that we will do something rash or uninformed, or, or pick a friend or pick an enemy and burden one system over the other. I think there's a role not only for the ombudsman, but also for an inspector general within the system to to be able to make sure that the data is honest. Again, that there is an independent person within the office of the state superintendent that is not subject to political pressure, that has a finite term, that, that we can go to to, act, to take the politics out. Because as of now, the state superintendent reports to the mayor, the chancellor reports to the mayor, the deputy mayor reports to the mayor. Uh, the State Board of Education has largely been sidelined and relegated to very few responsibilities and is not taken seriously, which is wrong. Um, you know, we have all of these institutions which we should knit together, they should have their swim lanes, and we should have some voices that can be honest. And so we're just talking here. Um, you know, and one of the roles, and this goes to it, is it Ms. McGann, the role that you raise for, um, for individuals with IEP. Um, you know, couldn't the school ombudsman you know, if properly constituted, be that advocate for the parent, whether the child is in a charter school or is in a traditional public school. You know, what, one thing I'm trying to do is unpack a system that has been constructed for adults and redirect it so that parents have information and children have expectations. All right? W what about that? I, I think that's definitely a good first step. I think. There also needs to be more training for teachers and principals about how to reach out to those parents, but I think having an impartial something at play would also be really helpful. I think the expectations that you raised both now and earlier during this hearing is really important. I found as a special education teacher that often when there's an IEP meeting, the IEP goals are thrown out if you don't want to continue with them or they're brought onto the next IEP with no real thought about why that child didn't master it, what still needs to be mastered of that goal. So I think having clear expectations would be really helpful. Uh, and again, you know, this may be, um, you know, may be ambitious to do in a short period, but constructing a system where we don't just push the children along and, and paper over the failure you know, okay, so we didn't get your IEP done. We d we're not doing it correctly. By law, I have to make you go on, right? That's just not working for me. Uh, actually drilling down, you know, for this, I, I raised this example of this child who's, you know, in the fifth grade with a first grade level. 
you know, we, we know who taught that child in the fourth grade, and we know who taught the child in the third, in the second, and in the first. You can reconstruct this, right? Uh, but that's not very interesting. The point is, you know, every teacher should be required to make sure that the child is moving along on course, and if they need an IEP, they have it, and that they have the resources. Because I don't, I'm not, this is not about blaming teachers. As I said at the top of my remarks, we have some extraordinary talent. You know, and before people just decide to, to opt out of traditional public schools, I would encourage them to go visit their principals and visit the teaching staff. The CPS has not done a good job, in my mind, of getting out and, 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 and marketing themselves. And, and that sounds kind of cheap, but this is the world in which we live. You've got to compete. Um, and, and again, if we had this dashboard, this clearinghouse managed by an ombudsman that could put the honest data for people to see, parents could make their choices, and if they felt like they were being unfairly guided out of a school, um, you know, we could keep everyone honest. Um, all right, well, listen, thank you all very much. Um, I want to say, Ms. Uh, Wallace, you appeared last week or the week before in front of the committee. I, I'm aware of your program, PAL, at Stanton, and it's really part of the, the renaissance of that school. And I continue to uh, express uh, the committee's thanks for your work there. Thank you. I just wanted to say, um, on the school consolidation, the one thing, I, because I didn't talk fast enough, I didn't mention is that we don't really know, those of us who are working in the schools, we don't really know who at DCPS is in charge of each school consolidation. They said they're going to put together a team for each school, uh, and it's not clear for folks who want to be involved who they should be talking to. And I know this is true for Stanton, so I'm going to assume it's true at other schools, and so you might urge DCPS to make that knowledge very clear to folks. Um, Ms. Wallace, that's a great point. We actually this week received uh, just... Uh, the, the transition plan for DCPS, and I'm going to ask my staff to, 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 to upload that on the committee's website so people can read it. I, I, it does not mention individual names. I think that's a great point and one that could facilitate the transition, but I'm going to ask the committee staff at the conclusion of the hearing to upload on, uh, on our uh, website. Uh, Ms. Abbott, your, your discussion about reengagement is something that is very important to uh, this committee. Uh, in a recent truancy uh, piece of legislation that I authored that is before the committee now, um, the, the idea was to CFSA under current law will do home visits on 5 to 13 year olds when there are 10 unexcused absences. Mm -hmm. And I want to expand that to 14 through 17 year olds in part because uh, I want to know where these children are. And they still are children. And, you know, whether they are in a, in a, a, a Jack's situation of, of, of uh, harm's way, whether they've just checked out, we need to know where they are because they have simply fallen off a map, and fallen off the map. And one, you know, one area that I think uh, that I'm excited about exploring is the use of city year in our high school settings because we have it in our elementary and middle school. And uh, part of my testimony that I skipped over for the sake of time was just about um, Ms. Wallace mentioned it in her testimony um, about partnerships at, with DCPS for community-based organizations. And um, in Power, DC also mentioned that the PWP program, so an unfortunate side effect of PWP was the Office of Out-of-School Time programs, which formerly helped facilitate CBO access into elementary, middle, and high schools. Um, was disbanded a little. So there's not there's not really a great opportunity anymore for community-based organizations to partner with high schools. Clearly, those partnerships at the high school level look a lot different than they do at the elementary and middle school level. You're talking more of a career, college prep focus, and also academic remediation. But the process for high schools at DCPS, I'm sorry, the process for CBOs and other supports to get into DCPS high schools is not easy or encouraged. Right. Well, uh, for those who aren't familiar with City Year, these uh, young people come, they're recent uh, college grads, they come, they spend a year in the city. We have 164 of them in 16 of our schools. They're mostly in 7 and 8. We have two schools, I think, mm -hmm. in uh, Ward 1. They're doing some with Cardozo, mm -hmm. um, but, but they really haven't. We haven't really invested in our high schools. And these kids are able to reach, you know, they're able to reach uh, young people because they're closer in proximity to age. The children open up to them. They're specially trained. You know, it's about math and reading. It's about social behavior. It's about attendance and success. And you know, I'm very impressed with City Year. And you know, we we have the ability and the offer to expand into high schools. And this may be an area where it may take some one-on-one -on -one with children, young people who are just a few years older than the kids that they are interacting with. That might be, um, you know, that might work. It's worth exploring. 
I want to thank each of you for your thank testimony. You. Thank you. Um, all right. Next, uh, Maggie Ridden. She's um. Okay. Colleen Edwards. Okay. Ebony Rose Thompson. Is, is it uh, Miss Yukta? Uh, Mr. Mulhauser. Mr. Drake. Miss Zo? A show? Um, Ms. Edwards. Yes. Good morning. My name is Colleen Edwards, and I am here representing on behalf of children, an organization started last year to bring an evidence-based... Ms. Edwards, I'm, I'm sorry for interrupting, but could you uh, maybe pull the mic a little closer or, or maybe speak up just a bit so we can catch you on audio? We'll restart your clock so you have your full time. How is this? Perfect. Thank okay, you. Okay, great. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Colleen Edwards, and I am representing On Behalf of Children, an organization started last year to bring an evidence-based, heavily researched program into the D.C. public schools. I am a product of the D.C. public schools, and I and my colleagues are deeply concerned about our children, our schools, our families, and our communities. Each team member has over 30 years working with and for children and families in the educational and social services arenas. I don't need to refer this morning to current statistics on behavior problems, low academics, bullying, and violence in our schools. We're all aware of those. I am here today to introduce and request that the D.C. Public Schools allow us to integrate our evidence-based social educational learning tool into the school system. This tool, which addresses all of these issues, is called mindfulness. Mindfulness was started in the field of medicine 30 years ago and is used in psychology, the military, healthcare, social services, and corporate environments. Mindfulness is now being utilized in the field of education. An enormous amount of research has been done on mindfulness and education, and a recent meta-analysis of 213 studies of these programs involving a group of over 270,000 students has found that these students improve significantly with respect to social and emotional skills, classroom behavior, conduct problems, emotional distress, test scores, and school grades including an 11 percentile point gain in academic achievement. Results have been continuously maintained in each of these categories. Mindfulness is being championed by Congressman Tim Ryan of Ohio, who has written a book, this book, entitled A Mindful Nation, and by actress Goldie Hawn, who has developed the Mind Up program for schools and has written this book, Ten Mindful Minutes. Mindfulness programs are being used in schools in at least 15 states. Mindfulness quiets the sympathetic nervous system and brings our bodies into balance. It lessens stress and causes a shift in the brain toward the left frontal region where more positive mental states are activated. It enhances compassion, focus, attention, and with neuroplasticity can reshape our brains and nervous systems. Our program, based on the Mindful Schools curriculum, involves going into the classroom for only 15 minutes, twice per week, for eight weeks. This program has served over 18,000 students and 750 teachers in 53 schools, 70% serving predominantly at-risk youth with significant results. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the Council. Uh, thank you, Ms. Edwards. Um, Mr. Mulhauser. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. My name is Fritz Mulhauser. I'm a staff attorney at the American Civil Liberties Union of the nation's capital. We're here to comment on a couple specific areas of unsatisfactory performance in the public schools this year, 
and our written statement also provides some views on the pending truancy legislation. Uh, the two areas of concern, first, uh, both are in line with your concern, I think, for the r relation of the system to the community generally and the, uh, uh, the openness and transparency that we hope for. The first is that there's a brand new directive called uh, School Visitors records release and barring notice procedures in which the school system lays out uh, a strict set of rules that allows them to control the access of parents and others who uh, want and need to be in the school. Uh, parents last summer began uh, bringing to the Committee of the Whole their concerns with barring from schools and the uh, Chairman Mendelssohn uh, had discussions with the school system about the topic and he's involved uh, members of the community since then. The new directive simply is uh, over strict and uh, uh, creates a, a, a series of barriers that are troublesome. Uh, parents uh, may have difficulty because of required identifications, uh, the amount of time that lawyers and advocates can be in the school uh, are subject to strict limits. Um, the Public Defender Service has raised a number of questions of access for attorneys. And most of all, the schools now have authority under this directive to bar parents for a series of very vague uh, offenses, such as attempted disruption. Um, we urge the committee to ask uh, the school system to withdraw the directive and uh, work further with the community. They're, they've ignored comments about the problems with this directive. And it bodes uh, uh, likely to allow discretion at the school level to bar people uh, in ways that are very concerning. Second, we echo your concern for access to the budget and our testimony both to the Chancellor at her budget hearing in December and uh, our written statement explains. It took us 190 days last year to get the full budget of the school system. Uh, that's really hard to understand and we even appealed to the mayor uh, in our freedom of information work and the mayor ordered the chief financial officer and the schools to give us the budget and it still took months and months. Uh, this is uh, impossible uh, for the community uh, which wants to know the full budget. Uh, you're doing important work asking those questions but we bring to your attention that it's very hard for the community to find it as well. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Mohauser. Um, Mr. Drake. Mr. Chairman, my name is Ron Drake, attorney. Uh, attached here to as a part of my testimony is a copy of the District of Columbia parent consent for a field trip waiver of claim to medical authorization that I received from my five-year-old twin daughters, Dawn and Autumn Drake. I have bracketed the offending language. In order for my daughters to attend DCPS school class sponsored field trips, I must waive their rights in the event they are injured on that field trip, either through the negligence of DCPS, presumably including gross or wanton negligence. That waiver may well operate to exonerate any third party joint tortfeasor. Without that waiver, my daughters are barred from participating with their classmates on field trips. Rather, other arrangements must be made for their supervision at school during their exclusion from normal participation with their classmates. DCPS Office of General Counsel has refused to remove the waiver requirement, but assured me that a claimant could probably find a way around it in court. That, of course, would require motions practice at a likely cost in the tens of thousands of dollars or more, funds unavailable to most parents. I request you take appropriate steps to compel DCPS to remove this wa waiver and return to a circle permission for field trip. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Drake. Mrs. Is it Ms. Zhou? Zhao. Zhao, please. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lisa Zhao. My family is from China. I'm the lead, lead student organizer of the Student Multi Ethnic Action Research Team and the executive officer of DC Youth Advisory Council for May Year. This is my third year in the United States. I'm now a junior in Woodrow Wilson High School. In August 2012, I was told that I have to graduate after this school year. My family and I were shocked. Officers from D.C. downtown told me that I need to take after-school courses during my junior year in order to graduate. 
I told them that I did not want to graduate because I didn't finish all my high school courses and not fully prepared for college, including SAT test, college search, and the community service. If I graduated this year, I only had time from August to December to finish all this preparation. I said it is not possible, especially for an ELL student. But they, they still insisted on their decision. Luckily, I had a chance to meet with Ms. Henderson in September 2012. I stated my situation and Ms. Henderson and her officers helped me, helped me with, and my parents to communicate with my school and DC downtown. The solution is that I can stay for another year at Wilson to continue my senior year education. I understand that government pays a lot of money for each DC public school student. I understand that why they want students to graduate at, as early as possible. I agree that graduating early helps students to work early to pay taxes which de develop our society. But I do have some suggestions. Since age is a static thing, we definitely know who's going to be 18 before they graduate. So why don't school talk with parents and, their, and students uh, when students are freshmen to figure out a way to graduate earlier instead of a surprise. In my case, if someone told me during my freshman year that I need to graduate at, after junior year, I can and would do it, as long as they gave me enough time to prepare for college application. So I think the District of Columbia Department of Education and all DC public high schools have the responsibility to clarify graduation policy to all freshmen and their parents. We should let students know the result. It is not their, it's not fair for them by giving them a surprise. Additionally, general high school education is four years. If students do not want, do not want, and their parents do not want them, their children to graduate earlier, I think no one has the right to force them to graduate when they have only attended three years high school or even less. I believe it's students' right to get a full high school education. I suggest District of Columbia Department of Education should reconsider and remake the policy of graduation. I believe no matter whom, we all have the same goal. Let students have a good education and a good future. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Zhao. Uh, let me start with um, let me start with Mr. Drake and his testimony about the uh, consent form. So DCPS follows uh, these hearings, and uh, and I require that uh, I mean it's a it's it's a an understanding that they follow the hearings and that they incorporate in their public testimony uh, before this committee on the first the concerns that were raised by uh, individuals who testify today. I have to be honest, uh, Mr. Drake. I'm not sure how this committee uh, inserts itself into the drafting of the permission slip process, uh, other than to have. Uh, DCPS respond in writing to your concerns. I happen to think that you're, you're correct, um, you, that this is probably, um, you, this, is, this is probably something that, that is not in fact waivable, but it would require a lawsuit and would require quite a lot of time and effort to sort it out. And it, it is for people who take the time to read. I mean, it's pretty daunting to, you, you don't want to release them of all responsibility. You might um, you certainly understand the school system has some concerns with respect to liability, but but you know this this would permit them to almost wantonly and willfully injure your child and, and therefore be relieved of responsibility. Uh, I will raise this issue with the school system, but you know there and there's no perfect line between you know what is appropriate for the legislature and when when do we start insert our, inserting ourselves into the actual uh, execution of the work, right? I'll raise this, but I, I'm not sure that we are in a position to actually draft by statute what the what the permission slip or consent form will look <coughs> like. Uh, so we, we will be here on the first uh, with DCPS. I encourage you to, to call back the committee staff if you're not able to follow it, and we'll give you whatever resolution or whatever guidance the uh, DCPS gave us. Okay. I thank you. I, I suspect that uh, sunlight uh, on this matter will be a great benefit. Well, I mean, what, I, what strikes me is the theme that you raise is very similar to the theme and concern that Mr. Mohauser raised, which is, you know, in a system where we've got these two uh, systems that are both competing for school for, for school age children, and when, when one is very inviting and actually goes out of their way to solicit parents and children, it's no wonder that that system is attracting children. 
And when one puts up barriers or makes it difficult or has limited, you know, extracurricular or limited options and makes them difficult to participate in, my parents feel put upon uh, by that system. So um, both of you, I think, are, uh, are on to something. It's something that I know the chancellor, you know, is concerned with. And, you know, she has a very difficult job. I talk about all the time, but, you know, I consider the two of us to be leadership partners. She has a very challenging job. She has many, many issues that are, um, are at play, and she has to prioritize. But nonetheless, I think at the very least in her testimony, she can give a reaction to both your comments and Mr. Mohauser's comments. Um, Ms. Zhao, yes. uh, thank you for being here today. I, you know, we have... Uh, it's very impressive that only three years in the country that you were able to give such a compelling testimony Thanks. and that you you know you found your way we've got you know, we have many people who've been in you know our country their whole lives and wouldn't necessarily uh, be compelled to come to the Wilson building under the best of circumstances and give testimony as you have and so uh, welcome to Washington and, and uh, great job okay. thank you um, miss Edwards can you tell me where this SEL tool has been successfully used so that as the committee does its work to look for, um, you know, we, to the best of our ability, we understand that not all tools have been tried. Sometimes you just have to apply common sense. But can you give us some indications of where this tool has been used right. um, that, so that we, we might do our own independent work? Sure. Throughout um, California, in particular in the Oakland area, it's been utilized. Um, there's a program in New York in fact, in this additional piece that I had, I sent to everyone, there are also some programs here listed. Um, oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. The Horn Foundation, there's one, she has a school in Virginia. The Inner Kids Foundation, there's Wellness Works in Schools, which is in several states. Kentucky, Pennsylvania, uh, South Carolina, uh, Texas, there are at least 15 states where it's been utilized. The Language Project, Inner Resilience Program. Uh, there's a program in Baltimore also that we visited about two weeks ago that's making a huge impact in inner city Baltimore, and that's called the Holistic Life Foundation. Holistic Life Foundation. Holistic Life Foundation, yes. <coughs> Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, um, and uh, Mr. Mohauser, I appreciate your full testimony. We'll have. I, I appreciate you couldn't uh, read the whole testimony in the three minutes allotted, but we make copies available for all the for all of our colleagues. They're, they're part of the uh, committee record, and uh, we'll make sure that uh, they're circulated. All right. Thank you all very much for your testimony. Thank you. Our next uh, witnesses are Miss uh, Q. Mr. Q. Um, Geraldine Talley Hobby, Julian Robertson King, Virginia Spatz, <coughs> all right, um, is it Mr. Mr. Q? Uh, yes. Okay, please. My, my name is Chen. I'm a student from Woodrow Wilson High School and also a young organizer from SMART. DCPS made a lot of changes last year. There are some good changes that students like, but also some changes that we don't like. Today I would like to focus on the issues about graduation. I'm a junior and I'm just started to learn about how many things we needed for, my, for me to graduate and go to good college, like SAT 1, 2, and how to apply for good, good college. There are so many things that they are so important for us because the college can change our life. I have two friends there who, there who are both junior, so they, will, they should be facing the same situation like me too, but they are not. Last year, when the school started, they got an order from DCPS. The order is they have to graduate this year for some reason like age. I want to ask, was that a property to, so then, uh, so then they changed it graduation year when they are junior. This is very important because they are, that means the student only have one year to prepare and go to college. Because of this, that student have to graduate this year, they are taking English 3 and 4 at the same time. If a normal student can take English 3 and 4 at the same time, then, we, we, then why, why we need English 3 and 4, it should be taken separately. This decision, this, this decision to take them at the same time can destroy the 
student. This student came to this country only four years ago. English is very hard class for him. Now, because of an, uh, an order from downtown, he will finish two years of classes and prepare for college in one year. He will not learn about SAT and what we needed to graduate and go to college. That sounds very ridiculous. And DCPS do did and did did and did DCPS do an assessment report for every student who is on that list. So as a student, I would like I don't like this order, and I think DCPS wants if a DCPS wants a student to graduate early, they have to inform them two years before they graduate. For those of students who have been asked to graduate this year, we should give them a chance to graduate next year. Thank you. Thank you. Is, is it Mr. Chu? I, I just want to get your name correct. It's Chu. Chu? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chu. Uh, Ms. Uh, Tally Hobby. Good morning, uh, Chairman Catania and morning. committee members. To God be the glory and God I trust, Jesus is Lord. My name is Geraldine Tally Hobby, a DCPS injured teacher who is speaking for the D.C. Interworkers Committee, Civil Service, uh, D, uh, Federal D.C., consisting of two other D.C.P.S. employees, Thelma Moore, a former bus driver, and Geraldine Adams, a deceased security guard, who sustained acceptable work-related claims. These injuries were deemed permanent federal workers' compensation claims. U.S. Congressman Charles Ranga wrote a letter on my behalf to Michelle V, former chancellor, and to Kaya Henderson, the present counselor, chancellor, with no response from Ms. V to no adequate answers from Ms. Henderson. Uh, D.C. U.S. Congress um, uh, Representative Eleanor Holmes Norton seems to ignore the issues of our personal le on a personal level and over all issues. Enough is enough. Teachers and the children of the district have been played with too long. Poverty and homelessness must end. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. stated, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice every everywhere. Whatever affects one, affects one, affects all. He also stated, it never, it's never too late to do the right thing. Under the Freedom of Information Act, we need answers to the following questions. These questions mostly originate from employees who were hired on or before September 30th, 1987, and then those after October 1st, 1987. There are reasons to review, reopen, reconsider, redetermine, and to restore wrongful, legal, and unlawful acts of termination of employment and workers' compensation disability especially uh, when they are permanent. Fraud, error, mistakes, incompetence, other issues such as newly discovered evidence. These are the questions, um, these are some questions. There are also additional questions uh, going to be presented for the, uh, to the Washington Teachers Union. But under the Home Rule Act, uh, we have been deprived of our um, uh, retention rights, our civil service rights, our uh, rights and privileges. So we need answers to this. Also, we want to know the duties and responsibilities of the chairman of the committees over uh, agencies. Is this a fiduciary duty? Uh, can the district deprive employees who were hired under under civil uh, civil service retain, um, retirement pension, their pension and reinstatement of employment? Uh, who looks into fraud, mistakes, error, incompetence? Does the Social Security uh, Administration notify an employee uh, uh, who receives a favorable decision? Ms. Uh, Ali Hobby, I'm sorry, but if you could wrap up this uh, sentence. I'll, or so, I'll try my best. Okay. But I, we need all answers to all of these questions. Also, is the district a federal agent of the United States government? That's the most important question. We are not. And. Um, let me close it up since you want to rush me through. Each one of these Ms. questions. Tally Hobby, Ms. Tally Hobby, we, we give everyone three minutes and you're now almost. Well, uh, this is a group, so I was supposed to get five. Well, um, you're not presented on the witness list as a group. And so yes, I'm it is. I'm Look on page go, two. I'm going to go to Ms. Uh, Robertson King. Page two. I want answers to these questions. I'm tired of being looped around, and we are tired of being looped around. People are dying who are injured, Thank and you. it's going to stop. 
Thank you, and, and, and the poverty and the other things that are happening to these employees is going to stop. Ms. Tally Hobby, thank you very much for your testimony. Um, You're very welcome. Ms. King. Good morning, Chairman. Um, I am listed as a public witness, but I do want to say for the record that I am uh, an attorney at law and I'm chair of the LSAT for Phelps Senior High School. I'm also a member of Empower DC and the Associate Council for Premier Community Development Corporation. I want to thank you for having the hearing. Um, I want to depart from my text momentarily and talk about an incident that happened in September of 2011. I used to live in a very, very dangerous neighborhood. And I was walking home one morning through users and dealers, and um, my attention was drawn to a very small person who was standing at the bus stop crying. And because I have four children of my own, I stopped and I asked him what's wrong. And he said, I'm lost. I don't know how to get to school. And so I whipped out my telephone and I said, stop crying. And we called his mom and I introduced myself. I let him talk to her and then I told her, mom, with your permission, we're going to get in the cab and we're going to take him to school. And it was a miracle, especially in that neighborhood, but a cab came almost immediately. And so we took him to where he was going, and it turns out he was about eight blocks off of his normal route. The mother explained to me that on the first day of school, he walked with his friends, but that his regular school had been closed, and on that day that I saw him, he was walking alone because he was running late. I don't like to tell this story because it's a spiritual thing. I have four children of my own and I always pray that someone would help them if they were in need. But she got off the phone as he got out of the car and I was on my way home and she called me back and said something to me that will stay with me till the day I die. Mrs. King, that story could have ended in a completely different way. And I have to ask Chairman, how many times in a day, in a week, or in a year does that story really end in a different way? And our children are victimized or diverted or hurt because their neighborhood schools are closing. Our responsibility to this generation includes giving them safe opportunities to go to school. Now, I want you to know that my written testimony is born out of deep frustration, deep pain, and a sense of hopelessness because it looks to me right now as if our school jurisdiction has been the test case for privatization and that corporations have come in and they see access to dollars as a motivation to herd us out of traditional schools into the charters. And what I'm asking today is that we consider the human toll that is being taken not just on our children but on our entire way of life and i'm going to i'm going to ask my uh, indulgence for just one moment uh, Ms. king if you could just complete that uh, sentence or very that quickly. thought and then i need to go on to the next very race. quickly on april 4th 1968 i was a seven-year-old second grader and the news came about the assassination of martin luther king and at that moment it appeared that our forward progress would stop. But it was our teachers, our public school teachers, who cultivated at least two generations of highly accomplished people. And so I'm asking that we honor that legacy. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Ms. King. Ms. Spatz. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. My name is Virginia Spatz, and I'm kind of sick, so I hope you can hear me. Um, I came to ask the Education Committee to consider plans for School Without Walls as an example illustrating the performance of DCPS. DCPS decided to merge Walls, an application-only high school with no in-boundary students, with Francis Stevens, a neighborhood-based pre-K through 8 school. DCPS explains this by saying that it, quote, allows the high-performing School Without Walls to expand its grades and manage a neighborhood boundary education campus at the Francis Stevens Building, end quote. The unanswered questions are legion and serious. Here are just a few. 
Wallace Principal Richard, Richard Trogish has experience at the middle school level, but is there any evidence that Wallace's model in particular will translate to younger grades? Has DCPS clearly examined how an application-only model will work in a neighborhood base? What will the boundary situation mean for students outside Foggy Bottom in terms of Wall's admittance? And what does the expansion mean more generally for our neighborhood high school enrollments? My son, a 2011 graduate of Wall's, says the most important aspect of his experience was the small community feeling. The small size and lack of certain resources meant students developed self-reliance by finding their own soccer fields, developing theater performances with little or no faculty help, and generally learning to create with duct tape and spit. Students worked together across all four grades. This was particularly important to my son in his freshman year when graduating seniors helped him find his way in high school and to begin looking beyond. Will any of this survive expansion, especially if ninth graders are isolated on the expansion campus? I heard the chancellor say that Walls did not want to lose its association with GW by expanding to a different neighborhood, but did DCPS explore what is and is not replicable about the Walls model? A small application-only high school, perhaps one returning to Walls' alternative roots, might well thrive in another quadrant and perhaps better meet district needs, including diversity. When my son attended Walls, the percentage of European-American students roughly reflected their percentage in DCPS. At this point, however, Walls is 36% white, while the overall DCPS population is only 10% white. If the issue is one of entrance requirements, that disparity is only going to grow in expansion. If the issue is more complicated, a mix of factors, has DCPS <coughs> examined those? Does the Chancellor have any plans to reestablish equity at Walls or to promote diversity across the system and avoid racial isolation in so many of our classrooms? The many serious unanswered questions about Walls illustrate how little DCP taxpayers are getting in return for our investment in the Chancellor and her staff. We need real vision for our schools, and that includes equity and diversity. Please include these concerns in your oversight. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Well, I thank each of the witnesses uh, for testifying. Uh, Mr. Chu, we will raise the issues uh, that you mentioned with the Chancellor when she comes uh, for, uh, before the Committee on Oversight. Uh, specifically, I, uh, why uh, there's such a pressure on English as uh, foreign language learners to graduate them early. We have historically made accommodations um, for individuals with individual education plans and individuals who, for whom English is a second language. We've been more accommodating in terms of, uh, of graduating timelines. And I think what you say makes perfect sense. It doesn't, it doesn't seem sensible to put a, a person through a third and fourth level English class simultaneously if the idea is one sequentially builds on the other. And I think that's a great point. Um, Ms. King, thank you. Uh, and Ms. Tally Hobby, thank you. Uh, Ms. King, I, I just, just don't see the world the same way you do when it comes to charter schools. And that's okay. I mean, we can just continue talking. That's what these forums are for, uh, to continue to see if we can better understand each other's position. Uh, I don't believe the schools that are closing are closing because they were full. They were closing because parents made a choice uh, for a better opportunity in their mind for their child. And I don't have, um, you know, I, don't, I am not comfortable substituting my judgment for the parent's judgment when it comes to the education of their child. And I've been in enough schools now in the last two months to see excellent traditional public schools and to see excellent charter schools. And I've, I've seen, you know, that if we can do some tweaking uh, here and there, uh, that we, uh, we can build a first-rate public education system. I, I agree that we have to make sure that there are high quality tier one schools, whether they're charter or public, in every community, in every cluster. And we have some uh, uh, evidence to suggest that that is not the case right now. But what we need to do is look at making sure we try to encourage the creation of tier ones in each of our communities so these long uh, walks are unnecessary. But I appreciate you being here, appreciate your point of view, and that's why you know, we have public input we continue to talk about those things that are that are on our minds um, and miss Spence uh, I'm not quite sure what your 
you know, you raise a lot of questions, but if you could just bottom line it for me. Are you opposed to the Chancellor's plan to merge um, Walls with Francis Stevens? I, I am, based on my um, son's experience with the school and what he and his friends tell me uh, what was important to them, more, though, the reason that I raised the question is that I think there are just so many unanswered questions and that the Chancellor's statements about it really bespeak a lack of knowledge about what was important about that school and what is going to transfer. And I don't think we have a clue what is actually replicable. And if we did, you know, the Walls model could be used all over town. Um, and if not, then it's not going to work if you make it bigger. In large part, it works. Sorry, I just want to be clear. So your son graduated in 2011. Correct. So that was two years ago. And what were the racial demographics of Walls in 2011? Um, he, it was. I I looked it up, and I believe that his years it was European students were like 10 or 15 percent of the population. Well, where, now where it's did, 36. Where did you get that information? The. Um, uh, NCLB, um, the OSSE website, and the the um, the what web, uh, the OSSE website. Did OSSE. you bring that with you? Uh, I have it on my computer. Um, I didn't. I didn't write it down. I can. So do I can you give you all the statistics if you what, want. That. What does that have to do with the idea? Because the chancellor, um, there was a very robust proposal by the Francis Stevens community. Um, just to re remind everyone, Stevens had been closed in 08 and merged with Francis, so now it's Francis Stevens. And they came up with a very exciting proposal that has, you know, the support of the principal from Walls to expand, to keep that school open. Would it be better that we close Francis Wall, Francis Stevens? Um, I, I can't speak to that because I really don't know what's going on in that, in that grade school. I think it's important to have a neighborhood school and that neighborhood needs a school. Um, I think that this proposal was just slapdash. And of course, you know, at this point, it, well, you know, Walls is... I'm, in, in all fairness, Ms. Batts, did you read the proposal that was put together by the Francis Stevens parents? Uh, you know, they went out, they received a rather large grant from George Washington University for the very purpose of planning. Uh, for planning about Walls or for planning about their own under, you know, low level... The, the, this, this integrated campus. Um, I saw some early proposals. I'm not sure if I saw what you're okay. referencing. Well, in, again, um, the, the, the proposal that I saw was a very thoughtful proposal. Uh, you know, but it doesn't take away from your point that you know, we need to do a better job, perhaps, of communicating it and that there can, in fact, be holes in it. And so uh, the challenge is to fill those holes and not to diminish the school without walls because it is, you know, it is from, a, from a testing proficiency perspective, the highest uh, testing high school in our city. Well, because they, it's application only. You don't get in unless you can pass well, the, the test. Well, the same is true for Banneker. Uh, okay, okay, but... The same is true for um, Duke Ellington. Indeed, and I don't think that DCPS looks at that and when they make decisions. In fact, those schools are decisions. much more restrictive than, you know, the charter high schools that require uh, a blind lottery, uh, right? Um, that's that could be true. I don't see. I okay. guess I don't see the the point. Um, well, I don't see the point that you're trying to make. Do you, is the point that you're trying to make that um, your you, because you, you and I want to hear the point you're trying to make. I'm trying to hear the public testimony. And so, if, is the point that we shouldn't have this merger? Is that your point, or is your point that you just don't have the information that makes you comfortable with it? Um. What I've seen in reference to walls, I don't support. I think I would, I'm really concerned about these issues about equity and about if expanding it will lose what's core about it. It, um, I, I don't know that, and especially if ninth graders are moved separately, I really. I, I understand that the high school will still be um, by, by selection, by application only. I, that's not the, for me, that's not the issue at all. I mean, I think that's an issue when you're looking at its test scores. I think, I think that the issue of, that Walls functioned because it was a community. That is what my son and his friends tell me. And it was especially, I think it's especially important for young men 
it it really allowed the older guys to help the younger guys find their feet and get on their way and i think that especially if ninth graders are put off and i talk to some kids who go there and the last they had heard that was one of the the proposals was that ninth graders would be at francis stevens and my son actually took a drama class at francis stevens and it did not work out well i mean it's 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 a it's a bit of a schlep and sometimes there would be something like the teacher wasn't there and he didn't know until he got there and you know so then of course the kids didn't really manage to get back to school um it it isn't as smooth as it looks and i just think there's so many questions my real point in bringing it is i'm worried about walls but i'm also worried that this is the kind of planning we're getting they don't you know the chance to announce this without having looked looked into the community and without like why didn't she ask these recent graduates what was important you know they don't ask who it matters and they don't ask who has the information right. when they make these decisions well, i guess um the chancellor can't win because what she did was she took uh and listened to the community that is currently affected which are may i finish yes 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 she listened to the current stakeholders who are in the school as well as the current administrators and the community that is surrounding that school that put an extraordinary amount of effort in a proposal for a school that was slated to be closed and that community was able to convince the chancellor that for those kids who are presently in school that this was in their best interest she was also able to get the buy-in and the enthusiastic buy-in from the current principal of Walls with the ex- expectation that that high-quality school can, in fact, expand to have more options for a part of the city that has far too, high, far too few high school options. There is not a single... Uh, the, the, the Ward 2 high school options are very few. You have Wilson that has, you know, 60% of the city as its catchment area. Okay, and so perhaps, uh, you know, it might free up more space, uh, again, through an application process for people who live in the community. But right now, the only high schools in Ward 2 are application only, and there are limited spaces at Duke Ellington. Uh, In fact, Duke Ellington, the the, the smallest percentage of the kids from Duke Ellington come from Ward 2. All right? It's less than 2%. All right? And then you have a very small walls which is our finest public high school in terms of proficiency, period. Banneker is next. And so it would give us the option to have more of a proven school, more spaces for more kids, because there is a waiting list to get into Walls. Now, I think you're right that we should be careful not to lose the success that Walls enjoys. That's a good point. But I, I think it's unfair to suggest that the chancellor isn't listening. When this Francis Stevens was slated for closure, the community stepped up came up with a robust plan and private financing and got the buy-in of the two institutions for a need. I just, I, again, we can continue talking, but I just don't see it uh, quite the same way. Well, that was all after the fact. And yes, they, they okay. the one, the school that was slated to close managed to okay. survive. I, I don't think that was perhaps the ideal way to go. Mr. Right. Chairman, well, if I you. might. Just a moment, uh, Ms. King, uh, yeah, please, you'll have the final word, and then I've got to go to the next panel of witnesses. Thank you. I didn't want to leave the table with the um, idea that I am a opponent of charter schools. I am a proponent of children being able to go to schools in their neighborhood. And until we understand the impact of school closures, I'm asking that the council please issue a request for a moratorium on any further school closures in accordance with the provisions of the mayoral takeover law. Okay. Well, thank you very much. appreciate your testimony. All right. We'll now hear from Mr. Martell, Susan Haight, Debbie Smith-Steiner, Jeff Sinks, Uh, Dana Miller, Uh, Vanessa Bartelli, Ms. Ms. Haight, please. Good morning, or actually good good afternoon now. Uh, My name is Susan Haight and I'm a resident of Ward 2. 
I'm President of the Federation of Friends of the D.C. Public Library, and I'm here at the request of the Federation. Our membership is made up of various Friends of the Library groups throughout the district. We believe your role in providing oversight through the Committee of Education on the operations of the District of, the, of Columbia Public Schools is one of the most important, if not the most important, role on the Council. You're charged with guiding the future of all those devoted to improving education in the District of Columbia, and that is no small task. I may be an unusual witness because I'm not a teacher, I'm not a school official, nor a parent of children enrolled in the public schools. But I and our membership feel that we are stakeholders in education because we are ardent advocates to improve our public library system and for lifelong learning. The Friends of the Library have, on more than one occasion, uh, or on numerous occasions, given books to neighborhood schools for classrooms and library use. We've donated money to buy books related to specific school curriculums and donated prizes for various school competitions. We sponsor and buy books for DC Reads, which is a month-long read-in that enables all district residents to read and discuss the same book. The, the Federation, over three years, has contributed $84,000 to fund the DCPL Summer Reading Program, which mitigates the loss of reading skills during a child's summer reading vacation. So there are many ways that the library and its friends support the schools and education as a whole, but mainly we fill the gaps. Given this, we think that there are missed opportunities. At the beginning of the school year, the librarians reach out to the neighborhood schools and offer to conduct library orientation and instruct instructions on how to use their online services. They hand out library card applications and aspire to become readily available resources to students and their parents. Yet this outreach seems to depend on the relationship between the principals and the branch library. Those schools that may not need this service take advantage of it, while the schools that do need it do not. Many students have an iPhone, but they have no idea how to use a computer, or no, and the libraries can help bridge this technology gap. We recommend that library orientations be standardized throughout both systems. At the beginning of the school year, all students and their parents should be taught how and when to use the library. The library provides a safe, structured environment for students after school. Many students are at risk, and the library provides an environment where students can study and use resources that are not currently provided by the school. We recommend that after school and environment use of the and evening use of the libraries be promoted and that the facilities be open to accommodate this need or gap. We recommend that the library <coughs> programs and school systems be better coordinated. Neither system is taking advantage of what the other has to offer. Closer coordination would benefit all those concerned. As I stated at the beginning, the friends of our stakeholders in excellent education, and we take these suggestions, and we make these suggestions in an effort to better our schools and the library system. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Haight. Um, Mr. Sanks. <clears throat> the day we heard our school was not going to be closured, everyone, everyone remembers how cold it was back then. We immediately set to work on weekends and late night meetings, canvassing the neighborhood, proselytizing, drumming up support for the school, exactly as DCPS had asked us to do. We then went to follow up with DCPS about what our community told us would get them to enroll their kids in the school. DCPS responded with this email, sent solely to clarify that during the closure process they had promised our children nothing, that during the closure process nothing we had done had kept the school open, and that we should wait until DCPS gives information to our principal who will give the information to us. This was sent from the Chief of the Office of Family and Public Engagement. Number one, if we're supposed to stay quiet until DCPS tells our principal something and the principal tells us, why do we need an Office of Family and Public Engagement? Number two, Councilman Catania, during the closure process, you stated we need to figure out why parents are choosing to go to charter schools over public schools. Here's why. Charter school parents would never get this email. When a community needs something, central office should respond by saying, we are going to fight for it. We're going to try to get it. In the email, it says, we ask for things for which there is no money. Here's something that's free. Advocacy. Fight for us. And if you can't get what we need, the response should not be a terse, condescending email. It should come with regret and an alternative plan for improving the education of our children. On next Friday, they're going to come in here and they're going to talk about website feedback and millennial plans and capital improvement. It's well-intentioned, but it sounds like gibberish. It feels like macro-level politispeak. We fear they're going to drop another bunch of goals and proposals from up high on the school. I have enormous respect for DCPS. They work hard, and I work hard to support them. But the communities know what they need. Our school has not been modernized since the 60s. We need a field that doesn't have gravel-filled sinkholes. 
We're under-enrolled. We need language classes because that's what our community said they want. Dual language and immersion schools have bloated wait lists. It costs money. Let's raise it. If they're not going to work for us, at least work with us. Be a partner, not an overlord. Council members, if you want to know why parents are choosing charters over DCPS, hear the frustration in our voices. At best, DCPS has a major image problem. At worst, the central office is in complete denial. The sad fact that needs to sink in is this. If there were enough seats in charter schools, almost every parent not in Ward 3 or 4 would have their child in one. And while it may not be the specific content, the reason for the demise of DCPS is the spirit of what is in this email. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Sinks. Ms. Miller? Hi, yes. I'm a parent of a student at Garrison Elementary. During the school closure public hearings, the question, what can we do to keep and attract parents at our schools, was repeatedly asked. This question should be the prime objective and measurement for the Chancellor and her team today. How effective is DCPS, not including the charter schools, in growing its enrollment? In my opinion and experience, the main reason for dropping the dropping enrollment is that DCPS central office does not effectively partner with the parents or the community. In fact, it is often tempted in dealing with either. I say this as because a member of a PTA that has repeatedly reached out with firm plans to increase and retain enrollment, the Chancellor and her team responds either inadequately or often won't even meet to discuss the proposal. For example, there are two things that Garrison needs to do to be competitive with the area charters. One is to have an updated facility, and two is to implement a Spanish language immersion program. Both of these recommendations came from interviewing 150 current and prospective parents and doing a competitive analysis of what other what charter schools have and which charter schools have the longest wait list. Additionally, prior to even requesting to meet with the chancellor and her team, the Garrison PTA wanted to bring a lot to the table. The PTA worked to get approximately $1.5 million in cash and pro bono services toward building and filling, filled improvements. Currently, the school is not slated to get its first phase of modernization until 2015. This phase only addresses interior space. As for the language program, our team has done an incredible amount of research on how to effectively and economically implement a program that is best suited for the students. The amazing part is that since DCPS has already committed to adding preschool classes to Garrison and the tools in the mind curriculum is already translated into Spanish, there is little to no cost to implement this program now. How can a school hope to gain and retain students when the exterior looks like a jail and the pro programming does not meet the community's needs? Yet when we try to engage DCPS central office, we are told, one, we should be just happy that the school is open. Two, quit asking for things that cost money. Three, there is nothing they can do about the facilities since that work is done by the Office of Public and Education Facilities Modernization. And four, central office has other priorities for Garrison, all of which are also being addressed by the school's administration and PTA. In addition, we are told by the Chief Parent and Community Engagement Officer to stop contacting them and then please see attached the email and work only with our principal. The DCPS central office should join the rest of the business world and local charter schools in leveraging the heavy users to make a better product, become brand advocates, and to staff the help desk. And to be honest, without these two improvements done immediately to Garrison, there is little doubt that Garrison will, will be on another school closure list in three years. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bertelli? Hello. My name is Vanessa Bertelli, and I'm a proud parent of a child at Garrison Elementary and a child at Washington Yu Ying. I'm also the chair of the Garrison Improvement Project Committee. This uh, testimony is about DCPS's failure to seize, to seize the strategic opportunity presented at this time and about how dual language programs are the key to DCPS's renaissance. Mundo Verde has 900 families on its wait list. Washington Yiying has a good 500. What do they have in common language immersion, of course, or a dual language program as DCPS refers to it? Even within DCPS, its eight dual language schools are success stories with long waiting lists. The huge demand spans across the whole of the DC demographic spectrum, from parents in the higher echelons of, DP, of DCPS itself to immigrant parents who know firsthand the value of speaking other languages. At Garrison, 
an ethnically diverse Title I school with 21% special needs students, 96% of parents are supportive of adding a dual language strand. This huge demand is one of the reasons dual language programs have almost 100% retention rates, and by this I don't mean retaining students to an earlier grade, but I mean them not leaving the school. While every other DCPS is hemorrhaging children to charters, dual language DCPSs are almost impervious to retention issues. So why is DCPS not jumping at the opportunity to capture these students by filling the gap between demand and offer? As my friends mentioned, we've done a lot of research on this, and you'll find it in the dual language presentation uh, attached to this presentation, which was also presented to Chancellor Henderson earlier this month. It is not cost. Immersion programs are by far the cheapest language program available. Um, you just hire a partner language teacher, um, for example, a Spanish language teacher instead of an English language teacher. There's no additional budgetary allocations given to uh, schools that have uh, language immersion schools, um, programs. And uh, last year, the cost of materials for eight DCPS schools with, which have dual language programs was $50,000. That's $6,000 per school. It's a total drop in the ocean. It is not lack of resources. DCPS already runs these programs. It already has all of the teacher training, all of the materials that comply with DCPS curriculum. It is not because these programs are inadequate or, inefficient or ineffective. DCPS itself on its website said that, says that the best, they're the best for our children. It is not because their other language programs are better or less expensive. They're not. It's not staffing issues, and you can refer to our presentation. And uh, it is not uh, issues of cohesion in a school with two strands. Uh, there are massive positive externalities between two strands that can be leveraged upon. The reason is that DCPS is still trying to figure out what to do with graduating fifth graders from its existing dual language programs. How crazy is that? This is the lack of strategic thinking that I really have an issue with. So you don't know what to do with this issue, so let's stop doing what it is that we were doing that was extremely successful because it creates a problem. So why not solve? We have a lack of. Ms. Bertelli, your, your time has expired. So if you could please uh, complete that thought, and I'm going to have to go to questions from members of the committee. Yes, we need to capitalize on district demographics and contest, and uh, DCPS can add dual language programs. Uh, it can do it in. It can do it with the help of charters that are willing to share this, their knowledge. Thank you. Uh, we've been joined by a member of the committee, um, Mr. Grasso. I'll give you a three-minute opening statement, and I'll go to you on the first round of questions of three minutes. So please give Mr. Grasso six minutes. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chairman Catania. Um, sorry that I haven't been able to be here all day. I did have a conflicting hearing that I was at on, uh, down over uh, oversight of D.C. water, uh, which I think is also a very important issue right now. Um, but fortunately, I'm able to be here for a bit um, and hear what you guys have to say and say thank you for coming down. I have had a staff member here all day who will brief me on exactly what everyone's issues are. Um, you know, the more that we can get parents and uh, activists engaged in this process and engaged in the reform effort with ideas around dual language and other issues is extremely important. It will make our whole system thrive and, and become a really world-class system. Um, and I'm just hopeful that we can uh, continue to encourage and support DCPS and the charter system and OSSEE and others to embrace the engagement of parents and, and, and embrace the engagement of, of you know, members of our community who want to be involved because that's how we're going to move it forward um, and, and that's really important. So um, I'm going to be here to listen and learn and I appreciate you holding this hearing and, uh, and, and next week as well I look forward to the hearing with the, uh, with the agencies. Thank you very much Mr. Grasso. Um, Ms. Haight, I, I want to thank you for the work that the Federation of the Friends of D.C. Public Libraries, uh, the, the, not only the resources that you bring to the public schools, but you know your willingness to every day work on behalf of the public libraries. And so since our, our last meeting, I've had uh, a number of conversations with the Chancellor and with, uh, with individual principals in schools about how we can knit together our public library system with our public schools. And so, you know, the, the issue is, uh, you know, is obviously always one of investment. We have a, you know, 100 plus now traditional schools. We have many charter schools with underwhelming uh, libraries as well. But as you helped educate me, we've got a pretty robust library that's available from the, 
an, an online library. So if we were able to get the, the children access to Kindles or, or other opportunities for electronic devices that could help, uh, that might be uh, an intervening step. And frankly, you know, technology is the way in which they interact perhaps more than traditional books. So I'm, I'm going to look forward to, I'm looking forward to exploring with you how we might partner not only DCPS but our charters uh, with that online capability that the DC public libraries have. I know you've been interested in technology yourself. And we have recently gone through uh, a nice surplus. Uh, and so, you know, I'm focused on how we might make, uh, you know, targeted one-time investments with that that are sensible as opposed to kind of reoccurring costs. And technology fits uh, in a netherland. You know, it's not traditional capital of bricks and mortar where we borrow for 30 years, and it's also not something that fits neatly into an annual operating budget because they require one-time large expenditures and may have a couple of three to four years. So, you know, I'd like if you wouldn't mind to think about how we can, you know, knit together uh, this online opportunity for our kids with D.C. public libraries online opportunities. Uh, and, and which platform, you know, you think makes the most sense, if it would be the Kindle, if it would be the iPad, the large, the mini, um, or an alternative form of technology to give kids access to books which we are currently paying for. Do you have any thoughts on that? Do you like to share with us before I well, go on to the other witnesses? Um, I do know that um, at uh, Timley, the Timley Friends and the librarian there, she, they take, I'm not a techie, but they, I think they take the Kindle and they go to the different schools and they download things at the schools uh, and they go to, to different um, areas of the district that do that and so I think that's important to sort of have that, that crossover. Um, that's something that is going on now as I understand. Well, I know that you know I've seen um, you know when, when we tour schools invariably we'll tour the library as well and so we get just because of the personal curiosity of mine to see how robust the library is and it's often underwhelming I mean the librarians are doing or the librarian aides in the case of non full-time librarian are doing uh, the best that they can but you know simple stuff um, but libraries are fairly labor-intensive keeping the books in order and alphabetized and so on and, and keeping track of them it's, it's it can take a little effort there's something simplistic about technology and the ability of the child to access what they want and have it available in multiple copies as opposed to one copy in a library. And so uh, it's certainly on the committee's wish list to see how we might not only use them for library purposes, um, but also textbook purposes. And if, you, if anyone has seen these online textbooks as opposed to the traditional ones which, which many of us grew up with, which were just hard copy, these, um, these electronic textbooks give you the option to learn lessons within lessons within lessons and video and, and, and audio. Uh, they're fascinating and they're much more interesting. And considering this is how young people you know, prefer to spend their time on video games and this is the way they're learning, it seems to me it's worth, uh, it's worth costing out because in some respects it might be cheaper than actually purchasing these hard copy books in terms of textbooks. So it's incorporating technology into textbooks, into library options. Uh, of course we have an issue of safety. Um, having children go home with them could be a problem. And I, I've seen in some of our charter schools that they actually leave these books, leave, the, leave their electronic devices at schools for those safety reasons, but they have longer school days where the kids can access them and so on. So, you know, and in any event, there, there are um, you know, a, a number of uh, ways which we can explore um, the use of technology to help access libraries. But I want to thank you for being here. Uh, Mr. Sinks, I'm reading the email that, uh, what, that you found offensive. And, you know, I, I understand that, you know, you would want to meet with the chancellor to discuss your proposal and that uh, the head of the Office of Family and Public Engagement declined that. But I want to read some of it on the record. She, and she says, to be clear, we did not make any commitment to implement a dual language program or to move Garrison up on the phased modernization schedule as your proposal and public statements have proffered. And so let's just go through it. Did, did you receive a commitment from DCPS for additional resources and did DCPS uh, make a commitment to move Garrison up on the list of modernization or are these requests that the community has asked for and not received? the response that you would like? Well, for one thing, they asked us to get, we put together a support list of people, the community supporting the school. They said get us enrollment forms, which, again, it's just not how you interact with people. Don't give us, you know, petitions, give us enrollment forms. We can't, if we could produce 500 enrollment forms like they asked, we would do it. But, Mr. Sanks, here's the thing. I'm going to okay. ask you to, 
I understand this is something that you are very passionate about, Sorry, and yeah. as are the parents. But you know, I'm going to um, I'm going to encourage you maybe to modify your approach just a bit, because what I'm hearing is a lot of anger, and so what I and so I what is lost in the ang your message is being lost in the way in which it is being delivered. We're here to help and to serve you. So I understand you're frustrated, and I would be too. But what I'm just trying to get is, because the chancellor will be before us next week, what I want are, if you don't mind, let me ask these questions. You give me the answers to the best of your ability, and then we'll circle back to see how we can fulfill, you know, the wishes of the community, okay? So I just, I'm just trying to figure out whether or not they, they made a commitment. And we can stipulate that they did a lot of things that we, we don't like, and I want you to tell me what they are. But if we could just go one at a time here. Did they make a commitment to the dual language program or to move Garrison up on the modernization schedule? One sentence. No, but in the okay. email that preceded this, we never said that they did that. Okay. We simply said we wanted to discuss what our community had told us. All right, that's and, good. And I can follow up, and I'm sure Vanessa can too, because she actually sat, sat with the uh, chancellor. Um, it was left at the table when um, the, the team, the PTA said, look, if you're going to keep us open, this is what would work. This is how we can promise or work to achieve the enrollment okay. ni numbers desired. The chancellor said, let me think about it. Okay. So I want to... And so yeah, we were, we were uh, merely following up to say, we're excited to stay open. We want to move forward. We would like to sit down and discuss with you these two things we've discussed. Okay. And we are completely open to the chancellor saying, you know what, I have other ideas. I think there are better ways to do this. Well, but the Miller, fact we'll, we'll, at the we'll end of the day. We'll go through all of the grievances, okay? And okay. then you will stipulate that you have them. And I want to say you know, how thankful I am that we have parents like the three of you who feel so committed to public education and to your neighborhood school that you're willing to take time out of busy days and come down and write testimony and advocate not just today but for the last several months. So I mean that just should give a context for people viewing to understand why you know there's so much passion here. But let's let's go to the next issue and tell me why. And again, I I, I, I see the the merit in the bilingual program and the success that that will uh, potentially have or probably have in a drawing and retaining students. Mr. So, Catania, yes. may, may I respond to your question about was there a commitment yes, made? Yes, please. I was in that room when we presented to the Chancellor and the Chancellor looked me straight in the eye and said, are you saying that if we don't modernize the school and if we don't introduce a language program, we can close the school. We can happily go ahead and close the school. And I said yes, because otherwise Garrison is just going to be glorified daycare for parents who are on wait lists to get into charter schools that offer the programs that they're clamoring for. Mm -hmm. So on the basis of that, when we were left open, we sort of thought, and, and a commitment was never made, but we sort of thought that we had got the message across. So, no, a commitment was okay. never made. So, so, uh, and I'm asking staff to take notes because not only do we expect DCPS uh, to respond in their written testimony when they come before us, we incorporate concerns of the community in our questions to them. So there's a belt and suspenders, okay? Um, but I have, to, I have to have the information, my questions answered, so I know how to, right? So the next question is, um, this is again from Josephine uh, Bias Robinson. She said, when we announced the final consolidation and reorganization plan, we committed to add new early childhood and special education classrooms to Garrison to increase student enrollment in SY school year 2013-14. These additional classrooms, coupled with new, student enro new students enrolled in Garrison following the lottery, should put Garrison on path towards increased enrollment. Now, that, that may be true, adding especially pre-K. Um, uh, you know, that has been a real bonus. In fact, most of DC, or not all of DCPS's enrollment stabilization and modest increases have come through pre-K-3 and pre-K-4. So when, you know, when the executive talks about DCPS stabilizing and growing, it's because we've offered these fantastic pre-K-3 and pre-K-4. So let's be clear. People, the children, are still fleeing the K-12. through 12. We understand that, all right? Um, can you all tell me how many additional you know, how many additional students 
that 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 they are discussing or thinking about with the added early childhood and special education classrooms because there was the issue of garrison being under capacity and that was the justification it wasn't necessarily the quality of instructions it was simply capacity have you all had conversations do you know how many additional students these two adjustments should bring to the school yes. As per the lottery, as the numbers that the lottery show are that there will be one additional preschool pre-K class. Preschool pre-K sure. are going to be mixed classes. Okay. And so the that's other ten, additional... Yeah, that's 10 to 15 children. That's 15 children. Mm -hmm. The additional classroom comes from a special needs classroom that comes from a different school that is being closed. And how many would that be? I think it's... Probably less than that. Okay. I mean, the, the, if my recollection serves right, traditionally special as a 1 to 6 or 1 to 7 teacher to student and then pre-k is 1 to 10 1 to 15 so you, you let's just say maybe 20 additional students mm -hmm. and, and I apologize I did not bring with me the the capacity of the schools for today's hearing I show I, do you have that Ms. Bartelli tell me what is the capacity where are you now at Garrison so oh. now we're at 227 well actually it there's been five new students in the last okay. couple of months so two, 227 Okay. Roughly, Roughly, more than that. But, right. um, and what's the capacity of the school? The capacity of the school is, a, is an excellent question because the uh, master plan facility, uh, master facilities plan for 2010 talks about um, 365. Okay. Um, when the school all was... Right. So uh, I think you all were in the chamber earlier and we discussed, you know, how there was a, a lack of rationalization in my mind of how we've spent our, some of our school modernization money. We've built these large high schools. And again, I don't want anyone who's in any of these high schools to think that their children don't deserve new high schools. Of course, we, they do and we understand that. But it's about, you know, you're using our resources as, as restricted as they are as, as, as intelligently as possible. Um, and I, believe me, I've been in a number of schools that have not had the level one the modernization to know that when you walk in, these are not inviting places. And it, you, you have a headwind, you know, in the absence of the programming and in a deteriorating building, you know, and without the amenities, right, there is a headwind. And so, Mr. Sanks, I get it. I get it. You know, we, we, have to, we, have, we, we have to have the same sense of urgency across all of our schools to move up tier one and then ultimately beyond that. So, so we might have another 20 kids. So that would still leave you, you know, about 100 shy. Okay. So, um, Mr. Catania. Yes. May I just say that the, the building is currently fully at capacity because the Office of Bilingual Education is occupies ten, uh, sure. nine or ten uh, classrooms. And the building is not set up because it's such an old building. The classrooms, are, there's no office space. So it's just big classrooms. So when you have to provide Title I services and ELL services, as we have to because of our population, you need those spaces. And at the moment, all of the support staff, the, uh, the psychologists, the uh, social services, the uh, language support are sharing those spaces the best they can. Understood. The reality is that because there hasn't been a modernization, there are no classrooms. Well, again, this is very helpful. Uh, you know, to put on the record, and again, we're taking notes, and I just have a few more, and I'm going to ask uh, my colleague, if you don't mind, to, I'd like to pursue this a bit more. Do you have, do you have any additional questions, Mr. Rasso? Okay. Uh, if you do, just please let me know, and I'll interrupt, and we'll go to you, okay? So, the letter then proceeds with, um, while we understand and appreciate the drive towards improved quality and diversity of programmatic offerings, there are greater priorities to address the students currently enrolled at Garrison, including increasing achievement rates, increasing attendance rates and improving the school culture. Um, I know you have reactions. At this time, our efforts must be focused on addressing these priorities, uh, and we hope to, that you will join us in this work. Nonetheless, please understand that although an immersion program will not be an option, the idea of some foreign language instruction at Garrison next year is a possibility. So, you know, it is entirely um, I'm not sure how they would expend the resources differently unless they are going for additional um, reading capabilities for achievement issues or lower class size or longer school day on increasing attendance rates. I'm not sure how they would ex expend the money on that versus the immersion program. And it seems to me improving school culture would be um, improved by creating an environment where parents felt welcomed and listened to and where the programs reflected the will of the community. All right. So I, I really don't buy that, just as a person here. 
Um, nonetheless, I want to be fair to the schools, and, and this is what they said. Okay. So finally, uh, Ms. Robinson states, in the coming weeks, Dr. Alexander and other central office staff members will engage in direct conversations with Principal Hill of Garrison about more feasible language instruction options. As a school leader, he will then engage you and other members of the school community in conversations about these options and will meet the, that will both meet the needs, uh, I'm sorry, that will meet the needs of both currently enrolled and prospective students. So let's just uh, dwell on this for a minute. Have you, uh, have you been given a date as to when you can meet with Principal Hill uh, about these direct conversations? Well, we, we talk to Principal Hill all the time. He has not been giving a date that we know of, of okay. when we're going to be talking about this. Though. And I also don't want to draw the principal into, you know, conflict with the central administration. Well, yeah, as, you, as I'm that. sure you appreciate, you know, he ultimately works for central administration, and so the things have to, the things have uh, swim lanes here. Can I make um, one small, very quick comment about the frustration? I just feel that, that for me and for a lot of people here, there's a chasm between central office up here and the communities down here. And our principals are great, our teachers are great, our, our liaisons from DCPS are great. And then there, it feels like it could be totally misunderstood. There is just a wall of communication between all of that and the people who are actually making the decisions. I feel like it, it, maybe it's wrong. I think the city feels like it is a bloated bureaucracy that they can't get to. And you just don't have that in charter schools. That's, and that's, that's right. not my opinion. That's what I think the city thinks. Well, I think that's reality. I agree, I do too. I mean, I think I that's reality. And it's a function of bureaucracy. Charter schools don't have that bureaucracy. Therefore, you don't have kind of the intervening, you know, and, steps and, and approvals. Yes, and they, charter, charter schools could be terrible. They could be great. Whatever's going on, people in the city, clearly the numbers bear out. So let's they try to find, let's construct to the best way we can as a, a, a framework for going forward. All right. And so I'm going to ask that my staff assist uh, you and the community to have a meeting with Principal Hill. Um, and, and, and if we can obtain someone from central office. Now, we've had these proving what are, what, what's possible grants, which you all are familiar with. Um, I'm not sure if there's another cycle of those, if you could use those grants dollars for, you know, it, you may not get in the first year a perfect Spanish immersion class. But I think the trajectory, you know, especially for existing students, you might, there might be something to be said about ramping it up so that kids don't come to school with that expectation. Mr. Catania, you, you're exactly on point, and we do not even need those grants. Okay. Um, DCPS is adding early childhood classrooms anyhow. So instead of hiring an English-speaking teacher and aide, we would just be hiring through the program in, in uh, um, the attachment to question 42 that the DCPS talks about this visiting professor from Spain program. So there is no staffing issue. There is no additional cost. So then, then again, I, I really think that um, there is uh, an opportunity for a resolution that puts us but We'll on take a grant if you have a trajectory. <laughs> well, you know, and, and these are things which I've spoken with one of my colleagues about, the idea that, you know, these, these one-time dollars that, you know, you've got to be careful because you want to build stuff in that is sustainable. I, I worry about that, right? But, but um, you know, redirecting the school's focus and putting it on a two- or three-year plan, I'll be honest, I don't see, you know, I won't be supporting more school closures other than those that have had we've had um, yeah I, I think is it relates to DCPS we've had enough instability um, and so at least for the next two years I won't be supporting those in addition to, to that which we have on the table I might support something with our high schools some reconstitutions and some consolidations and you know leaving high schools for other for, for other um, high school options but I'm not looking to cut any more close any more elementary schools or supporting that. Of course, it's the Chancellor's decision. So why don't we see if we can put a meeting together between um, Dr. Alexander, Principal Hill, and uh, members of the community to see if we can come together on how we um, ramp up language instruction options next year, again, within existing resources. And, um, you know, we, we haven't had a chance to scrub the capital budget to see how these modernization dollars can be moved around. I'm, I'm hesitant to create a World War III by changing the current expectations of parents across the city. Because we have some uh, elementary schools without cafeterias, we have some without playgrounds, you know, so th that, that, is a, that is something that is an invitation to mischief. 
but on the dollars that we're already spending, we ought to be able to direct them in a way that reflects the community's wishes. So I'm going to ask my staff to do that, and we'll have a meeting with DCPS next um, Friday, and I would hope that by next Friday this meeting would be arranged, that it won't have taken place, but it will have been scheduled. All right? Okay. Well, again, I want to thank you uh, Can all. Can I <coughs> Yes. I'm sorry. It's just one last point about the feeder system. I know there will be a lot of discussions about feeders in, in, in the forthcoming months. And uh, one thing that comes to mind is that we, with these language immersions, in our cluster alone, we already have two schools, Mary Reed and Cleveland, which have dual language uh, programs. If we added another two schools, Garrison and Seaton, we would have an entire cluster that could feed into, whether it's Francis Stevens or Shaw, into what would be an enhanced language middle school. Mm -hmm. And DCPS can take its time to think about a high school and can follow the charters with the DC International High School uh, lead. Let them be the innovators. Just copy. Well, I, I think that we've had, uh, we've had um, interest on the part of a of two of our charter schools to share their capabilities, from what I understand, with DCPS. And so, you know, what we have, again, is to uh, get folks out of their silos and start accepting these uh, resources and these offers. It's to stop the Hatfields and McCoy between charters and DCPS, we can both learn from each other uh, and, 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 and sh share resources. So uh, anyway, thank you all. Well, I'm going to ask my staff to work with Dr. Alexander and with the principal. Thank you. Try to see if we can get this arranged, and we'll, um, we'll. Uh, who, which of the three of you would you prefer for us to uh, be the point of contact? Vanessa. Vanessa. Yeah, I'll point Vanessa. it towards you. <laughs> all right, Ms. Bertelli. Thank you all very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. All right, we now will hear from Terry Goins, James Proctor, Michael Sindrom, Chantel Thomas. Uh, um, Ms. Thomas, are you here with the, the, uh, the Young Women's Project, or are you here with the Women's Collaborative? The Women's Collective. Oh, Collective. I'm sorry. Okay, please come forward. Um, please raise your hand if you are on the witness list, but um, we've gone past. All right, Ms. Riley, just uh, Mr. Martell, just uh, going forward, I really do ask that people, you know, uh, obtain a copy of the witness list and do their best to be here. Uh, I, I actually told them I could not get here before this time, from the minute I testified. Well, Ms. Riley, then please, why don't you have a seat? Thank you. Mr. Martell? Okay, we're going to start with, uh, is it Mr. Proctor? No, uh, Mr. Syndrome. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. All those with the sound of my voice. Michael Syndrome, disabled veteran, served our country more than most. I've passed up, uh, Mr. Chair, not one, but two pieces of paper that purport to be a receipt. This is from Tacoma Education Campus. One is dated February the 6th, 2012. Unsigned, it's on stationery. It says, this letter is a receipt of book donations received from and it's a friend, of Washington, D.C. to Tacoma Education Campus. Actually, I delivered a donation uh, on behalf of a friend. April 9, 2012 letter is signed by the principal, Ricky Hunt Taylor. It reads as follows. This letter serves a receipt of book donations from Mr. Michael Syndrome, Washington, D.C., Tacoma Education Campus. Thank you again for supporting Tacoma. If you notice between the two, Mr. Chair, the latter document signed by the good principal reflects an incorrect date. And moreover, there's not even um, a skeleton outline of the books that were donated, if not by title, just a number. You know. And while I was there, I, I, it was like pulling teeth actually to get the initial piece of paper. And as I witnessed um, the staffers there uh, interact with the young children, I wouldn't want to be there. I wouldn't want to be there. This is something very simple, something very elementary. and. You know, we shouldn't be spending your staffer's time, the previous chair's time, committee of the whole. I mean, I've gone through, I would dare say, a half a million dollars worth of wages and staffers to get these two pieces of paper, which still are incorrect. The point is, Mr. Chair, and I applaud your efforts for bringing the education dysfunction to the forefront, if we can't get one simple issue of a donation from an outsider, how can we get anything else right? Right? In your words, the game of pretend, and so it goes. There was um, 
an interesting, insightful front page article in the Informer, Alternative School Reduces Truancy. And I'll pass it up in conclusion. The principal has stated, and I quote, we send the message that we want you at school and we need you to come back to school. If students miss so many days of school, we go and get them. I think that's a good idea, don't you, Mr. Chair? Also in the informer, same issue, save a life, become a mentor. We need to become involved in this. It takes more than a village, as has been said. In the um, New York Times, effects of bullying last into adulthood, study says. And not that I'm much not one on Freud, but he did say the child is father of the man. Those things that happened to us little on long ago and far away, they grow up with us, eh? And then um, in the Washington Sun, February 21st issue, Tavis Smiley to examine an educational system under arrest. Very insightful. I want to conclude with an upbeat note. And this appeared in USA Today Sports, February 20th. Talks about a young athlete who injured his knee. And it states here, and I quote, Marcus Lattimore shocked his world-renowned surgeon not only with an unprecedented speedy recovery from a complete knee rebuild, but with his first words after the complex surgery. The former South Carolina Star expressed two concerns to James Andrews on May 2nd after the two-and-a-half-hour sur uh, surgery to piece together the shredded ligaments of the running back's right knee. First, he wanted to know if Andrews was able to fix all of the damage, anterior cruciate, lateral collateral, and posterior cruciate ligaments. Mr. Sinder, I need you to, to wrap up because you're about a minute over schedule. Over Lattimore, schedule. Get in there, uh, Mr. Chair. Lattimore suffered six days earlier in the ninth game of his junior season. Andrews was. This is the clincher. Next, Lattimore wanted to get to work on his environmental science homework due online that night. He said, I've got to get my assignment in by midnight tonight, Andrews recalls. I was laughing. I've never had an athlete wake up from major knee surgery and worry about the classroom. That tells you something about the kid, right? Again, Mr. Chair, where you're wanted, welcomed, you attend. When it's not, that's why we have the truancy problem. Thank you, Mr. Sender. Uh, Ms. Thomas. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. How are you? Good afternoon. I'm good. Thank you for having me today. Um, my name is Chantel Thomas, and I'm a youth program associate at the Women's Collective here in Washington, D.C. Um, I'm honored to be here before you today. As a sexual and reproductive health educator, one of the major items I've been tasked with is to educate a population which demographics show is suffering from high rates of sexually transmitted infections, lack of general knowledge regarding reproductive health, according to the CDC, account for nearly 40% of persons infected with HIV. This population is the youth, ages 14 to 25, the stats speak for themselves. We all know that D.C. has one of the highest rates of HIV and other sexually transmitted infections in the country. According to the CDC, youth account for one in four new infections. Especially alarming, 60% of youth who are HIV positive do not know their status. Where's the breakdown? We all know that education starts in the home, but what happens when many of the youth within D.C public school system reside in homes where parents and guardians lack the necessary skills to educate their children. It becomes the responsibility of the education system to provide a comprehensive sexual, educa sexual health education curriculum. As a sexual health educator working in six DC public schools to date, we have encountered classrooms in which sexual health content is being taught from textbooks dating back to 15 years ago. Classrooms were grades 9th through 12th, ESL learners and students with learning disabilities were all giving the same material with non-differentiation. We observed black and white photos and hand-drawn photos of the reproductive health system in an age where technology is at many students' disposal. We hear from students themselves who want to be educated, truly educated regarding their sexual health, but they're failed by the DC public school system because of a lack of comprehensive curriculum, even though sexual and reproductive health now appears on DC public school standardized tests. We come to you today asking, where do we go from here? We understand that Aussie is currently reviewing curriculums, but what do we do now? As CBOs with a limited budget, there's only so much we can do and so many schools that we can reach to provide supplemental information. Must the rates continue to rise before something is done? I thank you for your time, and I hope that together we can foster some sort of partnership that will benefit our youth today in D.C. public schools. Uh, thank you, Ms. Thomas. Ms. Riley. <clears throat> thank you. Um, my name is Kathy Riley, and I'm the Executive Director of the Senior High Alliance of Parents, Principals, and Educators. Many of our comprehensive high schools are facing declining enrollments and declining budgets. 
It will take investment and vision on the part of our citizens and DCPS to ensure that DC can continue to have a system of publicly owned high schools across the city. I really believe we'll forever regret squandering this opportunity. This, right now we're on a path of potentially losing more of these high schools. It's time to be moved beyond the analysis that changing personnel or putting the high schools, schools in private hands is the answer. People across the city in the community meetings continually say this is important to them. They want neighborhood schools. They want to maintain these places that have this historical significance. But what we have not had is a real vision of how to move this forward. The, you know, the common core impact, uh, the test scores, they are not a program. They are not something that inspires people to think this is worthy of the capital investment and the history of these institutions. You know, just as I came in, I heard the people from Garrison talking about foreign language. I've been to a number of meetings where people say they want the opportunities for foreign language, for bilingual education, for uh, global opportunities at the high school level. We have to make that happen. We haven't really addressed program in the high, school, high schools, in the comprehensive high schools, and the richness that we could do. Same thing with arts integration. You have some really potentially alive and thriving things happening at the elementary school, they want to know that they're going to happen at the secondary level within DCPS. Even people in the charter schools that are starting out with that rich programming feel willing to go to DCPS that might be closer in their neighborhood, but the programs are not available. The second thing I want to address is the funding. Last year, the high schools were cut substantially. You know, they were, the pupil-teacher ratio was raised, and, the, uh, and they didn't count the planning periods. So I would ask that the council at least restore this basic thing. You fund the high schools at a higher rate, understanding their complexity and that they have to make up what happened with the kids. The charters pass on that higher rate. The DC public schools get the lowest rate, the high schools, the secondary schools. The Proving What's Possible grant, you know, a one-year quick turnaround impetus we actually need long-term, thoughtful interjections of capital to make things happen. So, you know, that works as a planning grant. That moves, works that way. But $10 million and then cutting the basic funds, people had to restore what they lost to just maintain a program. So I'd like to do something different there. And finally, planning. We haven't started the boundary feeder pattern plan yet. We need, you know, and I was heartened to say that you won't, support more closings, but I think we actually have to support a quality beginning. The people that are dedicated to DCPS at the beginning, they can't see the trajectory right now if we keep closing schools and we don't invest in the program and in that stability. So I think we need a, you know, I understand, you know, I think the boundary feeder pattern process Ms. is Ryan, really important. Just, I got uh, it. That's it. That I'm point. sorry. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Martell. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Eric Martell, retired DCPS high school social studies teacher. Um, in your words, Ms. Catania, DCPS is approaching a point of no return as students move to charter schools. Um, and DCPS is more to blame for that than the charter schools as because of their failure to make schools, at all the schools, particularly schools where there have been problems, to be safe. Uh, orderly and welcoming and provide the necessary academic uh, programs that students, particularly students with uh, deficits, need to have, and not necessarily even uh, special education deficits. Um, each year the Chancellor sows a new whirlwind of chaos that any objective observer would criticize as irrational and destructive. Arbitrary changes to the staffing plan, school closures, bizarre mergers, secret arrangements with a network of foundations whose concern for poor urban school children is just automatically accepted as, uh, for good coin. What kind of a plan would merge two totally different special education schools like Sharp Health and Mamie D. Lee in a school that isn't prepared to receive them, that has to be completely um, retrofitted? Um, same thing with the plan to merge School Without Walls and uh, uh, Francis Stevens. It, it, it makes absolutely no sense. Uh, it's just something that's sort of thrown in there. But I want to tell you about something I just learned about, and that is, uh, teachers have informed me that the next 
um, PIAA, that's the PACE uh, uh, Interim Assessment, is now being, the, the test that the students are going to take on March 27th has been released to the teachers in advance for across the grades in math. I don't think it's in reading, okay? Now, that's not the DC CAS. That's the interim assessment. There are five now that they use. Used to be the DC BAS, now it's this PIAA. Um, that's a violation of the standards uh, that DC OSSE has posted for test security, which read in part um, ethical testing practices, including pre-test activities and instruction, are paramount for making inferences about student ability and instructional quality. And I have, and my informers, the teachers who told me, said that principals are being pressured to actual to actually have the students receive the test questions that are on the test, even though the instructions that have been posted on the portal say that they should not be giving those. Um, and this is unbelievable. Um, something must be going on. I mean, why would one want to game a um, essentially a, an interim assessment, a practice test for the DC CAS? I suspect that they may want to use that to sort of prove something in the next few weeks. Thank you, Mr. Martel. Well, let's start uh, with where, where we left uh, off here. And I'll ask the uh, staff to put three minute rounds. Mr. Uh, Grasso, you, do you have questions? I'm going to go first to my colleague, Mr. Grasso. Mr. Grasso. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, you know, um, Ms. Thomas, thanks for coming down. I really uh, think that what you're adding to our system is very important. Thank you, sir. Um, I wonder, you talk about a comprehensive curriculum for um, sexual education. Can you talk about that some more? Do you have one that's already built and set up that you're implementing in the schools yes. that you're in now? Um, myself, along with several other CBOs in the area, um, have went in and we've aligned a curriculum according to the DC Public School Health Content Standards that's more up to date and more appealing to the students. Um, we go into the schools and we co-teach, so to speak, with the health teachers, but um, sometimes we're kind of met with resistance and we don't have enough time. Um, and several schools are opposed to us actually coming in. Um, the material that we have to work with, because we're on a limited budget, isn't always at our disposal. And um, that's about yeah, it. I, you know, I think there's something that we need to do to to bring this to the forefront of the discussion when it yes. comes to providing the right up-to-date materials. You know, um, HIV infection in our city is still at a crisis level, especially in these younger groups that you're talking about. Um, I just had a meeting yesterday about this with a doctor in town who says between 18 and 30 years old, uh, young men are, are infected over and over, and it's just really frustrating. Uh, education around this issue is key in the schools, in the classrooms, and we should do it at the, the highest level possible. This goes to your issue, Ms. Riley. And I, and I, you know, where's the vision? And I think that's the question you're asking. I think it's a really important question and one that this committee is starting to dig into and trying to understand where, where it comes from and where it is. Uh, visiting the schools as we've been doing, um, if anything, reveals to us that it's a scattered approach, that you have some success here and there, you have less success in some places, more success in other places, but there, there's no really explained or, you know, talked about vision across the city. I met with a group yesterday that talks about um, the, a study that was done in Chicago that talks about five different pillars of what it takes to do education reform, you know, whatever. But the reality is, is that where is any vision, where are any pillars, where are any kind of priorities? And when I talk, I, it's something we can buy into as a community if we can see what our principles are and the priorities around this. And, um, you know, whether it be a better curriculum, like for example with Ms. Tom, or um, teacher engagement, or teacher training, or community engagement. But I, when I think when you mean vision, you're really talking about something bigger. And you know, I mean, we we when we're doing this capital investment, we really could envision what we want to see across the city in terms of the program at the different schools. And we have these people are working very hard. I know we wanted to undermine that, but I think in terms of where the career tech programs are. This is what people can envision themselves going there then. They can see what they're going to get. Right. And it's beyond college and career ready. So I think people have tried to establish some basics. But there, some of these schools are working under incredible challenges. So when you're visiting, I think you're just getting a snapshot. Of course. I don't, I don't doubt that. But I'm also, 
I mean, I hear what you're saying that you know in this regard, and I, you know, I, I also want to touch on your high school side, of, you know, your, the discussion around high school because, um, you know, we've invested a lot of money in the high schools, and we've invested a lot of money not in every high school, but you mm. know, kind of across yeah. the city. Not work for um, and, and not I'm wondering, right. you know, well, I, I guess I'm just wondering where how we're prioritizing that and how we're prioritizing in connection with the feeder system. Um, and then, you know, the question I think the Chancellor raised once about, you know, feeder in elementary and middle and then maybe more magnet schools at the high school. But what are your thoughts it? on that? Yeah, I don't think that's a good idea. We have a lot of choice at the high school level. What, what we have now is the kids that don't have, we have a place of right. And we had an opportunity with the feeder patterns where people want. One of the reasons people say to me they're choosing the charter schools is they know they're going to be able to be there from pre-K through 12. And we're squandering that. I think if people knew where they could be and what they could invest, okay. and we could build on that, then we would have what, what they were built for and some of the advantages they hold. It, it is like a micro-democracy when it works right. But we haven't gone that route with the vision. We keep peeling kids off and saying, you know, you can go here if you're better at this or better at that. But why not build something that the people at Garrison can say, we can go all the way up. The people in Ward 4 that are now, why not have Powell, Barnard, Truesdale, and West be part of the planning of what happens at Roosevelt? Why aren't they front and center? We don't have that system now. We have a very siloed system, as you said, where DGS builds the school, and the program doesn't really get, like there's Cardozo now trying to figure out the program. So we have too many silos. It really has potentially, the money could make a much bigger bang. And also, for example, uh, uh, the over-enrollment in, in Ward 3 is, is, is incredible. I mean, the principal at Wilson High School just got an additional, is way over um, capacity and got an additional, you know, expansion for no, only 20 students. But still, while we're closing schools, you know, in Wards 5, 7, and 8, the, you know, there are kids on dem demountables, temporary. Thank you. It, it doesn't make sense. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Grasso, uh, you'll have an opportunity for a second round if you if you want. Okay, um, Mr. Um, Mr. Syndrome, I've been told that the document that you've circulated, uh, you know, is adequate. That we have a letter from OTR that suggests that the letter that you have been given, that is dated within the tax year at issue, uh, is uh, perfectly acceptable to OTR. Uh, it isn't in that they do not need an itemization. Uh, it is up to you to place a value uh, on this particular uh, charitable contribution. And should you ever be, or your whomever gave you the gift, whom, if they are ever audited, it would naturally be for them to substantiate why they came to that number. But DCPS is not in a position to, on its own, value what a particular gift is worth. So the point is, OTR, we have a letter from OTR that suggests the letter that you have is both adequate as it relates to date and does not need to be itemized. Mr. Chair, let's cut the chase. You know, we can be hyper-technical. We're talking about a disabled veteran that's gone to one of our schools to make a donation. And it, the initial letter of February 6th is not even signed. I had to push the envelope. It was like pulling teeth to get this piece of paper. The lady says, well, I don't handle this. You'll have to come back, and on and on and on, call security. That ought I, not be, I, Mr. Mr. Chair. Mr. Senator, I understand, but here we, we have what appears to be. You've asked for a resolution, and so we assisted in getting you a letter that's in the tax year that is uh, uh, at issue. We have a guidance from an Office of uh, Tax and Revenue Employee a, an opinion letter that sa suggests that what you have is sufficient. And so, you know, we, we don't, you know, uh, you necessarily need to have a, a Warren Commission on why you didn't get it up front. You have what you need now, and, and going forward, um, you know, I, I think we, uh, we've all learned from this process. Now, what else is it that you are looking for? With all due respect. Well, Mr. Syndrome, you have a letter that satisfies. I have two letters. letters. Okay, but satisfies what OTR expects for a charitable contribution. What else would you like from, uh, from, from DCPS at this point? With, with all due respect, Mr. Chair, have you ever made a donation? I've made donations to many places. No. And when I go in, for instance, the Coalition Creative Nonviolence, CCNV, they have a pre-typed pre form. You fill in your name, your address, the date, 
what is the items, the approximate value. Now, I understand maybe the school system, you know, is not equipped to do that. That's right. But, but by the same token, if you want community input, if you want community contribution, if you want donations, set yourself for of a kind. Now, you asked me a question, what would I like? Mr. Compare and contrast, if I may finish. Well, what is it that Co you would like? Please. Thank you. If you look and compare and contrast February 6th to April 9th, right, the latter is signed, great, but it doesn't contain the correct date of the donation. And you've indicated from Office of Tax and Revenue it's sufficient. Separate and apart, when you're audited or when you submit for exemptions tax, they would like to at least know from, from the recipient what it is that was given. Because, let's face it, tax fraud is abundant. Not saying that you know, anyone's going to commit it, but it would be prudent and behoove on either of these to say we received six books or seven books and maybe a title or two. I mean, we're talking about a school. Mr. Syndrome, it, it, it says receipt of book donations. It's on the, the giver. And how many, how much, the number, sir? What, on, what's the it's quantity? On the, it's on the giver to substantiate here. So they haven't done that. Mr. So you asked me what I would Mr. like. Syndrome, do you really, I'm going to ask you this, do you really believe that this is the most pressing issue facing public education in the District of Columbia and that it should consume this committee's attention when we have already made sure you've gotten the letter you wanted, dated appropriately, that ha and separate... Dated appropriately? No, separate, sir. Separate no, sir. It is not dated appropriately. Mr. Syndrome, separate correspondence from the Office of Tax and Revenue substantiating that this is a lawful document. Now, what more do you want from this committee before I can go on to my next questions? You know, please don't belittle me and patronize me. I've come up, I, I'm not paid for a part-time gig, 125000 with Sindrom. prime real estate and staffers. Now, you asked me Mr. a question. Sindrom, we're going to end this round now. Thank you. I'm going on to the next question. You didn't let me answer the question, Mr. sir. Sindrom, I, I've got Obviously, the, you don't I, want the answer. Mr. Syndrome, I've gotten the answer. Um, Mr. Martell. The gist of your testimony is what? That what should we be doing? Because I don't hear you being entirely complimentary of DCPS, um, yet you claim that we are at a tipping point. What is your recommendation for this committee? Well, okay, specifically with, uh, with the budget coming up, um, number one, there should be no chartering authority given to the chancellor. I know she has requested it. I don't know if it's actually being seriously considered because and uh, as far as autonomy, there is existing authority for autonomy within the context of DCPS. Um, secondly, um, the monies that, that are in the present uh, FY13 budget should not be uh, included in the FY14 budget for the whole accessing process and for teacher bonuses. And there's a very simple way to address that, and that is through evidence. What is the evidence that there is any correlation between these activities, uh, these, these expenses, expenditures, and student improvement? And uh, well, Mr. Martell, if I might interrupt, we, we, we can't at this point because the finances are uh, are not in order. We don't know what money is actually going to which school uh, in any, uh, deg with any degree of certainty. We can see that there's a per pupil formula. That we can see. But as you know, there's an entire budget called other support that's in excess of 120 million as it relates to DCPS. And what we're trying to do is to, to, to parse that money so that we can follow it through the system and see you know, what we're spending for it and whether or not we're getting what we think we're getting. And right now we can't do that. And that's a problem. Is that because of, because of the way the budget that's is? That's right. Uh, so, so, okay. So to, I mean, it's the way in which for, again, you know, we, have, we have had challenging budgets. You know, I thought we had challenging budgets within healthcare finance, uh, within the Department of Health and the Department of, of Mental Health, which had the Department of Mental Health for many years, you know, was under a receiver and the court orders and the Dixon, and so we had various accounting systems and independence. Uh, and you know, at the end of the day, any system that knows that it will be funded for its inefficiencies never gets efficient. And I'll use mental health as an example. Mental health was heavily reliant on Medicaid, but we did a lousy job of actually putting the infrastructure in place to bill for Medicaid. So every year, you know, we would submit a bunch of money with a, for a bunch of claims. Paperwork wouldn't be right. 
And I thought that issue was addressed several years ago. Mr. Martel, uh, I'm yeah. making a point. I mean, I, I'm just wondering. No, you know. make, just bear with me. So we had a system that, you know, we, and, and the point is we had a system where they didn't bill for Medicaid, they didn't know how, they put in claims that were, you know, incomplete, uh, and no one really cared at the end of the day because whatever was kicked back from the federal government where we would have to pay the feds back, and we did, we would paper over that. If we just didn't fill the paperwork, local money papered that. And so you had a system where where poor financial, poor financial infrastructure was never, uh, there were never any consequences because we just every year would have more money than we thought uh, through these, because we, we under project revenue and we would just paper over it. You know, and what I learned through DMH, Departmental Health, Healthcare Finance, and Department of Health is that, you know, that kind of sloppy bookkeeping translates into sloppy services. There's just no accountability. It's a culture, right? And what I see is something very similar within DCPS. Uh, and this is not, again, a criticism of the chancellor. It is in part a criticism uh, because this is, there are some slight differences. You know, uh, the finances from DCPS are handled by the, the chief financial officer. And we've had, you know, less than stellar CFOs in our schools in the past. And what we've also learned is that the, 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 the numbers that are given to the council and included in our budget book are not the same that the DCPS operates under. You follow me? So we have budgets that we pass and have since I've been here where the buckets don't correspond to their spending. And so what, what my staff is working on now is to, is to look through our SOAR system, our accounting system, to, because there actually is pretty good data. It just doesn't get placed where it should be. Right? And so you really need almost a roadmap to, to crosswalk the systems. And that's why there's a kind of a cottage industry associated with how do you find out what went where. And some of the things we're able to find out, and this segues into Ms. Riley, is that we have some of our high schools that, you know, while we claim they are underfunded, are not spending considerable portions of their budget. And some that overspend. And so you know, if you don't know what money you have as the principal and you can't have a system that connects you with the money where you can follow it on a regular basis, how do you how do you plan? But when you hire, you you think you're hiring to what you were told you could do. So that that's Ms. Riley, we're not we're not th th again. This is not about blaming any. No, no, I agree. This I don't want to blame either. A system that where the money isn't straight and people are operating under myth and under conjecture and under you know good faith, but you know this kind of haphazard system, you just can't build systemic programs from one year to the next if you don't know. And if you find out halfway through the school year that, well, you don't have this money or that you have more, I know. It's, I it's agree, Mr. six of one, half a dozen of the other. And so I'm asking people to be patient. You know, I have a committee of four, and we've divided them. You know, each has quite a large responsibility. I have one person who is responsible for unpacking nearly $2 billion in, in DCPS budgets and in charter school budgets operating and also a, a substantial school modernization capital expenditures. And unpacking all of this while we're trying to do other items, of course, is, is we have to just, I'm asking people to be patient. Um, I, I appreciate your point of view with respect to neighborhood high schools. But, um, you know, unless we, and, and this is my view, unless we do something about the social promotion which brings kids to the ninth grade who are not prepared to work on ninth grade level, and we allow them because at that point is the first place in which they get reality when they have to have requirements that they have to pass to move on. We have 30 percent who fail, as we just discovered yesterday. Uh, and you have people who are in the ninth grade for the second or third or fourth time. There, that is, you know, I, I put myself in the position of a parent who we now have, I think, some very strong charter and traditional public school, elementary school options, and middle school options. If you're one of those parents, are you going to send your child into uh, into a even newly modernized high school where there will be, you know, 16, 17, 18-year-old freshmen? But what we've done is we've really concentrated. First of all, but, but do you don't want to hear what I have? No. I, no, I want you to answer that question. I, I was about to. Please, Mr. that's a yes or no. Would you? 
I think where you have 18-year-old freshmen, that's not good for that freshman. That's not good for anyone, not we anyone agree. coming in, not anyone there. That's a bad system. That's right. And so but I, but I do this, think do that this. the causes of, of it are more complex than what you explained. And, and my fear that, is that we've gotten to a place where we're concentrating those students in some schools. And I guess my hope is that we would get away from that. Well, Ms. Riley, we can't have it always, can we? No, but we can have a planning process where we start to look well, at these problems. Part of it is the need for Mr. Martell, for education Mr. Martell if you wouldn't, just if you would just wait a second, I'll, I'll have a question for you. But I'm having a conversation now with Ms. Riley. Thank you. Um, you know, what we want is utopia, and we want it now. No, I don't think that. I, I'm, I'm actually not that kind of person. I really want to see where we're going and how we're going to get there. And I want to have a real honest look at what the problems are so we don't come up to too simple of solutions. Well, let's, well Ms. Uh, Riley, let's then go back to the example I, I raised. If you are a parent who has had a very good elementary and middle school experience, and you know that the high school experience that, that is awaiting your child has children who are in the ninth grade who are not prepared, who are not on grade level, who are often many years older than their peers, uh, where you have chronic truancy and low proficiency. Is that a place, let's just start, is that a place? But Mr. Catania, I guess what I'd like to say, if that's also a place that's meeting those needs of those students and also meeting the need of my student, then I would look at it. You know, you're describing something that's only got problems. I mean, my hope is that what the schools have are the resources to meet those needs and the needs of the student that's coming that is more prepared. Well, Ms. Riley, instead of dividing them, we're instead we're of only the troubled students in one school and only the ambitious students in another school. You can school. have two schools in one, can't you? I hope so. so I hope that's what, that's what I'm kind of suggesting. Yeah. You, I think you, we learn, I think we can learn from each other in well, that Ms. kind Riley, of setting. you can have two in one. You can't have two in one? You can have two in one. I think you can well, even so, combine so programs in one school. That's right. Um, that's, that's a better option. And both Ward 4 high schools are not modernized, as you're aware, Mr. Chair. I'm speaking about Coolidge and Roosevelt, still unmodernized. Would you want to go somewhere where you get harassed and you got water dripping on your head and rodents and the roaches and so on? We got all this money per capita Mr. and the two Syndrome, high schools in Ward 4. Mr. Syndrome, we have, uh, we have modernized, um, you know, and are in the process of modernizing many of our high schools. Not we Ward 4, not Roosevelt, not Coolidge. Let's keep it real. And Mr. Syndrome, uh, in in those high schools that we've modernized, we still face very significant challenges getting children. You're saying yes. Roosevelt and Coolidge are modernized? Mr. Syndrome, I'm saying in those schools that we have modernized, we're still facing barriers. To right, they are not. And as we speak, they are not. No, of course they're not modernized, Mr. Syndrome. That's not the point. The point is that is schools, the point. Mr. Syndrome, in those schools that have been modernized, we're still facing barriers to getting kids in them because parents are choosing other options. Because the model that we have right now isn't working to attract them. Our highest performing high schools are all application high schools, traditional public schools. That makes sense. Of course they would right. be. You know? well, well, but not necessarily. Well, what if because, the application because, process because puts... Not, because they don't all use uh, background in academics. For instance, Duke, uh, Duke Ellington does not. Duke Ellington is evaluating for a number of different things. It's an arts but high it school. But it does not. It, it actually, they select, purposefully select away from top performers that enter. They, they go after And they have talent. a program, which was what, they have a program. The students are electing that school and McKinley, That's too, because right. at McKinley, right. we fought to not have it be a test score. But it is a focus, and the children are committing to a program. David, you have any more questions? Uh, Mr. Grasso has questions. Mr. Grasso. Uh, you know, I, I, I'd love to talk about this all day and learn about this all day, um, but I think I'm going to move to a different line if I can. The, you know, Miss Thomas, you, you know, I'm wondering if the reality here is that what we need, and I don't know, Chairman, if this is something the committee can do or if it would even be reasonable to ask for, uh, whether or not we can have a, a report sent over to the committee that looks at the curriculum around sexual education, um, you know, so that you know, by next week, we can ask questions about it that are informed uh, to make sure, you know, I think she's speaking from experience. I know the Women's Collective does really important good work around the city, and I think it would be important for us to dig into this a bit, um, you know, for the health and safety of our student body. So would that be something the committee maybe asked for? Mr. Krause, well, we can actually, uh, happy to do that, we'll ask Ossie for the status of uh, the curriculum development, uh, where we are now and where we're going in timelines, and we can 
we can hopefully have that uh, by the time we have DCPS and OSSI come before us in the, in the coming weeks. All right, thank thank you very much. Councilman Grasso, when you say committee, where are the other committee members? Thank you very much. Ms. Ms. Thomas, thank you for coming down. I think it's important to put these things on the record um, and help us move forward in every aspect of DCPS and, and its curriculum. So that's all I have. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, Mr. Grasso. Thank you all very much. Thank, thank you. you talked about finances. It's still not right, Mr. Chair. All right. We'll have um, Mr. I'm sorry, Ms. Walden, Ms. Griffin, Ms. Brown, and Ms. Ross. Who is Ms. Walden? Me. Okay. And you are? Sabrina Griffin. Okay. And you are? Shadi Barrow. All right. So we're missing Ms. Ross. Is that right? Oh, she's not Okay. Here. Why don't we ask uh, Ms. Curry? <laughs> Welcome. All right. Uh, Ms. Walden, please state your full name and begin your testimony. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Brianna Walden, and I'm 17 years old. I'm a junior at Cadoza High School. I joined the Young Women's Project staff in the summer of 2012 as a member of the FACE training team. We were trained on sexual health, and we went to other organizations to teach kids about sex and health. I'm here today because I'm getting sexually harassed, and it makes me feel uncomfortable. And also to speak for students at my school who are not speaking up and feel that no one cares. I see sexual harassment every day in my school. Recently, I saw a boy called a girl turkey. He was commenting on her, but it happens to me a lot, too. Sometimes I try to ignore because I know it's just people being childish. Sometimes it gets real irritating. I was walking in class and there was this pregnant girl and this boy had asked her she wanted him to put a baby in her and then he came behind me and said do you want me to put a baby, baby in you? We were in line and everyone was crowded and this boy kept touching this girl but the harassment also happens on the social networks. I've seen disrespectful comments and questions on girls Instagram profiles at my school. No one at Cardoza ever told me that there was a policy on sexual harassment or that I could file a complaint. We never received any training on it. No one ever mentioned it. Someone should let students know about the policy and let them know that sexual harassment is not a joke. Students don't think it's that serious. Some students are behaving disrespectfully and don't even know that it's sexual harassment. Stop with sexual harassment is about respecting girls. Girls need their respect. We don't go around touching boys inappropriately. And our generation, boys don't respect girls, period. They are constantly saying disrespectful stuff. It makes us feel uncomfortable and embarrassed. School should not be a place where you have to worry about being harassed and disrespected. When I brought up the issue of why WP, the staff told me that D.C. does have a sexual harassment policy protecting students and that it was created by a group of teen women staff members of YWP in 2002 who were trying to stop the sexual harassment they were going through and seeing. The policy was passed by the Board of Education on February 20, 2002. The notice of final rulemaking was given by the Board on July 17, 2002. My suggestion is to start enforcing the policy ASAP. There should be a, an assembly. There should be trainings for youth by adults and other youth. The youth training should involve role plays and skits so that youth can relate to it. We can also do a Twitter campaign. If the policy was enforced, it would make me more comfortable in the school and able to concentrate on my work. Right now, the burden is on each individual girl, and there is a lot of pressure not to snitch, and so people don't want to tell on each other. If we do, if we don't do anything about sexual harassment, the girls will continue to have problems in school. Then they are more likely to miss school because of it. Thanks for listening. Thank you uh, very much, Miss um, Walden. Miss Griffin. Good afternoon. My name is Sabrina Griffin, and I am a 16 years old junior at Cardoza High School. I joined the Young Women's Project staff in the summer as a member of the FACE team. FACE stands for Peer Health and Sexuality Education. This summer, I was trained on sex education. I also trained other youth on contraceptives and did condom demonstrations. I am here today because sexual harassment is a big deal, and I'm worried about the well-being and safety of myself and others in my school. Sexual harassment became a problem for me when I was at Coolidge in ninth grade. This guy would pop up everywhere and try to grab me. Every time I got out of class, he would be there. I was scared. He was bigger than me. I would try to go another way, and then out of the blue, he would be there. I continued to go to class, but I was always looking over my shoulder. I didn't tell any teachers about the problem. The security witnessed it, but did not help tell him to leave me alone. I noticed the same person harassing different girls. At Cardoza, I hear boys saying disrespectful things to girls. Everybody gets harassed. It's an issue for boys and girls. I've seen girls harass boys, too. 
People are not respecting personal space. I don't think people take it seriously. I don't think the teachers believe it. A lot of adults witness sexual harassment by students, but they don't get involved. They think that someone is just trying to talk to you. I wish adults would intervene. When I was in middle school, police came and told us about sexual harassment and what to do about it, and that was really helpful. They made it clear who to tell. In high school, everything has changed. People think we are older and we know, but that is not the case. It doesn't matter how old you are. You should always have someone to report it to. In high school, no one in DCPS has ever talked to me about sexual harassment policy. When I raised the issue at YWP, the staff told me that there, were a, there was a sexual harassment policy already in place. YWP's youth and adult staff drafted a sexual harassment policy. The policy was passed by the Board of Education on February 20, 2002. If there is a law, it needs to be enforced. Sexual harassment is happening every day. There should be assemblies on it and students and student training. It would be better if the peers did the training so that people can be comfortable. If it doesn't stop, we should take action. There should be a staff person in charge so people know where to go to report. If a student files a complaint, then action should be taken on the person who is doing it. If sexual harassment continues to go unaddressed, it will continue to cause a lot of problems, especially for girls. I did some research on sexual harassment and found that according to a 2002 survey by the American Association of University Women, 8 out of 10 teen girls reported experiencing sexual harassment sometime during high school. There are many negative effects of sexual harassment, including increased absenteeism to avoid harassment or because of illness from the stress, having to drop courses or change academic plans, having to relocate to another city or school, experiencing negative health effects, including depression, anxiety, and or panic attacks, headaches, feeling betrayed and or violated, increasing blood pressure, and suicidal thoughts or attempts. Thank you, Mr. Catania and committee, for listening to my testimony. Thank you, Ms. Griffin. Ms. Brown. Good morning, Councilman Catania and other committee members. My name is Sade Brown, and I'm a 12th grader at Dunbar Senior High School. I am here to testify on a problem dealing with the size of classes at school. I have been in Dunbar for three years and have never had this problem until this year. My classes have been very large, which makes it hard for me to focus and stay on task. With large classes comes best friends, enemy class clowns, and slackers. All those different personalities mix aren't good. When friends see friends, they want to talk the whole class. When enemies see enemies, they want to argue or fight. And when class clowns see class clowns, they joke the whole time. And slackers just sit and disrupt the class by not following the directions given by the teacher. We don't have class aides or people who come in and help with the class. We have at least 30 kids with one teacher. Most kids don't come to school, and when they do, they want the teacher to reteach the lesson. And when the teacher says no, it causes a problem. I don't feel that I or any of the other students are getting the academic attention we need because of this. We also have students who want to learn but don't learn as fast as others. So when we have questions, we have to be put on hold because the teacher is busy with another student. This makes it harder to get my work complete. I understand that everybody needs help sometimes, but it seems like those students need help all the time. If we are going to have large classes, I feel that it should be two or more teacher or aides in the room helping the teacher with the students. I don't think that it's fair to the students who want to learn because they want to move on and learn new things. But we have students on different learning levels, which means the whole class can't move on. I just feel that if the school had more teachers, then we wouldn't have this problem. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Ms. Curry. Hi. Hello, members. My name is Jean-Luc Curry. I'm a 16-year-old junior at Dama Senior High School. I am an employee on the YWP FACE team, which stands for Peer Health and Sexuality Education. I am here today to talk an issue about regarding violence in school environments. I feel this is an important issue because I didn't feel safe in my previous school. I also had to watch my surroundings right in the area and couldn't really focus on what I wanted to learn because I had distraction. During my first year of friendship school, I didn't really know anyone and started in the second week. A group of girls began bullying me. I really didn't know anybody there. I really couldn't do much but try to continue to do my work. At the time, I felt unsafe and didn't want to attend friendship. I decided to tell my mom at the school. I decided to tell my mom in school schedule a meeting with the girls and their parents. After the meeting, the problem escalated and started getting worse because people said I was snitching. A couple of other students saw that I was being bullied and decided to help me out. However, the situation became worse because people began saying the girls who were trying to help me were joining the altercation. As a result, the girls group the, as a result the group that had been bullying me confronted me and my friends. It got into a big fight at school. Unfortunately, there were not enough security guards to break things up, and many people got injured. Once we got back into school, the principal, dean, and counselors decided we should have another meeting to discuss our punishment. 
Unfortunately, we got suspended for three days. I feel like no one really took action in this situation because we did our three days at home, but we still didn't like each other. I had to watch my surroundings while the young females were around. This issue impacts youth and be schools because it can affect their ability to learn. They are unable to focus because they are scared and easily distracted during class time. Schools should hire more security guards for each floor in the building. If the school staff knows somebody is being bullied or having problems, they should do something to prevent it. The staff members to the staff members to be more cause I want the staff members members to be more concerned about kids' safety because if things don't get resolved, it may cause extra problems. I appreciate the council for passing the Youth Bullying Prevention Act of 2012 and the work of the bullying, Youth Bullying Prevention Task Force to address this important issue. I hope all public schools adopt the model policy so that other students don't have to go through what I went through. Thank you, committee, for hearing my statement. Thank you, uh, Ms. Curry. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Grasso, I'm going to give the first round of questions to you. Mr. Right. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all for coming down today. I think it's extremely important. I say this to a lot of panels, but I want to make sure I do it every time because uh, the value that you add to our process is, is insurmountable. We really appreciate it. And um, just spending the time and, and the preparation to come down and testify. Um, you know, uh, Ms. Ms. Walden, right on the end, um, you talked about a 2002 sexual harassment um, kind of guidelines or something. Can you talk a little bit more about those? And you wanted more enforcement, but do you think they also need to be updated? In your testimony, you were saying that they were, I think it was 2002, were the guidelines or the regulations that were passed on sexual harassment. Is that right? Yes. And, and do you think that they are good, or do you think that they need to be updated? Like you were wanting them to be more enforced. You remember you were saying yeah. that you'd like to have them enforced more. And I was wondering if you think if they were enforced, would they do a good enough job today? Yes. I, I, mean, like, I think it would help out a little more. Because some people don't even know. Some people don't even know when they're doing sexual harassment. They don't even know it. So I think it would help out a little more. And then would that mean that they would um, talk about it more in class? Uh, and, you know, kind of give people the, you know, the, the guidance that they need and the language that they need to talk about it, or what do you think? I mean, like, not in class, but, like, do an assembly or something and get everyone together, but not in class. <laughs> right. What's funny? I'm sorry. Is there something funny? I'm sorry. Well, I, I mean, I'm just curious because one of the problems I have is that we were talking about earlier around <coughs> curriculum setup, and... You know, if there's not a legitimate curriculum set up and a legitimate guidelines and standards, then it's really hard to, you know, make people comply with them. It's the same with the bullying task force. You know, we can put all the rules in place that we want and all the regulations around trying to stop bullying in the district and in the schools. But if you don't have, you know, adequate enforcement and you don't have up-to-date, you know, guidelines, then ultimately it's, it doesn't really work. Um, uh, I thought that your testimony was really good in the fact that you talked about um, the, the, the whole kind of spectrum of how hard it is to get a, a situation like that addressed. Um, and so, I, I, I'm, you know, you mentioned the bullying task force work, and can you just talk a little bit about how you think that will fix that problem? You know, all right, that's all right. You don't have to go into detail. But, you know, the, I think you made some really good points about having meetings the, between them that are actually effective. You talked about out-of-school suspension for three days where you didn't feel like it actually had an impact because you didn't really address the problems. You were all just at home, you know, sitting there thinking about your own issues. Um, you know, so would you, do you think that it would be, what would be a better approach than being out of school? Um, I don't think, like, I, I can't honestly say, like, what could be a good idea for it because, like, if we still, no matter if we still with each other or not, no matter how, if they still, if they don't like each other, they don't like each other. So mm -hmm. I honestly think there's nothing you can do about it except try to, like, talk things out. But as you can see, that that didn't work because we had a meeting. Right. So that we had two work. meetings, right? So, yeah, two meetings. But that didn't right. work. Like, I think just, like, if girls don't like each other, they just not going to like each other. There's nothing you can really do but, like, try to keep them away from each other. But 
I, you know, I'm I'm a little bit over time here, but I you know I want to put a pitch in for some conflict resolution measures. You know that I think can be you know valuable in a situation like that. Um, we all grow up a little bit here, and you know, and as we grow older, you you forget about those things that made you upset before. Uh, and there's you know, although there's value in talking it out, there's also value in um, in trying to forgive one another and move past our differences. So, Chairman, thank you very much. Mr. Grasso, we'll have another round. So, you know, I appreciate you have more questions. We've been joined by uh, a member of our committee, um, Mr. Barry, whose phone is going off on perfect timing. I'll wait for you to get your phone in order, Mr. Barry. Then I'm going to turn to you for appreciate that for an opening statement and first round of questions. Mr. Barry, we have shortened rounds uh, given the number of public witnesses. So, uh, I have six minutes for you to combine an opening statement and a round of questions for this. This panel, and we'll have another round. So please give Mr. Barry six minutes. Mr. Barry. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me uh, apologize. I had an unforeseen uh, personal situation that came up. Uh, otherwise, I would have been here, as you very well know. I'm one of the most, one of, one of the very active members along with Mr. Chairman, so for this committee. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for giving the kind of leadership you've been given as we go forward to try to. I'm not going to use the word reform because reform has failed over two-thirds of our students and their parents. So I'd rather use the word transform. Also for you young people who are too young to have known this, uh, I'm no stranger to uh, education. I was president of the school board for 60 years as mayor. I had to have hearings on the school's budget. You know, plus I, I, I just take a very strong view about education developing the skills that you need to survive in this world. Also, I represent Ward 8. Any one of you live in Ward 8? Okay. Any one of you all live in Ward 8? Hmm? Could you repeat what you said? Is, I said, does any one of the four of you all live in Ward 8? No. No. All right. All right. And so, Ward 8 schools, there are 20 of them two high schools, three middle schools, and uh, 15 elementary schools. And in terms of the public schools, there is not one, Mr. Chairman, one school in Ward 8 that come, goes above 45 percent proficiency in reading okay. and in math. But if you take other middle income communities, those numbers are 80, 85 percent. Uh, a lot of this you probably don't understand. But I do you understand the fact that we need to do a lot more and a lot faster and, 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 and focus on very important areas such as truancy. Truancy is a serious problem in the community. Uh, what school do you all go to? Cardozo. All from Cardozo? No. I go to Dunbar. Dunbar? Mm -hmm. I go to Dunbar. Dunbar. You know, one part of our history, when there was segregation in the schools, Dunbar was one of the most outstanding schools uh, in terms of graduates going on and do great things. And then Cardozo at that time was Central, another name. I see you get the new building. Are you all happy about that? The new structure? Yeah. yeah. Huh? But the only thing, I won't be there. Well, we're getting one to more day, too. The new balloon. So uh, we're going with that. And so my focus and Chairman's focus is to move the system forward as fast as we can. There are certain things we can't tolerate. I would like to, and the Chairman would like to have this system to be a student center and parent center system. When you go into Cadoza, go into uh, Beluga, go into uh, any public schools, you greet it with a smile. You greet it with some enthusiasm. We want you here in this class. And we want you here to learn and do all you can. Well, they really are interested in with young people. You know, I have a long history. Summer Job Program was a great program. About a thousand people went through it. Uh, but we need to figure out how we have a variety of curriculum that can meet your needs. And a lot of the curriculum is not doing that. They're trying to get there. So I want to just welcome you, who of you are, and thank the chairman for his leadership. 
Mr. Russo, nominated the committee, was very diligent about this. So I guess, uh, in terms of Fred Dunbar, when you go to Dunbar, are you greeted with smiles and appreciation that you're there? And how are you greeted? In Dunbar? Uh, yeah, huh? You say, how are we reading? How, how are you greeted? When you get into Dunbar, you find it the teachers and the principal. Oh, how, my, how are we greeted? Yeah. Love? Well, we, sometimes we're not greeted. Huh? Sometimes. Well, what I mean by that, what, when you walk into the school, you know you're already there. And you just walk into the school itself in terms of the atmosphere, whether or not it's one, one that welcomes you. Oh, yeah, it's mm -hmm. one that welcomes us. It does? Yeah. Who's your principal? Mr. Jackson. Jackson. You know what I mean? Where school you go to? I go to Dunbar. Dunbar, Dunbar. Yeah. Cadoza. Yeah. Cadoza, lady right here. Well, how do you read that, Cadoza? Um, usually when I come, there's people standing outside saying good morning and hello. That's good to hear. What about you, young lady? Same thing. That's great. I didn't get, get your testimony. I didn't hear it. And my staff person here is Kathy Arnold. who been brief with me on it. I will uh, see the tape later on, but I issue it. Usually after 500 is there. I thank you for your courage. I thank you for your insights. I thank you for having the courage to come sit at the table. It's not easy. You're is welcome. It? Is it easy sitting there? Is it, are you all nervous? You know, a, a little bit. Who was nervous? Um, I was a little nervous. Who was nervous? What about young lady? The, the I, was, I wasn't nervous. What about you young lady? No. Well, that's great. Anyway, I know it's tough. It's tough for adults to come and sit at that table because some of the counselors will ask you some tough kinds of questions that uh, they don't like. But thank you all so much for coming. You're Thank you, uh, um, Mr. Barry. Uh, just to, to, you know, Mr. Barry, one of the things I'm trying to do is to get us accustomed to referring to all charter schools and all traditional public schools as public schools. Uh, it's very important. Um, you know, we have to knit these two systems uh, together because it's one family of schools. And I, I do want to just highlight the successful schools we have in Ward 8. Uh, that are that are you know on a trajectory just because I think it's important for parents to know that there are other options. So we have Achievement uh, Prep Academy, which has nearly a 77 percent proficiency. Uh, that's seven, um, fourth through eighth grade. Thurgood Marshall uh, High School with a 75.8 percent. Uh, Kip Aim Academy, which is as a pre-K, there's a pre-K through uh, eight. Uh, at, uh, at uh, the Douglas campus, which I know you know well, Mr. Barry, uh, as well as the KIPP High School, the Prep Academy, which is a high school, which has a 63.7% proficiency. It's down a few points from last year, and in fact, they reassigned the principal because they were not satisfied with those results. But that's not the reason we're here today uh, with this panel before us. Um, Ms. Walden, have you, you, um, Ms. Walden, Ms. Griffin, Ms. Brown, Ms. Curry, remind me which one Ms. Walden, you're at Cardozo, and there's sexual harassment going on, on, on at Cardozo. Have you raised this issue with Principal Rowe? No. All right, let me ask. Um, so just a show of hands. Who is Cardozo? Who's at Dunbar? Dunbar. I'm at Cardozo. Okay, wait. So Dunbar first. You're the only one at Dunbar. Oh, you two are at Dunbar. Okay, you two are at Cardozo. Let's start with Principal Rowe. I mean, she seems to me to be very strong, no nonsense. Have you have you had an occasion? And first of all, let me say how much you know the Young Women's Project. I've had interns from Young Women's Project in my office for the last couple of years, and have really enjoyed the experience and the interaction with young people. And I, I think it's a great program that helps you know uh, you know helps. If there's something to look forward to. It helps you to educate your peers. It's empowering, and and it's a it's a, a nice place to belong. And I think it does great work. So let me start with that. But let me ask if Miss Walden and Miss Griffin. Have you spoken with uh, Ms. Roan about this? And if not, why not? This is very serious. I mean, like, it all falls back on me not, like, running to snitch for nobody. I don't have time. It's not about snitching. Like, Let me be clear. It's not about snitching. It's about without 
But is she, is she aware of how pervasive this, this issue is she, without naming names? She knows how our school is already, but I don't know if she knows about sexual harassment. All right. Well, you know, could I ask that you do us a favor? Yes. Um, and, and reach out to Principal Roan. Do you find her to be accessible? I, I have to tell you, I'm very impressed with her. And I, I've you know, met Mr. Jackson as well. I've met both of your principals. And so I, I've, I've had you know, a, a couple of hours with Mr. Jackson. I've had less time with Ms. Roan. But I think that she's, she's a real spirit. I think she's going to do great things with Cardozo, especially as we move into our new school. Uh, do me a favor and, and, and let's, let, let, let her know how pervasive this is. And let's give her... Uh, because if she's if she is unaware, and I doubt that she is unaware, but I'd be curious to know what her reaction is. Would you mind doing that and reporting back to the committee? Yeah, Could do you, you do that? Do you mind me asking your name? Sorry. Your name. Do you mind me asking your name? Your name. My name. Yes. It's Councilmember Catania, okay, and we've met. You. And you just have to ask her. You know, what are we doing about it? Okay. All right. Why Why haven't you felt uh, comfortable asking her before? Like. It'd be other, I don't have the time for it. It'd be other things on my mind. No, no, that's I not a good answer time. because this is affecting your education, right? It is, but like... Well, if it's I mean, this is what we're doing is an exercise in you know, how you have to speak up for yourself. Now, if you're not comfortable naming names, I understand that because you don't want any retaliation. But, but to, to let her know that this is an issue and so she can you know, start to you know, look at what tools she has to address it, very important. Could you, would you mind doing that and getting back to us? Okay. Okay. What about you? So, Ms. Griffin, can you do the same? Yes. All right. So, have you seen retaliation when, you, when, when students uh, go to the principal on certain items? Is that why you're fearful to talk to her? Um, I haven't really <coughs> seen anybody go to her because they go to, um, like, counselors and stuff. Well, but, but she's, she, Ms. Roan, we're gonna, and then we'll go to Dunbar for a second. So just, we, well, I'm not going to ignore you ladies, promise. But, but she seems really extraordinary. And I don't think I'm wrong about her. I think if you were to go to her and let her know that this is going on, I think she would stitch something together because there's no part of this that is acceptable. No part of it. And so, uh, and it is not up to you to confront these young boys about their inappropriate behavior. It's not up to you. I think you should communicate this. I'm, and you're not the only two in the school, I suspect, that feel this way, right? Yeah, I think so. It's a pervasive problem. How does it affect your schooling? Explain to us how it affects your schooling. Like being the, like boys that be in my class that are like irritating, it'll make me not want to go to class just because of that fact. Right, because you don't feel safe and you don't feel I'm respected just, or valued. Yeah. Right, and it takes your head out of the game, which is to be in school and get an education. All right. Yeah. Well, so after uh, you're done, if you'll just go over to this table here and you'll get our contact information, our email address, and as soon as you've had these conversations with Principal Roan, I want you to email us what you what she said, and we'll follow okay. up. All right. Look, you, 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 you all. Uh, the thing I like about this young women's project is that you all are leaders, and you're speaking for a lot of other young women who are doing, are going through this every day. And so, you know, you all have good voices and you know mentors. I don't want you to put yourself in harm's way, but this is not acceptable. Not. All right. Let me ask um, Miss Brown and Miss Miss Brown, Miss Curry, correct? Yes. Um, do you all find sexual harassment a problem at Dunbar? Well, no, N not with not me. Okay, have you, uh, Miss Curry? No. Okay, so Miss uh, Brown, your issue. You're the senior uh, at the table. This yes. is your last year. Now, what what are your plans for next year? May I ask? Um, I want to go to college for um, criminal justice. Okay, have you applied? No, um, I was trying to apply to UDC because I heard they have a good criminal justice program, but they told me I need an um, official transcript, so I had to wait till I graduate. But I have been applying. I applied to a PG Community College. PG Community College. Mm -hmm. right. So, Mr. Barry, this is you know, um, unfortunately, um, UDC and the Community College you don't fall under the purview of this committee. Uh, they fall under the committee of the whole, and it's something that you know I have to uh, discuss with Mr. Mendelson the impenetrable way in which UDC 
actually deflects students. Uh, the charter, I mean, the uh, the uh, community college as well as the uh, as well as the, um, the the university does not do a. It is not a friendly place to apply to. It is not easy to apply to. It is almost impenetrable. We worked with a, a young woman from the Young Women's Project who was an intern in my office. And I thought she'd be extremely talented and bright, and so we were working with her to get her into the community college. And it took everything that our office had, you know, as a council member, to get her into community college. In the, here in the District of Columbia, it made no sense. So have you considered uh, schools outside of the city? Yes, but um, I always miss my SATs. Like, uh, when how, I signed up. How did that happen? I don't, I forget. Now, Miss Brown, if you were not a bright young lady, I might buy that excuse. But you're bright. <laughs> you did not forget it. What happened? I really did forget. How do you, you know you don't forget that? I did not forget to sign up for them. I mean, like, I don't know the dates. Okay. So, so like, I miss so them. Let's just have a conversation. Why, why did that happen? Did you not know you had to take the SAT? No, I know about them, but they have different sign-up dates. Okay. So I'm, I, I don't know the exact date, so I miss them. All right. So what your plan is to perhaps go to a community college until you can then take the SAT, and then you will go to a, a full four-year yeah. accredited? Okay. Um, Ms. Curry, well, well, let me stay with you, Ms. Brown, because I was interested in you know, something that, uh, that you stated, uh, and it's too bad that we got to the end of the day before students start appearing. I'm going to instruct staff that going forward, I want all students on education hearings to be at the top of the list. I want you all to be first and not last. So this is an oversight on our part, and I apologize. Um, when you claim that your teachers have to spend time reteaching lessons because kids are truant or not in school, or that teachers spend their time with children who are not ready to learn and that you believe it affected your education. How pervasive is that? Is that an occasional situation or is that a daily situation? It's daily because it's like kids, they don't come to class. They did come to class when they want to because we have a lunch period and like we have gym and stuff. So kids will go to the gym and then they'll come upstairs and they won't know what to do and they'll make the teacher teach, reteach while we're learning and it stops the whole lesson. So you're not in the, you're, you're a senior, so you're not in the uh, the academy, the Dunbar Academy, which is, the, that's the freshmen and sophomores. Yeah. I'm and I understand sophomore. that the juniors and seniors are kept somewhat separate from the mm -hmm. academy of the freshmen and sophomores. Is yes. that your experience? That's the way, I mean, when I visited your school, that's what it was explained to me, but in, again, in two hours, I don't want to overstate an observation, but that's the way it was explained. <coughs> uh, do, you, do, you, do you find that the junior and senior classes are under control? I feel as though that the juniors and seniors shouldn't be mixed in one class. Should or should not? They shouldn't. Okay. Do you find the classrooms under control? No. Because I, I, I have to be honest, I saw the freshman and sophomore classes in the academy, and I saw there to be discipline and learning taking place. That, that may be different, is what you're saying, in your junior and senior. Okay. Well, one of the things this council has to tackle is the fact that we have a good many kids who just go from one grade to the next who may not be ready. And those who are there, um, be, for whatever reason, they're not ready. And those who are there who are often not in class, their truancy impacts the education of students. It's what, we have, it's what, what we've seen uh, in our school visits and, and here. So I want to thank you for coming. Um, Ms. Curry, when you were suspended, you were suspended out of school. Correct? Yes. And so that had to have had an impact on your education. Do you think it's wise to suspend kids out of school? Yes. I mean, if they need, I mean, well. Would it have been better had to have you suspended in school with your lessons, just isolated from the other children? Yes, that's better too. I mean, we, I thought that we should get in school suspension, but at the same time, it was, once we get in school suspension, we still was going to be together. So. Something, anything could have been said, and it could have, you know, got escalated. But I so, have you met with Mr. Jackson to discuss the bullying? Uh, because I was impressed by, you know, the seriousness with which he takes discipline and order. Um, you know, that there there was a time, and not too many years ago, when Dunbar did not have order, and there was very little learning that was even possible there. Mm -hmm. And so his emphasis on this academy with uh, freshmen, and I guess the classes are kind of moving up next year. The academy will be freshmen, 
sophomore juniors and I guess this August you move into your new school which I know you're all excited about have you taken to Mr. Jackson your concerns about bullying and, and what has his response been um actually I didn't go there my ninth grade year I actually went to a friendship school that's when I had all my problems but once I got into Doma I felt it's like I knew everybody, everybody, I see everybody as brothers and sisters, so I didn't actually have a problem at with Dunbar. the... Dunbar? No. Nope. Okay. So, so, but you, you, so your, your, um, your, your suspension issue is a friendship? Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. At Dunbar, you don't have that problem? No. Okay. Very good. Uh, Mr. Barry, I've gone over. I apologize. I'll give you a five-minute round. If you, if, if you find that sufficient, if you need more time, please let me know. Thank so, you. Thank you, Mr. Barry. Sure. Five minutes. In terms of Ms. Brown... Uh, at Dunbar, do you have any? Um, uh, does the guidance, the guidance council prepare you to take tests and etc.? How do you find out about the SAT? Well, we have to go to um, it's this man named Mr. B, but his office is always so packed. So I I feel as though like I okay I'll come back later, but then I always it always slipped my mind because I have a half a day schedule. So What's his name? Mr. B. How you spell it, Tina? I don't know his whole name. We just okay. call him Mr. B. Mr. B? Yes. All right, we'll find him. And what is it? Is he a guidance counselor? What, what is his role? Um, well, he helps, I guess, because he helps kids sign up for colleges and FAFSA and stuff like that. It would have been good to have had one or more teachers, one or more people to help you prepare for college. In terms of the kind of courses you take yeah. in undergraduate, hey, that happened to you? Yeah, I feel as though we should have college prep classes. No, a different kind of question. In terms of your experience at Dunbar, mm -hmm. you went there when you were in ninth grade? I, went, I started going there in my tenth grade year. Tenth grade year. When you went there, was there anybody on staff that talked to you and other students about college and getting yourself prepared for it? No. Say that. Speak up. No. No. Let's do all of all all these schools. The uh, guidance councils are supposed to be doing something, but they inundated with paperwork. So, uh, how do you how did you decide to go to uh, a community college first? How did I? Mm -hmm. Well, well, my mother and people, everybody was saying that UDC has a good criminal justice program. So I just wanted to like get a feel of what it was like first before I go to a four-year college. Mr. Chairman, it's a serious problem in the sense that all these 16, 17 high schools don't have a dedicated cadre of people, one or two, three, that starts in the ninth grade counseling young people as to what they ought to be thinking about what they ought to be doing in life. And then in the 11th grade, a lot of young people apply to colleges in the 11th grade and they get admitted in the fall of the next year. Did that happen to you? Anybody counsel you, Ms. Brown? Mm, no, it didn't happen to me. No. That's a real serious problem, Mr. Chairman. What about truancy? Why, why do you think those young people who don't come to school regularly are doing that? Why aren't they coming to school regularly? Yeah, Ms. Brown. Maybe because I really, I really can't speak for them. I really don't know why they don't come to school, but they usually come to school under the influence a lot. So I guess that's one of the problems. Under the influence of what? Huh? Under the influence of what? Marijuana. Marijuana. Is that, is that prevalent over at Dunbar? Is it what? Prevalent. Is it widespread? Well, no, not really. It's cert it's like certain kids that do it. Do you know people who don't come to school yourself? Do I know people? Mm -hmm. Yes. Students? Yes. You ever ask them why they don't come to school? No. I think you ought to start doing that so you can, at least from a peer point of view, do that. In terms of uh, Ms. Curry, what grade are you? Twelve. Twelve? Mm-hmm. At Cardozo? I mean, uh, yeah, Do you have any guidance as to what you should do about taking tests, SAT, and, uh, and other tests, and any idea about going to college? It might have 
ये पहले
Thank you, Mr. Ferry. Uh, Ms. Walden, Ms. Griffin, uh, don't forget to, to get our contact information so that after you speak with Principal Roan, you can let us know what her reaction is and what she intends to do about this uh, issue of sexual harassment at Cardozo. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll quiz her as well, but I, I, this is an exercise in Young Women's Project, uh, which we have used uh, the Young Women's Project in the past to be advocates for the other uh, young women in your school. I'd like to I'd like you to reach out to her, and I'd like you to tell us what she tells you. All right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, our last uh, two witnesses are Ms. Bell and Ms. Walker. <coughs> yeah, and these are our last two witnesses. Okay. okay. Are you Ms. Bell? Yes. Okay, Ms. Bell, I'd like you to go first, and then uh, Ms. Walker. Okay. Just uh, state your full name and begin your testimony, okay? Okay. Hello, my name is Diagene Bell. <coughs> uh, my name is Diagene Bell. I'm a senior at Francis L. Cardozo Senior High School and an intern at the Young Women's Project through Urban Alliance. This fall, I plan on attending college to major in journalism with a minor in communications. At the Young Women's Project, we advocate as youth on sexual education. My roles at YWP are working alongside the Peer Health and Sexuality Education Team and the Youth Health Action Council Team. I am here today to speak about the issue involving violence in high school and my experience with it. Violence in my school typically happens about once or twice every two weeks depending on the way situations are handled. The types of violence that I have experienced have been physical and verbal fights both during and after school. The way that I feel about what I have experienced is that a lot of the situations can be prevented and that a majority of the violence has either little to no point at all. My junior year at Cardoza, I unfortunately was involved in an altercation with a young man at my school. The altercation started with the various exchange of words between the both of us. I decided to walk away from the situation once he became very boisterous. But as I tried leaving the room, I was struck in the back of the head by the young man. I reacted by turning around and striking him in the face. After that, the teacher, whose class we were in, and a few other students broke us apart. I was taken into the main office where the teacher and my best friend, who witnessed the fight, briefly explained to the dean of students and an officer what had happened. I was then taken into the nurse's suite by the officer, <coughs> excuse me, while the dean of students tried to locate where the young man was. Finally, they, they located the gentleman, and then the young man, the dean of students, an officer, and I sat down to get how he felt about the situation. We spoke for about 15 minutes. I was told that the young man would be suspended, and then I was dismissed to my next class. The next day, I learned that the young man, in fact, would not be suspended, which made me very upset. I believe that there should have been some type of consequence behind his actions. A recommendation that, I sh that should be considered is mediation. Mediation could really help with getting to the source of the problem, which would result in the prevention of a fight happening either during or after school. Also, mediation can help the people involved in the conflict see just how pointless their fighting and arguments are. The idea of having mediation within schools could help decrease the number of altercations that occur. In the 2011 survey regarding school violence, 12% of students have reportedly been affiliated with the physical fight that happened on school property. In 1999, there was a directive passed by the D.C. Office of the Superintendent to implement a peaceable schools model. The directive created an action plan to establish peer mediation in all DCPS schools grades K-12. through Although the model was successfully piloted in, in some high schools, the plan was never fully implemented. This plan would support both the teaching and learning environment and a development of civic and social responsibilities. I completely agree with this action plan because teachers would not be hindered from teaching, meaning the students would get a chance to continue learning. Also, students will be able to learn and develop a sense of maturity and responsibility with facing various life lessons. Thank you for your time. Ms. Bell, thank you. Um, Ms. Walker. Good afternoon. My name is Octavia, and I'm 17 years old. I'm a junior at Dunbar High School. I joined the Young Women's Project staff in the fall of 2012 as a member of the FACE training team. Thank you for hearing my testimony. I'm here today to talk about several issues that have affected me during my high school experience. Teachers' negative interactions with students and their inability to access information about classes. The first problem that I have is with the teachers' negative behavior. 
Some teachers do not treat students with respect. One teacher I have gets smart if you ask him questions. It's not a hard class, but he is such a tough person to deal with and puts us down all the time, so people are discouraged in his class. He intimidates his students. Another teacher kicked a hole in the wall. Students need to know what to do when they are in this situation. I never know, know who to talk to. I would like to talk to someone. No one ever talked to me about harassment. We have counselors who come to our classroom once a month. They never tell us who to talk to if you are having a problem in school with the teacher. I've never heard of the harassment policy or the grievance policy. I think that students should be aware of what they can do if they are having trouble with the teachers. There needs to be some place you can complain. If it wasn't for YWP, I would have never found out about, found out about the grievance policy. A second problem that I have is accessing course information. We have classes, but students never get a list of classes. You have to go around and ask counselors what classes are off there are offered and what you should take, but the counselors are not always available. By the time you find out about it, it's too late to enroll or they might not have enough space. This could be easily fixed. I think a class list should be posted in the hallways and put up online. We already have in grade pro. Students can log on onto that and check up on their grades and class assignments. You could put a class list right on there and then we can look at the opportunities that are listed. Um, I also, I also think that a prop, something should be done about community service hours. Right now we need community service hours to graduate, but we don't have a list of, a list of places to go. So we have to run around searching for places that, that don't, and then when we go, they tell us they don't need volunteers. It makes it hard. They never give you a list or assign you places where you need to know. If they want us to do community service, then they need to give a list of what we should do and where we could go. And um, I think that D.C. public schools should have college prep classes instead of saying that they're pre preparing us for college while we in regular classes. Um, and thanks for listening to my testimony. I hope that my suggestions were helpful. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Walker. Uh, Mr. Barry, do you have any questions? Let me welcome the two of you here, Ms. Bell and Ms. Walker. I mean, Bell, in terms of uh, what you were testifying about, I wasn't quite clear that you thought that sexual harassment or bullying was a problem at Kadosa, is it? Not for, for me. I've never had I'm not personally, but just huh? going there. And see what happens with your friends say, and see the atmosphere of what's going on. No. Uh, in terms of your, you senior, right? Yes. Where are you, where are you going to college? Your career development. I really want to go to Bowie State, but I just got accepted into Bennett College. Did you apply to Bowie State? Yes. Were you accepted? Well, I said, not yet because my application isn't complete because I just took my ACT at the beginning of this month. So once I get my scores back, I'll submit them. Yeah, who told you about the SAT? And um, how was it scheduled? My D.C. CAP counselor. So they tell us about the fact that, how, like in November, they told us that we should sign up. Um, no, October, yeah, in November. And then I was scheduled to take it, but I got sick while I was taking the SAT, so they canceled my scores. So then I just waited and waited, and then I recently took my ACT this month. Would you like to have everybody there all along to help guide you through this college preparation and all the things that goes with it? Not really. A lot of it I had to do on my own. It's just because my DC CAP counselors. They have they don't they aren't available every day and the days that they're supposed to be there they're not always there on the day that they're supposed to be there. Did that create a problem for you in terms of preparation for college? Sometimes but I was still able to get to go to their room and apply for the colleges that I wanted to apply for. But I know a friend of mine she missed, ended up missing a scholarship deadline because they weren't in their office. The day How do you decide what college you want to go to? 
um, college fest, with the college fest, just listen to what they had to say about the colleges. I also had to think about how much it would be to attend the college. A lot of seniors who don't, who slap with the college process and then I guess they feel like it's supposed to be done for them or that there's like an extended amount of time. Not, it's a small amount of seniors who are really dedicated to pushing themselves through the college process. Well, you heard me say earlier, I think that each school ought to have career development and college preparation. Yes. Not only courses, but someone who's there that can help guide you. Uh, so, we do to expect. Did, did you take a pre SAT class? No, we didn't have a pre SAT class. Did it cold? Yeah, but like I said, I wasn't able to take the, um, the SAT, but with taking the ACT, um, my mentor at YWP helped me get a prep book for the ACT. So I was able to study with that for a little while, and then I took my ACT. Yeah. David, uh, as you often say about things that are just unacceptable, that kind of process, these young people uh, are have, you know, live in the neighborhoods that are violence and other kind of things going on, uh, sometimes doubling up in a home. And when you go to school, I'm sure you agree, ought to be a pleasant, welcome here, glad you're here kind of attitude, but more importantly, have enough counselors and others, because most of you don't know at first what these things are all about, do you? Can you repeat the question, please? In ninth grade, you didn't, have, you didn't have an idea about what college was, did you? No, not really. When did you find out what college was? In my junior year, because our D, um, one of our D.C. Cap counselors, they do, like, college tours and college trips, and they allow juniors to go on the college tour with them. So I was able to go to, um, we visited Virginia State. I, yeah, we visited Virginia State and another community college in Virginia. I can't remember the name, but... I was able to go on the college tour with them where I really got a feel of what college would be like and what it was about. Okay. Ms. Walker, what are your experiences at Cadoza around college preparation? Someone to talk to you about what the various options are so you may learn and, and good decisions. I go to Dunbar. I'm sorry, Dunbar. It's, uh, I go to Cardoza. Uh, I'm talking to Walker. Forgive <laughs> me. Uh, where have you been? What grade are you? 11. 11. What has been your experience at Dunbar with someone being able to be available and someone being knowledgeable about getting you ready to go into a career or go into the military or go into a college? What's been your experience? Um, like, the only way you can find out in Dunbar is if you go around and ask. Or, like, sometimes if you're a senior, then they'll have, like, assemblies and telling you when the deadlines are or, like, helping you sign up for the SATs and stuff. But most times you have to ask for yourself. You have to ask. You know, I'm going to ask it, but us adults ought to have a better way of getting it to you, whether you ask or not. Uh, you know, we have a high dropout rate. You know any students who, who are usually absent from school? Yes, a lot of students absent. What do you think your reason now? What do they tell you? I mean, some people just don't want to be there. Some people Spain. don't. You're not. Say that again now. I said some people just don't want to be there. And can't nobody make them go. Well, thank you all very, very much. Well, coming here and testifying. How did you find about this hearing? Okay. They 
Ms. Walker? The same thing for Young Women's Project. It's a great program, it seems to me. Well, thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for one. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I just have a few quick questions. Um, Ms. Bell, where were you before Cardozo? Where, where did you go to school before Cardozo? I've been in Cardozo since my freshman year. And before that? From middle school. I went to Francis Middle School. Francis? Okay. Yes. And before Francis? I went to Marie H. Reed Elementary School. Which one? I'm sorry? Marie H. Reed. Uh -huh. Okay. Elementary School. <coughs> and Ms. Walker, where were you before Dunbar? High Leadership Public Charter School. Sorry? High Leadership Public Charter okay. School. And before that? Um, Moton Elementary. Okay. How um, prepared did you find the freshmen at both schools to be for the classes? In other words, did you find your peers as freshmen at Dunbar and freshmen at Cardozo ready to provide or ready to perform the work on grade level? We'll start with you, um, Ms. Bell. <clears throat> well, I didn't really, like, I didn't know anybody at Cardozo when I first went there, so I didn't... Did you see you children know, struggling in their pay attention. freshman year? Well, freshman year, it was just that in the beginning of the school year, there were a lot of kids, but you can tell by, like, <clears throat> halfway through the year or something like that, that the classes were getting, like, smaller and smaller. Where were the kids going? They just didn't come to school. Why do you think that was? They pop wasn't motivated, didn't feel like it mattered, or because even myself, my freshman year at Cardozo, after a while, I did not intend. I did not attend school. I began skipping school because I was hanging out with the wrong crowd. So it was just for me, it was just all about finding, like, trying to feel out, getting the feel of high school. But I was hanging out with the wrong people, so. I didn't feel like it mattered to go to class. But how, how did you get back on track? My English teacher, she basically was, you know, came to me and said that if you attend all of your classes and you try and you do majority of the work in my class, I'll make sure that you pass with a decent grade. But I, she had to see that I was at least making the attempt in all my other classes as well. And and you needed English in order to go yeah. on to become a sophomore. Yes. Right. So if you failed English, you couldn't be a sophomore. Yes. Right. And now you have to pass Algebra 1 and an English 1 before you can be a So there are different standards now. Mm -hmm. So did you have classmates who didn't pass English and didn't go on to be sophomores? If I did, I can't recall. But I believe there were a couple that didn't pass yeah, because the group of friends that I was hanging out that I was hanging out with, they didn't pass English or Algebra One, and then they ended up repeating the ninth grade. But I was able to make up what Algebra One in summer school. What happened to them? They no longer go to school. Right. What What year did they graduate? I and mean, what year did they stop going? Were they second time freshmen, third time freshmen? When did they give up, by and large? Majority of them that I hung with, they were just that was their. Yeah, that was like their second time. It would have been their second time being a freshman, and I guess they just didn't want to go through the process again, so they just didn't go to school. Were they able all. to do the work, do you think? I think that if they put their mind to it and really tried versus just wanting to hang out with their friends, they could have done it because I believe they all had the potential to. It was just that they weren't self-motivated. Mm -hmm. All right, Miss um, Ms. Walker. You were a freshman at Dunbar? No, I went to Hyde Leach Public Charter Okay, when, when did you come to Dunbar? What year? My sophomore year. Your sophomore year. Okay, so what we're seeing is I'm just trying to understand why, you know, we have such a huge retention rate uh, in ninth grade, um, which is a problem. You know, and I'm trying to figure out exactly why a third of the kids, or nearly a third of the kids, don't pass from their freshman to their sophomore year. That was, these are the most recent statistics. I'm trying to understand that. And if it's so that they don't feel like coming, that there are transportation barriers or bullying barriers, or they can't do the coursework. I'm just trying to understand that. Because these classes get smaller and smaller. You know, a certain number would start in ninth grade, then we have, they repeat and some don't a third time. And the sophomore classes get smaller and the junior classes get smaller. And the freshman, I mean the senior classes get smaller. 
What, what happened, Ms. Bell, to the, the kids you used to hang out with that dropped out? What are they I doing don't now? I speak to them. Like, we don't hang out anymore because we just, we went different ways. Like, I stayed in school. They decided not to. So, lost contact or, like. You don't see them around anymore? No. Hmm. Well, you know, part of the, the concern that the committee has is what happens to young people when, for whatever reason, they give up. What happens to them? And where do they go? Do you have any insights into this, Ms. Walker? Like some people who don't come to school, like sometimes they're not mo motivated. So they feel like, like it's no, like everybody don't got the same mindset. So don't nobody think about my, their future all the time. Right. So some people just feel like, oh, well, this, they're not doing nothing for me, so I'm not going to come. So what, 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 what is the problem with the connection, do you, do you think? I know you can't speak for everybody, but why do you think the kids give up? Um, maybe because, I mean, it could be a, a lot of stuff, maybe family problems, maybe a death in the family or the school, they don't like the school, they don't like the teachers, they don't like the kids, they, it could be anything. Well, what we're trying to, to determine, trying to understand is that why some high schools succeed drawing kids from the same community and why some don't. And that's what we're trying to understand. And so when we look at, you know, and, and there's a, a, you know, everyone has their particular point of view as to why that is. Um, but at the end of the day, we've got we have thousands of young people who've fallen out of public schools and charter schools at ninth grade or 10th grade or 11th grade or high school. And we don't know where they are and we don't know what they're doing. So I know a lot of them, or a decent amount of them, they attempt to get their GED. So if they feel like hot, like a lot of them, they'll just be like, school is for me or high school is for me. Yeah. They'll attempt to get their GED. The GED program doesn't work out, so yeah. they just decide to work. So or at Cardozo, you have, I think, a very limited city year um, exposure. I think there are a couple of city year kids at Cardozo. Have you run across any of them? Are you talking about the people, the um, people red, with the red, red shirts? That's right, red shirts. Yeah, but I don't, I don't know what they do. I've seen them at Dunbar before, but I'm not sure. They're not, at this point, assigned full-time at Dunbar, so they may be doing community service projects, one-offs. But, um, you know, we, we we have seen, you know, them work very successfully in elementary and middle school. Um, you know, really um, work with individual students to get them on track with reading and math, to help them with certain behavioral issues, be a bit of a role model. And, um, you know, we, we have such a problem with our ninth grade classes in some of our traditional public schools that I am going to explore how we might involve a greater concentration of city year uh, students, or city year um, uh, employees into the DCPS uh, movement because I'm not sure how else we reach these kids. Not sure. Well, I want to thank you both for being here and for testifying. Thank you. Uh, good luck. Thank you. Can I ask a couple more questions? Okay, Mr. Barron. Yeah, thank you. Um, Ms. Walker, you went to Moton, which is in Ward 8. Uh, what middle school did you go to? Hi, the public charter school. Uh, that's a middle school? Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's um. It was pre-K through 12, but then, at first, no, at first it was an elementary school, and then it was pre-K through 12. What made you choose Denver? Because they moved over there by, um, I, I forgot where they at, but it was far. So, and Dunbar is closer, it's more convenient for what me. What do you do for I'm not sure. Give me the street, I don't want you to get an address. I live by McKinney Tech. Okay. Ms. Bell? I think you, I think the chairman asked you this, but I asked again. What middle school did you go to? Francis. Francis. Do you feel that when you were at Francis, you got all you needed to get to help you with your education? Yes. You're unusual, I think. Can you repeat that, please? Uh, you're unusual. Uh, one of the public school students, charter school people, really get bored. I have six godsons and. Uh, I get a lot of 
input from them as to why they are doing what they're doing. And one of them, we got to 12th grade in Baloo, and last month she just, I'm, I swear I'm tired of this, just drop it out. You think that the uh, truancy is a problem? Do I think truancy is a problem? Yeah, truancy. No. And I, I think that truancy is, they're trying to, like, it's, they're all about structure, so I don't think that truancy is a problem. If anything, I think truancy is like a solution. Well, how could you say that truancy is a solution to what? Because if somebody isn't going to school, it should be brought to someone's attention that they're not, they're not where they're supposed to be. And by truancy bringing it to someone's attention, it's helping putting them in a way, it's like to put them back on the right path so that they'll be able to do what they're supposed to do and go to school. If you're not in school, you should misunderstand. Where do you learn? Huh? I asked about truancy. Out of school for 10 days, 25 days. I don't know about truancy. Did you understand that for me? I'm not, I'm not understanding your question. What I said was that there are young people who uh, don't go to school, and it's truancy a problem uh, where you are and what school you're in. Truancy means not going to school. Yeah. So many days, 10 days, 25 days. So is truancy a problem for why they're not going to school? Uh, truancy is a resort. Okay. It's, it's not the cause of it, it's a resort. Yes. And we have a very serious number of students that don't go to school consistently. Some go half a day, don't come back. Some are out 10 days, 25 days. I ask that because the chairman and other members of the committee are very focused on truancy and what caused it. Well, the problem, we you know some of it, we don't have an exact answer. I'm just saying that in your experience, in your friends, that don't go to school. No, I don't, I don't really know how to answer that because none of my friends or like anyone I know personally has an issue with coming to school, so I don't really know. Well, you're very fortunate. Uh, a number of young people do have problems and peer pressures there. Man, why are you going to school with nothing up there? That kind of thing. But you're unique, and uh, I appreciate that. Thank you all Thank very, very much. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Barry. Thank you. Uh, Thank both of you uh, for being here. Um, Mr. Barry was trying to get at, you know, truancy, especially chronic truancy, you know, indivi individuals who miss more than 10 days of school year uh, or more than 20 days. You know, Dunbar and, and, uh, and Cardozo have high percentages of students who miss more than 21 days. Dunbar has, I think, more than 40% of its kids last year, and Cardozo was, I believe, 33%. So when you've got kids who've just checked out, that's a problem. And, and, and uh, what we're trying to grapple with is how we get kids to come back to school, how we keep them in school. And I think that's the direction Mr. Barry was going at. But I want to thank both of you for coming down and sharing your insights and your testimony, and uh, wish you both luck. Uh, Ms. Bell, wish you luck with your uh, college choices. And let me ask Ms. Walker, are you thinking about where you want to go to school after you complete next year? Um, I might go to NC State. Oh, good. Mm, that's where I want to go. They've got a great engineering program, by the way. Uh, well, I want to thank you both for being here. I'm going to end with another public service announcement. It's the way we started several hours ago. And this is to remind everyone that um, Duke Ellington is celebrating its 40th year anniversary, and it is having its sixth in a series of uh, performance series of legends at, uh, uh, let's see, the date is March 25th, Monday, March 25th at 7.30 at the Kennedy Center. And the, the legend uh, that will be performing is Patti LaBelle. So again, that's March 25th, 2013, 7.30, and you can purchase tickets. Tickets are between $50 and $175. You can purchase them at wwwkennedy dash center.org or you can phone the school at 202-333-2555 extension 2101. Uh, we still have about 400, Mr. Barry, we still have about 400 tickets that we need to sell. 
Uh, this uh, series of legends produces about a third of the extra money they need to fund the school, and it's a, a very, very worthy cause. So we hope people will uh, purchase their tickets and attend and support the school. And with that, we're going to adjourn at a quarter to three. And I want to thank all of our public witnesses.